understanding that, Diener came to his aid. He was doing this as an investment. Gomza himself was clearly not a fool. He had connections in the royal capital area and had talent able to draft plans. This time ended in a failure, but in a sense, they were successful in driving a wedge into Canaan, since hereafter, the kingdom's army now had to also allocate defense forces to Cyrus. 33 Sir Gomza. It's folly to throw away your life after only one defeat. There is only one victory in this war, when we liberate the royal capital and overthrow the despotic government. Your strength is still very much necessary. I, Diener, respectfully request of you, please, for the sake of the Liberation Army, lend us your power. Diener took the hand of Gumza, who still had his head down, and made him rise to his feet. It was all an act. But, to appeal to those around them that there were no hostile feelings between factions, it was a necessary act. With this, Gumza would for the time being become docile. During this lull, Diener planned on crushing the Belta faction. That faction, comprised of former men of the kingdom, was throwing their weight around, acting as they pleased, and they had forgotten for what reason they were in this liberation war. The project for the southern part of the kingdom was happening at the same time, and they needed to speed it along. What was important was that everyone's wills were united with Alturas. These were Diener's true feelings, who had once part of the Salvador faction. On the dawn where they salvaged the monarchy, they needed to press forward a host of reforms, and that wouldn't go smoothly unless everyone was united. Still, to have laid its hands on so many of our like-minded brethren, what is that death god? Voler, Borhek, Hasty. Every one of them had been brave men. For them to have been killed so easily, even now I can't believe it. Lieutenant Colonel of the Kingdom's Army, Skirazade. A female officer not even twenty leading a cavalry unit of the former Third Army. According to surrendered officers, she originally grew up in a farming village and personally applied for enlistment. She is a pitiful human who has fallen off the path she ought to have walked. She knows not justice and merely drowns herself in killing. Parts of her may deserve our sympathy, but we cannot overlook any more of her transgressions. Diener calmly recited her background, but inwardly, he was seething in boiling rage. She was a human Diener knew in detail. He intended to kill her in the next battle 33 without fail. That prowess of hers was certainly a threat, but after all, she was an incompetent girl who knew nothing except offense. If they laid a trap and surrounded her, they could absolutely kill her. He had heard exhaustively from her former adjutant, Vander, that she wasn't knowledgeable about the art of war. After he killed Skira, he would tear her body limb from limb, and then his rage would finally settle, maybe. A carefully thought out, scrupulous plan should not be defeated by an individual's reckless bravery. He would absolutely not recognize such a thing. A simple soldier born in a farming village promoted to lieutenant colonel within a few years. Despite being a woman, to have that degree of prowess on her. Truly hard to believe. I can only bow my head to her fame as a death god. Birouse muttered while stroking his white facial hair. Please leave the matter about the death god to me. I will wait for an opening and carry out the bitterness of our killed comrades. Please allow me to show you. Sir Gumza, at that time. Please by all means give me your cooperation. Understood, Sir Diener. I, Gumza, will devote myself to the Liberation Army here on as well. Gumza had been silent for a short while, but he finally lowered his head deeply and agreed. Thank you, Gumza. I will be relying on you from here on. Diener. How ought we progress from here? Asked Altura, and Diener answered without missing a beat. 33 Sir Dash. We will soon be visited by the harsh winter. We will prepare our forces during that time, and first, let us reconstruct the lives of the civilians. The good news is that the enemy General Sharav will persist in being on the defense. It is hard to believe that he will launch an attack on us. If for example he does come, it will be a simple matter to stop him in his tracks. The snow is the strongest bulwark for us. Right now, we should gather those who agree in our cause, train the troops, and spread the word of our great cause widely to the world. As the saying goes, rich country, strong army. Currently, the Liberation Army's plan was to devote themselves to that. Having exhausted much of their war potential, gathering strength took utmost priority. In that case, you are saying that we will wait until the advent of spring to aim for the royal capital. Yes. We will move out after that. The Empire, who has been bestowing upon us their support, is attempting to capture Madro's fortress in the kingdom's northwest. Even with winter here, they will grant the kingdom's army no reprieve. Prince Alan nodded at those words. The man closest to the throne, Prince Alexander, 
was on an expedition accompanied by 100,000 soldiers. Alexander had invaded, leading the 5th Army Corps and taking along the 7th Army Corps that was defending Wealth Fortress in the Empire's northeast. He was Alan's older brother, and a fine man in the eyes of his father, the Emperor. He could handle everything flawlessly and was skillful in grasping a man's true nature. Once this campaign succeeded, his position and status would probably become unshakable. For Alan right now though, this matter wasn't of much concern. Since my older brother, Alexander, is leading them, they will capture Madros without fail. If they posture to attack the royal capital, the defense of Canaan should also become thinner. It would be to our advantage to gather strength and wait for a good opportunity one believe. 33 Hearing Alan's words, Altura encouragingly nodded. When she looked at Birous for affirmation, he too didn't have an objection it seemed. The plan is decided. Everyone, I would like you all to strive to do your very best and work for the realization of our dreams. I will also devote everything I have. Sir Dash, please leave it to me. Everyone left. After ascertaining that Altura and Alan were starting to have an intimate sounding conversation, Diener also departed for his own room. There were so many things he needed to do. The more time there was, the easier he could carry out his schemes. The next time they attacked Canaan, it would surely fall. But, because their opponent was Sharav, they would probably be drawn into a long battle with many sacrifices. That composed and reliable man must first be taken out of the equation. That man had the conceit and belief that if he bunkered down, he could defend the strategic position of Canaan against anything. And, he would be correct. For the Liberation Army, it would be expedient if they could lure out the Thoughtless Kingdom's army and crush them. It's about time Field Marshal Sharav ought to retire. Apologies to the General Biraus, but I've not the luxury to entertain his personal feelings. He had already sown the seeds for that very purpose. The only thing left was to induce them to bud. This kind of machination was Diener's specialty. Diener's lips curled, and he began writing a detailed, secret message to give instructions to his agents. Having successfully defended Cyrus, Skira's cavalry, and Yaldur's united legion was headed for the kingdom's northwest under Sharav's orders. 33 In the kingdom's northwest, Madro's fortress was the foremost front line with the empire. To their west was Wealth Fortress under empire dominion, and the two had a long-standing history of conflict. As for Canaan, Sharav had set up in Roshanic fortress, Barbara was on front line security, and Laos was moved to defense of Cyrus' fortress. As he had no plans to launch an offense in the winter season, surplus soldiers were sent back to the royal capital. There were soldiers gathering fatigue and dissatisfaction. Barbara called for an offensive in the winter season, but Sharav had rejected it, saying the risk was too high. In the winter, even the transport of supplies would be difficult. Incidentally, Yaldur had earned spectacular contributions, having repulsed the enemy's surprise attack unit, crossed the ridge, defeated the rear guard, and struck the enemy main camp from the side, but unfortunately, he was not approved to be reinstated to general. Sharav's report to the king was dismissed, and Yaldur was given a directive that he would be reinstated depending on his future activity. Yaldur was once again dispirited, but he roused himself, saying that he'd overcome this adversity, and pumped himself up alone. Similarly, Skira's promotion was also thrown out the window. Thinking that a promotion to colonel was indeed going too far, she was told, later. The man who expressed that worry was Prime Minister Farzam. He felt apprehensions at a person he had never met before climbing the ranks amidst resounding applause. It was likely that the birth of a hero would threaten his own position. Skira herself didn't mind at all, and she indulged in a meal as always. From the start, an immediate meal was much more important than promotion. Skira was right now eating sausage with onions, and well-boiled vegetables like carrots. There was a stupidly large amount of edible grass, so Skira's face twisted as she dealt with them. Katarina was in a good mood and seemed to really enjoy eating them, so she transferred the grass on her own plate to Katarina's. She definitely didn't like grass-type foods, and she also didn't really like bitter foods. 33 Northwest of the Kingdom, Madro's Area Headquarters, Madro's Castle. Well well, if it isn't a former candidate for Field Marshal, his former Excellency, former General Yalder. So you were still doggedly living. Man that stubbornness is going to make you go bald. Ha 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 dash. Coming out to meet the arrived Yalder was the burishly laughing commandant of the 5th Army, Lieutenant General Kerry Madros. While patting his completely bald head, he bade the indignant Yalder to sit. Violently sitting in a seat, Yalder shouted without reserve, loudly in a voice that would even reach the heavens. 
I don't want to be told about going bald by you, you filthy baldy. It's easier to put on a helmet like this yeah no. The time when you'll understand will come sooner or later. That's if you can keep that head of yours on. Wahahahaha dash. Carrie laughed, and the officers inside the room also laughed. They were all brave men that Carrie had expectations for, and they were overflowing with spirit to fight to the end. The 5th Army was a heterogeneous army united by inhabitants of the Madros area. They would never submit to the Empire. You you ingrates dash. You would even insult me. Even though I expressly came here as reinforcements, what treatment is this dash? My god everyone's making fun of me. Yalder slammed the desk. His face was becoming as red as a lobster. Man, calm down Yalder. We're the same rank now, so can't we have a more casual talk? General and Lieutenant General are pretty much the same thing. The two don't really matter to me. Don't you think so? Kman, drink, drink. Three carry poured alcohol while patting Yalder's shoulder. The cold of the northwest was fierce, and the alcohol would offer some warmth. Snow hadn't yet fallen, but it was cold enough to pierce the skin. Normally, one wouldn't think of starting a war during this time. Yalder downed the drink. He took a deep inhale, and then exhaled, making himself calm down. He had known this man quite a while. Carrie made fun of people and had an extremely displeasing character. Even so, he was greatly popular amongst the soldiers and excelled in valor, truly a disagreeable man. Ah screw this. I'm moving to the main topic. How far have those guys from the Empire come? Hmm? A-H-H, the retards of the Empire huh? Even though it's now this damn cold winter, those guys ain't gonna pull back. We fought, intending to hold out until the winter, all for nothing. The cause of all this is thanks to that shithead that moved David's army corps. The 4th army, which had been led by the now deceased David, and Carrie's 5th army had maintained resistance in this area. Thanks to the fool of the royal capital recklessly moving them, they were in this state. If they naively secluded themselves in their new fortresses that should have been a bulwark against the imperial army, they would probably be soundly annihilated. Carrie had readily abandoned the now useless, recently completed first fort, and he brought them into a war of attrition while evacuating the civilians. He began conducting guerrilla warfare, using every advantage and means he had, to interfere with the enemy's supply train. To that effect, they had halted the enemy's advance and were successful in holding out until winter. Carrie. About Sir David, unfortunately at Belta, ah, I know. He wasn't a very careful man, but man he had an eye for liquor. The liquors he chose were really delicious. Only shame there is. Yeah, truly regrettable. 34 There was no reason why David, boastful of his family lineage, and Carrie, whose birthplace was in the backwater Madros area, would get along well. That being said, the two never got into any mutual conflict, and they had a relationship where to the best of their ability they tried not to interfere with each other. The liquor David had sent to him as courtesy had been unexpectedly delicious. Is the story about Prince Alexander being the supreme commander of the Imperial Army true? Yeah, he's probably earning points to secure the throne. Those guys' enthusiasm is the real deal. The bastards from the Wealth family also came to invade us with steam coming out of their noses. It's irritating like you wouldn't believe. Lieutenant General Gustav Wealth was the commander of the 7th Army Corps from the Wealth area in Empire territory. He was a sworn enemy that Kerry had a grudge against extending back to his ancestors. Kerry, to protect the Madros area, and Gustav, to protect the Wealth area, had a relationship where they mutually killed and were killed. They had a bloodstained, inseparable relationship that had been going on from 200 years past. This fate was also the foremost reason why Kerry and his company would not surrender to the Imperial Army. If Gustav were to take control of the Madros area, he would surely take revenge for all that had happened. If their positions were reversed, Kerry would too. After all this, there would be no pretty settlement. It was kill or be killed. This would possibly continue until their foe's city was destroyed. Before they were killed, they had to kill. That was the feudal lord's duty. The beginning of this hatred was said to have stemmed from surrendered Madrosian civilians being killed, or Madrosians killing surrendered wealthy and civilians, at this point, no one knew whose viewpoint was correct. No one even wanted to know. No matter how it turned out, the Madros family was with the kingdom, and the wealth family was with the empire. That was it. There was a habit of Madrosians tattooing a guardian beast on their breasts. Wealthians would carve a sacred bird on their shoulders. The irony was that these 34 became symbols used to distinguish their ethnicity and ended up further fanning the flames of their mutual hostility. 
Despite it almost being winter, they show no signs of withdrawing, 100,000 is a huge army. It must be challenging just to maintain it. Even so, they're invading us with energy to spare. The prince himself is leading them after all. That's a place to make a name for yourself. They're coming though we're withdrawing while burning all the crops we've carefully raised. Goes without saying we ain't even leaving a scrap for them to eat, we're turning every piece into charcoal. Winter's here, and after their supply line gets shaky lies our true victory. We'll show those imperial idiots hell. The 5th army had evacuated all the residents on the imperial army's route of invasion, poisoned the wells, burned the fields, and killed the livestock. They would give not a thing to the imperial soldiers. This methodology was shared not just by Kerry and the soldiers, but even down to the citizens themselves. If they were caught, they would be savaged and killed. Precisely because they knew that ad nauseum, there was not a single person who said no to it. Kerry drained the liquor in his glass and grasped it tightly. Yalder had also unintentionally strengthened his grip. He looked at the map spread out atop the desk and rubbed his jaw. Northwest from Madros is the second fort, to the west is the third fort, and to the southwest is the fourth fort. Huh? The second fort is along the coast, and the third is tightly surrounded by mountains. The fourth then is Madros's weakest spot, it's on the plains and would be the easiest to fall. If it were me, I would target the fourth fort. Yalder preferred frontal attacks. Without any thought, he chose the fort easiest to attack. If he had a large army and no worry for supply, he wouldn't be mistaken. There was no need to go out of their way and attack a difficult location. There were times 34 too when it would be necessary to prepare for losses and go for a head-on attack with just power. Kerry asserted that the fourth fort would not be a problem. He had the resolve and confidence that they would defend it to the end. Accordingly, it was made the most robust. Man, it ain't gonna fall that easily. I've personally taken command there after all. Yo Yalder. I plan on having you head to the second fort at the coastlands. Under it lies a path to the provisions storehouse. If that fort falls, the 5th army and your own legion will fall into a predicament. It's a dangerous place though, how about it? Kerry pointed out the second fort built along the coast. It was a barrier built to obstruct the main road. But, it was difficult to call it sturdy, and if siege weapons were brought into the equation, it would be difficult to hold out. That's basically giving me a great position. I, Yalder, and my glorious United Legion, will assuredly defend the fort, allow us to show you. Also, I'll make those guys in the royal capital recognize my activities this time for sure. While amusedly watching Yalder grinding his teeth and pumping himself up, Kerry smiled. He knew that Yalder wouldn't agree with his plan, but they were old acquaintances, so he wouldn't be rejected. Yalder would undoubtedly be enraged and hit him. Man, don't be so hasty, Yalder. Let me finish. This is a duty that only you guys can do. A job I can only entrust to the demoted Lieutenant General Yalder and his defeated, miserable United Legion. Make sure you're to listen with that pig brain of yours. I won't forgive failure. Eh right. The heck you say? Making a grave face all of a sudden, are you insulting not just me but even my troops? If it's something stupid, I won't forgive you. Here's the plan dash, 34 lowering his voice, Kerry explained to Yalder. Before he finished speaking, Yalder flew into a rage and punched him with his right fist, and Kerry retaliated with a headbutt, the conference room became chaotic. The officers around only egged them on, showing no signs of stopping them, and the two lieutenant generals continued their fist fight, leaving as many bruises on each other's faces as they could. The current situation was much like two drunkards brawling violently in a tavern. The horseplay continued until Sidemo, hearing of the ruckus, brought along guards to break them up. Just as Kerry had anticipated. He gave Yalder's body a glance, and it was full of wounds. As far as he could tell, they weren't very serious. It goes without saying that Kerry was in a similar state. Night, several days later. Leaving behind the second fort with flames reaching to the sky, Skira leading her 2,000 cavalry was heading for the Imperial Army's encampment. On the soldiers' horses were fastened the heads of 100 soldiers of the kingdom. Furthermore, bound hand and foot with rope was the second son of the Madros family, Darius Madros. He was gagged and his face swelled with bruises, and there were traces of having been a struggle. He would be an offering to the Imperial Army, a sacrifice. Katarina. Are we almost there I wonder? Sir Dash. There are signs of scouts in the vicinity. It seems we were caught sight of. Oh. According to plan then. Raise it. When she gave the instructions to the cavalry behind her, they tied a white cloth to their spears and raised it high. 
It was the universal sign of surrender, a white flag. Skira's cavalry raised many of them conspicuously and continued to march. 34 Skira chewed on the head of a dried sardine, Madroza's local specialty. It was a food for the masses, and so they could take in precious salt, it was extremely salty. It wasn't often eaten by itself, and it wasn't intended to be. The correct way of eating it was to put it in a soup. Skira's face puckered in saltiness. Katarina extended a water flask, but Skira shook her head and declined. She took out one more from a bag, and this time sucked on it from the tail. A bitter taste spread inside her mouth. I wonder if the Imperial Army has any delicious food. I'm pretty excited. In this season, I believe you should not hold such high expectations. Likely Dash Katarina was going to bring up Wealth's local product, but infantry from the surrounding thickets jumped out menacingly, interrupting her. They raised their torches and intimidatingly turned their pikes towards the cavalry. Skira instantly crushed the dried sardine. She crunched it into small pieces, the small bones making cracking sounds. After a bitter taste came out the salty taste, and Skira's face crumbled in saltiness again. Halt Dash! Stop your horses Dash! Don't move! Don't you dare move! Any suspicious movements and we'll kill you on the spot Dash! Soldiers of the kingdom huh? Do you know what that white flag means? While everyone shouted in loud voice, they intimidated Skira and her group. The cavalry showed no unrest, and they were waiting for their commander's orders. Not even the horses made a sound. The imperial soldiers observed this strange cavalry with suspicious glances. Normally, these types of people would be cowering in fear. 34 The patrol unit's commander, after cleared his throat, addressed them in a bellowing voice. We are a patrol unit of the Keyland Empire's 7th Army Corps. On what business have you men come here? Depending on your answer, we will launch an attack dash. It would behoove you to answer carefully dash. At that question, Skira had her horse take a step forward and replied quietly, but penetratingly. I am Lieutenant Colonel Skira's aide, cavalry affiliated with the Yus Kingdom's Special United Legion. To surrender to the Keyland Empire, we have set fire to the second fort and taken captive a man of the Madros family. I would like to meet with the commander of the Imperial Army. We have no place to return. At Skira's signal, her cavalry flung the heads they were carrying. The Imperial soldiers picked them up to examine them. Far in front of them, they could see a red light blotting the night sky. There were certainly flames rising from around the second fort. When the commander of the patrol unit made sure of that, he glared at Skira while alert. You're not a Madrosian, are you? The people of Madros would never surrender. In other words, if they were Madrosians, he intended to kill them here. There were many of the Empire's 7th Army Corps that were born in the wealth area. This commander was a wealthian. I was born in the central border zone, what about it? 34, no, I get it. However, it is not in my power to accept your capitulation. I will guide you from here to headquarters, and you should explain your circumstances there. Don't have any strange intentions. We aren't the only soldiers around here. I appreciate it. Please guide us then. This way. Follow me. At Skira's prompt, the commander guided them and started walking. Spearmen and bowmen were in formation with weapons ready surrounding the cavalry. If there was any suspicious behavior, they would probably immediately fire their arrows and strike with their spears. The cavalrymen showed no fear, and silently followed Skira. Unnoticed, the white flags had been replaced by black ones, with ominous birds depicted on them. Their prides probably couldn't bear it, there was no defeat for Skira's cavalry. The imperial soldiers didn't notice at all. Giving them a glance, Skira's mouth warped in great amusement. I'm really looking forward to this. 34 At the Imperial Army campground, brilliantly illuminated by campfires, a war council was being conducted to decide their plan to capture Madros. The foremost specialists in every field were mustered full force around the Commandant of the First Corps, the First Prince of the Empire, Alexander Keyland. Alexander was clothed in luxurious war garments, and a sword laid with excessive ornaments was tucked into his waist. He also had gold hair, a symbol of the Keyland family, inherited from his father. The Keyland family heavily valued, almost fanatically, that gold color. If things went wrong and the child was born with silver hair even, his right to the throne would likely be revoked, even if he was the eldest son. If Alexander inherited the imperial throne, these elite commissioned officers would probably become his advisors. They were all without exception personally selected by Alexander, and they were men who excelled in ingenuity and valor. But right now, everyone had heavy faces, 
making one feel the grave situation. What happened to the provisions supply? Alexander gently asked, while tapping his finger on the desk. Sir Dash, the fields have all been reduced to ashes, and the houses in the farming villages are completely empty. Poison has been thrown into the wells currently. Those guys have been thorough in their scorched earth tactics. So it is extremely hard to raise supplies locally. We must request them to be transported from our home country. 34 commando units of the kingdom's army have repeatedly raided our army's conveys. If we split soldiers to their defense, it might hinder our supply train hereafter I believe. Their supply line had stretched out accompanying their invasion of kingdom territory. Kerry's 5th army had switched to guerrilla warfare and were meticulously obstructing their supply line repeatedly. Currently, the amount of supplies that reached the front line safely wasn't even 50%. At this rate, there would probably be a serious deficiency of provisions. Your Excellency. We have captured the first fort. What do you think of waiting here until the spring season? The transportation of goods will progress, and our marching speed will also increase. There is no need for us to hastily attack any further. One general proposed to halt the march. It was an opinion laced with reason, and Alexander also inwardly thought that the best course of action. But, he was in a situation where he couldn't stop. He had been given an overriding order, capture Madros at all costs. It was an order from his father, and at the same time, the emperor, Alf Keeland. As he grew older, he became more incapable of flexible thinking. Even so, until he gained the throne, Alexander couldn't incur his displeasure. If I could, I wouldn't have made a campaign in this season from the beginning. His Majesty commands that we make Madros fall as soon as possible. Our focus should be on how we break through the enemy line of forts and sink Madros. Gentlemen, rack your brains for me. Declared Alexander in a strong tone. Responding to him, Lieutenant General Gustav, commander of the 7th Corps, remarked. Three to have a large army of 100,000 men march any further is an act of suicide. I believe we ought to put the ordinary soldiers on defense of the 1st Fort and escort for the supply convoys. 50,000 elite of the 1st and 7th Corps will launch a concentrated attack on one point of the line of forts, break through, and make Madro's castle fall in one fell swoop. This is best I believe. A slender and paranoid man, Gustav was the lord of the wealth area, and at the same time, he also led the 7th Corps. He had crossed swords with Kerry who governed Madro's many times in small skirmishes. He was deeply distrustful, and a man who exemplified discretion and composure. He was fundamentally indifferent to strangers, but the soldiers born in wealth held him in high esteem. He continued to fight and live only for the protection and growth of wealth. Soldiers with a low amount of training would be put on standby, and despite being on a conquest, they would continue to march with only the necessary numbers. In this situation where provisions were insecure, Gustav's opinion was appropriate. The 5th Army of the Kingdom had roughly the same numbers on defense of their fort line, but they had to scatter their defenses. The Imperial Army had the privilege of choosing their course of march. Where would they aim? That question would decide Madros's fate for certain. What a pragmatic plan that is. Without food, we cannot fight, and we cannot stupidly advance. Afterwards, all we can do is pray for good luck. Luckily, I am an ardent adherent to the Star Church. We certainly will have divine protection. Alexander gave a cynical feeling, sarcastic laugh and drained his glass of water. He didn't believe in the thing called religion. But saying that aloud was akin to heresy, so he just didn't say it. Being able to believe brought rank, money, and power. If he could be saved just by believing, that wasn't very fun. That's why he aimed for the throne that possessed everything. He made maximum use of the good fortune that he was 35 born as the eldest son, and he devoted himself to study with no rest until he almost bled. That had been recognized, and he was now one step away from his prize, the throne. He could not fail here. There were countless people aiming for the throne. The only one he could relax his guard around was his real younger brother, Alan, who had quickly withdrawn from the competition to earn the throne and had ran away from the imperial capital to join the Liberation Army. Once Alexander acquired the throne, he intended on calling him back and giving him an important managerial position. Now that the rough plan had been decided, they moved to deliberating how to capture their most important target when a messenger rushed in from the campgrounds. The bodyguards in heavy armor around them crossed their long spears, hindering the messenger's path. Alexander ordered them to let him through. The messenger was aware he was being impolite yet he entered in. It was probably an urgent report, Alexander predicted. We're in the middle of a war council. What's the matter? Sir Dash, 
A cavalry unit from the kingdom's army has come to surrender. They number 2,000 riders. The commander is a female officer, and she has come forward wanting an audience with your highness. Ha! Huh? Isn't that good news? Don't you think so? Gustav. Interested, Alexander's lips warped, and he addressed Gustav. He knew that Gustav held feelings more intense than hatred towards Madrosians. He was testing what reaction Gustav would have. Gustav frowned. Madrosians would never obey the Empire. If they untactfully allowed an audience, that might pose a danger to Alexander. Is that female commander you spoke of a Madrosian? No, she says she is from the central border zone. Also, she has brought someone related to the enemy commandant, Darius Madros. 35 Darius you said? Isn't he the son of that vexing Carrie? It's rude to keep them waiting too long wouldn't you say? How about we meet them immediately? A female officer leading cavalry of the kingdom's army huh? How truly amusing. Take their weapons. Bring only the female officer, and impose a strict surveillance. We must pay maximum caution so there's not even a one in a million chance of something befalling his highness. Absolutely do not take your eyes off their behavior. Gustav stringently ordered the bodyguards. They saluted and began implementing his orders. If they allowed injury to the prince, they would lose their lives. How prone to worrying you are, Gustav. You won't live a long life like that. It is thanks to this personality that I have consequently lived this long. If she appears suspicious, I will show her no mercy. Treat her as an enemy when you meet with her, your highness. Behind her smile may be concealed a sword. You don't have to tell me, I know. This kind of thing leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Alexander expressionlessly nodded. Behind smiles lurked desire, and treachery. He had been in contact with such dirty feelings since he was young. He had faith in his ability to smell out schemes. While surrounded by layers of armed guards, Skira was brought to the tent Alexander was in. Spearheads were pointed towards her, and if she made any suspicious movements, she would be immediately skewered. While disinterestedly looking at them, Skira was walked with her scythe carried on her shoulder. In front of the tent, she was stopped by two bodyguards wearing splendorous armor. It was unrealistic to be admitted through while bearing a weapon. 35 Halt. Ahead of us is a tent for those of a particular high class. You are not allowed through while holding such a dangerous thing. Should I give this to you, I wonder? Skira tapped the scythe on her shoulder. A bodyguard nodded with an unpleasant expression. That scythe will be put under my custody. Don't make any impolite pretenses. The bodyguard went to roughly take the scythe, but at its disproportionate weight, he unintentionally dropped it. The large scythe was heavier than it looked, such that even lifting it was arduous. He couldn't believe that the small figured girl in front of his eyes had been carrying it. She had been easily carrying it on her shoulder. Fufu Dash, you okay? It seems like your hands are shaking though. You shouldn't push yourself unreasonably. You'll whittle down your soul. Why, your concern is unnecessary. Come, you should enter quickly. His Highness is waiting. When Skira entered inside the tent, in its center was a gold-haired, young man sitting in a seat. To his sides stood merely ten men, all decorated imposingly with medals. Then, surrounding the area were tensed bodyguards with glittering eyes. Of course, they were stationed behind Skira too. Skira boldly walked inside all of them and reverentially kneeled at place slightly distanced in front of the young man. You're the one who wanted to join our imperial army? You seem surprisingly young though. Sir Dash, I am called Skira's aide. Rank of lieutenant colonel in the kingdom. I command cavalry. I have come at this occasion wanting to be a member of the imperial army. 35 Alexander looked down at Skira. At a glance, she appeared to just be a normal little girl wearing armor. But... There was no way such a person could command 2,000 cavalry. Above all else, despite coming to this place, basically hostile territory, he perceived no manner of unrest. It seemed she possessed considerable mental strength. Despite having the body of a woman, you acquired the position of lieutenant colonel at that age. It's apparent you are quite capable. I'd like you to tell me just what about the kingdom dissatisfies you. I'd like to hear your reason for surrender. My activities were not properly valued, and also, the kingdom has no future. Its interior is rotten, and the higher UPS only think about themselves. They are not worth fighting for and risking my life. I also lead 2,000 soldiers. I only want to avoid dying futilely. Skira bitterly criticized the kingdom. Then, she put her hand in her breast pocket and took out a letter sealed with wax. She handed it over to a bodyguard lingering next to her. 
Alexander took the letter and asked, This letter is from my superior officer, Yalder. He is currently serving as the defense commander for the second fort. If his rank and position is guaranteed, he will vacate the fort and promptly surrender. The flames rising from the second fort serves as proof of that. The generals were astir. If that was true, this was an unparalleled opportunity. Alexander broke the seal and scanned the letter. I have received an insult like no other with no regard to how I have loyally served, and therefore, I would like to surrender. If you can guarantee my position and the lives of the castle garrison, I promise to throw open the gates of the second fort without resistance. 35 in a location slightly eastward of the fort is concealed the kingdom's food storehouse. An attack there with a simultaneous attack on Madro's castle could inflict catastrophic damage, it said. A detailed map had even been courteously attached. Alexander handed the letter over to the generals, and the inside of the tent instantly erupted in excitement. Hold on dash. It's still early to take this as fact. There are things we ought to confirm with this officer. Messenger soldier. Bring Darius and several prisoners from the kingdom's army dash. Sir dash. Thundered Gustav at the excited generals. It was still too early to take this as truth. If this was a fake surrender, they would be the ones to fall into a predicament. Gustav did not trust Skira at all. There was no emotion in this girl's words. It wouldn't be strange for her to attack them the next moment. Indeed, he couldn't feel any humanity in her. Even when he glared at her with a gaze laden with killing intent, she calmly eluded it off. It wasn't something a young, female soldier should be able to brush off. Gustav was cautious. Alexander was silently watching the chain of events unfold. Perfect timing to ascertain her sincerity, he thought. Lieutenant Colonel, excuse this discourtesy, but there is first something I'd like to check. On your breast, is there a tattoo of a beast? Inquired Gustav to Skira. There was no better proof of a Madrosian. If there was a tattoo on her breast, any more conversation was unnecessary. He would immediately kill her. Skira silently unfastened her chest plate and slowly exposed her breast. There was no wound on her withered body, let alone a tattoo. 35 is this enough? If you like, I will take everything off. The generals averted their eyes from Skira's body. As one would expect, fixedly staring would go against chivalry. I apologize for Gustav's discourtesy, Lieutenant Colonel. I understand you are not a person of Madros. Gustav, do you agree? Sir Dash, I, Gustav had just thought too much it seems. Lieutenant Colonel, forgive my distrust. When Alexander apologized, Skira said nothing and expressionlessly fixed her appearance. She showed no feelings of shame or anger. Before long, Darius, bound with rope and gagged, and several prisoners of war were brought into the tent. When the bodyguards took off the gags, Darius turned around and spewed profanity towards Skira. He had been attached to the second fort, but Skira had assaulted him out of nowhere, and in the end, he was taken captive. Skira. What is the meaning of this dash? Are you betraying the kingdom that promoted you from a private to lieutenant colonel? You filthy traitor. It's because of ungrateful whores like you that we're in this hell dash. You're in front of his highness. Restrain your mouth, you son of a bitch. You pig of wealth. My father with exterminate your family dash, nay, he'll butcher all of you wealthians dash. Silence dash. You dog of madros dash. 35 Gustav kicked his face with all his strength, and Darius collapsed while coughing blood. He rose and started cursing Alexander this time, so he was gagged again. The other prisoners were similarly forced to kneel, and their heads pushed to the ground. Your Highness. How about leaving their execution here to Lieutenant Colonel Skira? We'll make this a chance for her to demonstrate her loyalty to the Empire. Lieutenant Colonel, of course you won't say no right. Good thinking Gustav. Lieutenant Colonel Skira. This is your first mission. Execute these vermin. These are shameless men who once surrendered and then conspired to desert again. I'd like you to immediately judge them. I don't mind if you do it right here, right now. Of course, you can do it. Alexander brutally smiled as he ordered her. He then exchanged looks with his bodyguards and made them enter battle readiness. This was to restrain Skira if she said no. Understood. My weapon is under custody, so is it okay if I asked it to be returned? Skira with not second of hesitation consented and stood up. When Alexander ordered the weapon to be returned, two bodyguards appeared, carrying her large scythe, and out of breath, they handed it to Skira. After flourishing her scythe like a dance, Skira placed its edge on Darius's neck. It's crooked, 
naked blade caught the light from the braziers, and it let off a dull shine. After mercilessly smiling, she pronounced the death verdict. Captain Darris. Nothing against you. But you don't have to worry. I'll make it quick and painless. I've gotten quite used to it. Darris raised a deathly scream, begging her to stop. 35 Alexander, judging that Skira was serious, reconsidered this performance. This man, Darris, was the son of the enemy commander, and he still had usable value. He could be used as a bargaining chip. Even if they would execute him, it would be more effective to do it in a way to show the enemy. Killing him here would definitely be a waste. Alexander quickly came to a conclusion. Wait, Lieutenant Colonel Skira. We'll put off this man's execution for the time being. I've forgotten that there are still things I want to ask him. Execute the other prisoners, I don't mind. Don't worry about the cleanup. Do what you want with them. Alexander made a motion of cutting his own neck and pushed for their execution. He didn't dislike seeing blood. Understood. S. Stop. I won't run away again, so forgive me. S. Spare me. The prisoners prostrated themselves and begged for their lives. Skira slowly shook her head, side to side. Sorry. But, humans have to accept their fates. After walking away from Darius, she relentlessly harvested five heads with flowing motions. The lives of the prisoners were cut without time to scream. The direction of the tent's entrance was dyed with red blood spray. Darius was lost for words as he silently watched. Had Alexander not stopped her, Darius's head would have certainly been separated from his body. 35 Seeing her responses and actions so far, Alexander more or less had a grasp of Skira's nature. This girl was what he called the mercenary type of human. They were humans who were agreeable if one properly valued their workings, or if one gave them what they seeked. There was no room for ideology or honor. As long as their toll was paid, they would never turn traitor. When it wasn't, they could easily abandon their homeland and kill their brethren. From Alexander's point of view, they were good people, extremely easy to deal with and easy to use. And seeing her handling of the scythe, it appeared she also came with decent strength. Enough to even make his bodyguards pale it seemed. And what captured his interest above all was her form and expression when killing. Alexander was just slightly fascinated with death. She wasn't a beauty by any means, but, she left a stronger impression on him than any of the women at the Imperial Palace. Gustav. I believe she has shown her loyalty to the Empire, but what do you think? Sir, she certainly has. She will become a reliable ally for us afterwards I believe. Gustav nodded with a grim expression. He didn't completely agree, but there were no more suspicions to be proved. She had killed the kingdom's soldiers as commanded. If she was someone who still had attachment towards the kingdom, she would show a little hesitation. There was certainly not a shred of it. Your seat now smells of fresh blood, but we give you our heartfelt welcome, Lieutenant Colonel Skira. I will give you your instructions later, so take a break today. If you need food, you can visit our supply wagons. Sir Dash, thank you very much. I swear unchanging loyalty. Then, please excuse me. Skira saluted, and left the tent afterwards. Red fluid was dripping from the scythe in her hands. Three quite an interesting woman. It seems she's somehow quite skillful too. Depending on her deeds, she might be very useful. There appear parts of her that don't seem human, but she'll become a good piece if we handle her. Your Highness. That woman is dangerous. Please don't get too deeply involved with her. I cannot figure out what she is thinking. Uncertain as always, huh, Gustav. As long as we give her money, status, and a place to work, it'll be fine. She's that kind of person. I don't think you'll be able to understand though. I am just making sure. I believe we should separate Lieutenant Colonel Skira's cavalry and disperse them in their appointments. He would split 2,000 cavalry into four groups and attach them to each of the Empire's cavalry. Even if they were planning something, the damage would be fewer with fewer numbers, and above that, they probably wouldn't be able to link up with each other. He also hadn't forgotten to order the scout unit to search around. Do as you please, I don't mind. However, make sure not to injure the lieutenant colonel's mood. Oh right, hand her a reward for giving us valuable information and bringing heads of the kingdom's soldiers. I don't want her to believe that our generosity is mediocre. Ordered Alexander, and one staff officer nodded. By your will. I will immediately have it arranged. Good, then let us concentrate on the operation again. From here on is possibly the turning point of the expedition. At Alexander's urging, 
the generals once again contributed their opinions while staring at the map Skira Bra. Things were different than before, their morale had risen considerably. 36, I don't doubt his highness's eyes, but that woman definitely cannot be trusted. Gustav decided to keep her under further surveillance. This would be unprecedented so far, but just as he thought, he couldn't shake this nasty feeling. He attached 2nd Lieutenant Carl to Skira and ordered him to report if there were any suspicious movements. The man Carl wasn't known for his cleverness, but he would reliably carry out his orders. This kind of duty was the most suitable for him. Imperial Army Campgrounds The soldiers were resting their bodies, and everyone was amusing themselves with chatter and food. The cold was harsh, and open air fires were placed all throughout the campgrounds for warmth. Scarce provisions and unsparing coldness, these two sapped the morale of the Imperial soldiers. They hadn't yet reached a point of breakdown, but the situation was serious. Skira headed with quick steps to the tent where her own cavalry was. If she didn't hurry, she wouldn't get any food. Before long, she saw Katarina, who was beside a campfire studying their surroundings. It seemed Katarina also noticed her, and she walked up to Skira. Everything go well? Lieutenant Colonel. Yeah. No problems. More importantly, what are you eating? She turned her eyes towards the soldiers stuffing themselves. It was some kind of potato, and they were smearing something on it and eating it. The light from the campfire shone on it, and it looked really delicious. Skira swallowed her saliva. 36, distributed rations. Tonight is bread and potato. Katarina knitted her brow and responded. Why she wasn't making a happy expression was simple. These potatoes weren't delicious. I wonder if there's some for me. I almost can't bear it anymore. I will go get some right away. Please wait for a moment. Just when Katarina was about to go to the supply wagon, a young man called out to them, while holding bread and potato in both of his hands. That will not be necessary. I have brought the lieutenant colonel's share. Please help yourself sir. While smiling civilly, he handed them over to Skira. With a dubious expression, Katarina asked him, You are. Please excuse my late introduction. My name is Karl. My rank is second lieutenant. I have received orders from His Excellency Gustav to function in your unit. If there is anything you may need, whatever it may be, please bring it up with me. I strive to be your strength. He turned towards Skira and saluted. Oh. Well then, I look forward to our relationship from here out. I will be eating for now, so please let me hear the story later. 36 She quickly bit into the bread, and stuck the potato on a stick and began toasting it over the fire. A savory aroma tickled Skira's nose. It gradually began to char, and the heat permeated inside. It is best to smear on cheese or butter when eating it. Allow me to give an introduction. The specialty of our wealth, this wealth potato has much nutrition and can be harvested in large quantities, though the taste is to be desired more or less. There is nothing perfect in this world. The wealth potato was strong against disease and bugs, it had high nutritional value, and it could offer large yields. As long as it was not during the winter, it could be cultivated at any location. They had brought large quantities of it as provisions for this expedition. The provisions being transported here were also for the most part these potatoes. It was easy to preserve and extraordinarily cheap. However, it wasn't very popular with the soldiers. It had poor consistency, and above that, it was bitter. Not only that, they had this potato every day. This was also one of the reasons for dropping morale. Their higher UPS, having no concern to the soldiers' misgivings, planned to plant more in occupied territory. In the near future, they would probably be able to see a disgusting amount of potato fields. As long as it's edible, I won't complain. It really isn't delicious though. Indeed so. Those are words I wish the other soldiers could hear. Complaining is proof of luxury. Driven to a corner, they wouldn't say such things. What a wise saying. I, Carl, show my admiration. Well then, I will end the day here, please excuse me. I beg your pardon, but there are preparations needed to be done. I would like to work with you starting tomorrow. He saluted and left Skira. 36 Carl had been smiling, but his eyes couldn't conceal his suspicion. It was clear from a glance that he was there to observe them. I have my eyes on you so don't try anything strange, is what his vigilance meant, thought Katarina. They would need to take countermeasures against Carl later on. Disinterestedly watching him go, Skira palmed the well-baked potato. While enduring the heat, she broke it in half, and steam wafted up. Katarina lathered butter on the potato for her, like a mother would for a child. 
Skira opened her mouth wide and devoured even the potato skin. It had texture, and the taste of butter mixed with the bitter taste, creating an indescribable taste. The guys who said this was unappetizing were spoiled beyond belief. This would be classified as tasty enough. Every one of Skira's unit was watching the site pleasantly. They wouldn't ever get tired of watching their superior officer enjoying herself eating. How is it? I think the bitter taste is too strong but... It's good enough. Also, it's better than grass. There's nothing more bitter than that. I don't think I could take grass even if I spread butter on it. When you talk about eating grass, I start to wonder if you are a lieutenant colonel or a horse. Humans, will eat anything when they're hungry. Be it grass or rotten meat. No one can win against starvation. Still, the only things I won't eat are humans. Never. Katarina, do you know why I wonder? I am not quite sure. After thinking for a short while, Katarina answered honestly. She hadn't thought about eating human meat. She didn't feel guilt when manipulating corpses, but just thinking about eating human flesh gave her reservations. Even if she was starving, she probably wouldn't speak of it. That's because, I am human. It's that simple. 36 responded Skira while chewing, with eyes that seemed to be broken somewhere. Katarina nodded, and then changed the topic afterwards. She swallowed the question she almost reflexively asked. Are you, really human, would be disrespectful without bounds. What was your impression of the Empire's generals? They're altogether smarter than the kingdoms. His Highness Alexander is also quite an interesting human. He'll become a fine emperor in the future I wonder. Though that has nothing to do with me. While carefully licking the butter on her hands, Skira replied indifferently. The bread and potato didn't make her full at all. Anything was fine as long as it wasn't grass, but she still wanted to be full. I, no, we, will accompany you to the very end, Lieutenant Colonel. As you will, please walk your own path. Murmured Katarina, lowering her voice. Her words were filled with deep, implied meaning. If Skira wished it, they were fine with joining the Imperial Army, was what Katarina was saying. Each and every one of the cavalrymen also had the same resolution. Their vows of loyalty were not to the kingdom, but to Skira. Thank you. I'm truly happy. Well then, I'll tell only you something nice. Skira drew closer to Katarina while smiling sweetly. Then, she whispered in her ear. 36 There are three reasons why I fight. First is to eat. Second is to kill the rebel army as much as I want. The final one, is a secret. I can satisfy all of them fighting for the kingdom. She fought to satiate her appetite. She swung her scythe to clear up her grudge and to obtain food and money. There was no other place to work as wonderful as here. Moreover, she had made comrades who would eat together with her. With this status quo, Skira was contented. One day, her three wishes would probably be granted. It wouldn't be that far in the future. Katarina was extremely curious about the final one, but she didn't ask about it. Even if she asked, it seemed she wouldn't get an answer. The day would come that she would understand eventually, so she was patient. Then, what about the Empire? Fufu Dash, you probably know without me saying, Katarina. I wonder who's supporting the rebel army from the shadows? For me, there's not much difference. Yes, that's how it is. She distanced herself from Katarina and ravenously smiled. The cavalrymen who scrutinized her appearance accurately surmised their commander's intention. Silence enveloped the surroundings for a while, with only the sounds of the bonfire crackling resonating. Skira was toasting the rest of her bread and enjoying a long meal. Suddenly, something cold fell on Skira's cheek. Soldiers of other units also looked up towards the night sky and sighed deeply. So it's finally falling. A-H-H, it's so cold. Don't do this to me. 36 bring more booze. And also a blanket. Get it yourself idiot. Damn it. I didn't come to pass the winter in a place like this. Disregarding the noisy surroundings, Skira was enjoying the rare feeling of snow. The cavalrymen wrapped themselves in pieces of cloth to protect their bodies from the cold. Katarina also took out her mantle, and she covered Skira. Snow, huh. It seems the march will be quite severe. But, it'll surely be fun. It's white and pretty. It'll really make red look attractive. A white, spread out landscape, with red droplets scattered here and there, while imagining that, Skira tossed the last bit of bread into her mouth. 36 in the weather cold like it would tear one's skin off marched Alexander leading the Imperial Army, aiming for the second fort along the northern coastline. Faint white snow began piling up on the road, and the soldiers marched, 
huddling together to avoid their body heat being sapped away. En route, a raid party of cavalry of the kingdom's army appeared, and postured to attack their supply wagons. It came to Alexander's mind to test out Skira here. He sent out a messenger, summoned Skira's unit, and gave his instructions. Lieutenant Colonel. I want to see how you fulfill your duties with my eyes. Will you lightly kick around those guys for me? If you hit them once, they should immediately run away. A deep pursuit is unnecessary. Sir Dash, understood. This is your first battle for the Empire. I wish you good luck. Alexander mischievously smiled, and Skira trivially nodded. One hundred riders follow me Dash. We'll give the enemy cavalry a beating Dash. Oh you Dash. Skira's cavalry, charge Dash. Follow the lieutenant colonel Dash. Don't fall behind. Aiming for the enemy cavalry, she kicked her horse and began briskly galloping. After her followed 100 of Skira's cavalry with black flags raised. All the members of her cavalry were wearing armor of the Empire, but the flag of their unit hadn't changed. 36, Commanding Officer, what shall we do? It seems the enemy is of the same number. They're expecting us to run away immediately. Humph, <laughs> if that's the case, how about we try them out for size? There's no one who can match us Madrosians in handling horses. Sir Dash. We will show them our pride. The cavalry of the kingdom's army temporarily postured to escape, but seeing the small numbers of Skira's unit, they decided to exchange blows. They raised their spears, reorganized the ranks, and resolutely began the charge. Their main duty was to hinder the supply line via a raid on the supply wagons, but the actual call for offense and defense was entrusted to the commander at the location itself. After all, it was out of the question for a superior officer to give directions to all the commando units separately. Kerry had stationed these kinds of independent units in various places. Cavalry of the Kingdom and Empire crossed. Skira's scythe drew first blood, sending the heads of the first two riders flying. Both cavalries crashed, and several people fell off their horses. While grappling with each other, many hand-to-hand -hand battles unfolded. Spears were thrusted from atop horseback, but aiming for that opening, other riders skewered their bodies. Black flag with a white crow coat of arms, aren't you death god Skira? Why are you with the Imperial Army? Have you betrayed the kingdom? Indignantly shouted the commanding officer of the kingdom's army while swinging his spear. Skira replied in an disinterested tone of voice. I wonder why? How truly strange. You shameless dash. Become rust on my spear. Three after spinning his spear above his head several times, he forcefully swung it down, aiming for Skira. She slightly flicked away the blow with his body weight behind it, and then sweeped his body with the handle knocking him off his horse. Having his body potently struck, the commander swooned. With no hesitation, she penetrated his skull over the helmet. After she twisted her scythe once, she pulled out, and fresh blood scattered over the area. See, commanding officer was done in. R. Retreat dash. Retreat dash. We cannot be annihilated. We will pay back this debt dash. Having their commanding officer killed in battle, the raiding cavalry immediately decided to withdraw. As Skira had been ordered that pursuit was unnecessary, she returned to beside Alexander. Because both cavalries had only exchanged one bout, casualties were few. This would probably be considered Skira's victory since looking at the results, the enemy had been repelled and their commander killed. Alexander had watched the spectacle with a spyglass for validation, and he nodded in satisfaction. Then, when he was informed that Skira had returned, he openly praised her. The Madros family's boasted cavalry were like babies. Your prowess, was honestly splendid. I am honored, by your praise. From what I've heard, you've been given the alias Death God because you use that scythe. At first, I suspected it was some fool, but now I've seen it in practice with these eyes, I can agree. For me, this is the easiest to handle. It fits my hands very well. Skira lightly shook her large scythe, and dark red clots of blood dripped down. In that instant, the bodies of the officers and men around her stiffened involuntarily. For thirty-seven some reason, they perceived an illusion like that blade was being swung towards them. It wasn't the cold air, a different chill ran throughout their bodies. Alexander's countenance changed for just a second, but he immediately pulled himself together. Lieutenant Colonel, I have great expectations for your activity in this expedition. Depending on your achievements, I plan to place you under my direct supervision. I have great need of those with talents. When Alexander said direct supervision, he meant officially ushering her into the First Corps. Currently, Skira was only temporarily affiliated. 
If Alexander felt like it, there was also the possibility of further promotion. The field officers around them showed expressions of jealousy. Alexander was the future emperor, and even just having one's name remembered would prove useful hereafter. They couldn't accept this turncoat newcomer capturing his interest. Your Highness. Warned Gustav, but Alexander was not paying attention. He had confidence that someone of his caliber could handle her. I am a human who properly values talent. I won't let my personal feelings interfere. Consequently, I highly value your gifts. Lieutenant Colonel Skira, I want you to freely wield your power for the Empire. Sir Dash, I, Skira, will serve with wholehearted devotion. Skira said appropriate words and deeply lowered her head. She didn't particularly have anything against the killed cavalry of the kingdom. So that Yalder also wouldn't appear suspicious, she had been authorized to not hold back and fight with her full power. 37 Incidentally, the heads that had been brought during that time when she surrendered to the Imperial Army were of soldiers that had been killed in battle. There had been people opposed to it, saying it was blasphemy against the deceased, but Carrie had faced them down. Those living were more essential, he declared. Then, he offered up his own son, Darius, as a sacrifice. Darius knew nothing about this matter. He probably thought Skira had truly turned traitor. Also, during his execution earlier, if she hadn't been stopped, she would have certainly killed Darius. She had been strongly ordered by Carrie to kill him without hesitation when the time came. Your Highness, do you really intend on appointing Lieutenant Colonel Skira to an important post? What, Gustav, are you dissatisfied? I'm extremely interested in that thing. Isn't that thing a truly fine weapon of destruction? We should utilize it until it breaks. That physical strength despite having the body of a woman, what a fair sight for the eyes. Of course, I don't intend on taking her as a concubine. There are places that I'd like more meat on if possible. Though Sir Death's face isn't too bad. Alexander laughed in a good humor, and Gustav knitted his brows. Your Highness, please refrain from such rash remarks. This is the most critical time. I know. Just a joke. I don't have the freedom to choose my partner anyway. Alexander reverted to his serious expression, and sent the signal to begin the march. If Yalder opened the gates when they arrived at the second fort, then Alexander's first corps would head to capture Madros, and Gustav's seventh corps would conduct a raid on the food storehouse. In other words, Gustav would only be beside Alexander for a little longer. His misgivings about Skira still not dispelled, Gustav prompted vigilance, but Alexander again had no ears for him. 37 Gustav had known Alexander for a lengthy amount of time, and he had admonished him many times up until now. Alexander was someone who had the capacity to take that harsh criticism, but on the other hand, he had too much conceit about his own competency. That being said, Gustav couldn't state definitely that Skira's actions were suspicious. She had executed the prisoners without hesitation, and was going to kill the hostage Darius. Even in their fight with compatriot cavalry just now, there was no hint of her going easy on them, and she had killed the commander. She certainly was fighting as a member of the Imperial Army. Nevertheless, why Gustav couldn't trust Skira was because of a vagueness, intuition from his long years of service. Vague it may be, but it was strongly warning him, telling him to be careful around that woman, telling him that if he was negligent, she would kill them in their sleep. That thing wasn't something that could be tamed. This may incur his highness's displeasure, and nothing against the bodyguards, but it would probably be best to attach more guards. His highness is still too young. He has too much faith in his own judgment. There is no shortage of people in this world that cannot be understood. Gustav called together the staff officers for a confidential meeting, and directed them to increase the guards around Alexander. The staff officers also weren't listening at first, but when Gustav strongly declared he would take full responsibility, they hesitatingly agreed to the conditions. Dash three days later. Alexander's imperial army with not a bit of resistance entered the second fort. The defense commander Yalder had opened that gates as promised. Alexander called Yalder to headquarters to immediately meet him. But, instead came a staff officer, a man who named himself Sidemo. We have received your order to convene at this occasion, but our commander Yalder says that he cannot show his unsightly appearance to his highness. Just this one time, he begs for your pardon. 37 What's there to be ashamed of after all you've done? Don't worry and call him. If this expedition ends in success, Yalder's merit will be greater than anyone's. This is an order. Tell him to unreservedly show himself to me. Alexander declared, and Sidemo lowered his head deeply and departed. Several minutes later, Yalder supported by Sidemo appeared before Alexander. 
In his right hand was a cane, and he appeared to be unable to decently walk by himself. His face swelled hideously, horribly enough that he couldn't open his eyes. His brow was wrapped in bandages, and he bore wounds serious enough that walking every step was difficult. Sir Yalder. What's with that appearance? Alexander stood up from his seat and asked about the situation. Yalder's voice shook as he replied. As a military man, this is my end. Please, laugh at me. This is the fate of the man once known as the Commander of Steel. And, that poor treatment. I was dismissed, and in the end, demoted to Lieutenant General. Further, I was sentenced for violating military regulations and immediately punished by Cain. To think that this is their treatment of a man who has devoted himself to the kingdom for many years, it is truly, truly vexing. Yalder cut his words off there. He was lost for words, and a groan leaked out of his lips. The conversation continued again at Sidemo's urging. We were ordered to be a sacrificial piece here. This is the only role left for a defeated army corps, they said. The executives of the kingdom plan to put preparations in order during that time and launch a counter-offensive. Not just us, to force even 37 those under our wing to die a dog's death is intolerable, and so we made the decision to surrender to the empire. I see now. My sympathy to your suffering. Alexander said with a compassionate expression, and Yalder kneeled, begging, Your Highness. Please add us to the vanguard unit. I want to show those fellows who slighted us the spirit of a soldier. I beg you. I beg you. No, not with that body of yours. It's probably tough to use a spear. You should devote yourself to healing right now. Stimulation will reopen your wounds. Sir Sidemo, take Sir Yalder to his room. Until they actually opened the gates, I had my suspicions, but it seems Yalder's surrender is genuine. What do you all think? Alexander asked Gustav, and even the strongly suspicious Gustav nodded in agreement. Yalder is famous for being a man with high pride. He is hot-blooded, and he is not a man who can come up with strategy. Anyone would feel disgusted risking his life and being rewarded like that. Either way, we were able to occupy the second fort. This is favorable for the operation I'd say. Said Alexander, and the staff officers nodded. Then, they turned to deciding who to entrust the defense of this fort to. Until those trailing behind us arrive, let's put Yalder on defense. His division is a little less than 7,000. Just the right size I'd say. 37, however, thinking about the worst case scenario, how about entrusting command of defense to someone else? Gustav offered a prudent policy to his superior, but Alexander laughed it off. While he has those kinds of injuries, he can't do something like decently command soldiers. If we bring defeated troops, I don't believe they'll be useful. They will only increase the food consumed. In that case, I believe it would be the best course of action to have them watch this place. Said Alexander, and the staff officers showed agreement. I agree with you I believe, your highness. If we leave some people to observe them, we won't have to worry. Above all else, those guys don't have a shred of loyalty left towards the kingdom. Not only that, speed from here out is more important than anything. We must immediately begin the march, capture the storehouse before the enemy prepares their defenses, and surround Madros. One staff officer laid out a plan while indicating on the map. Alexander encouragingly nodded, and gave his orders. 30,000 of the 1st Corps will begin to march to Madros. Gustav, 20,000 of your 7th Corps will continue to head east and destroy the storehouse. Afterwards, supplement the Madros encirclement. I intend to have it fall before then though. By your will. Your Highness, please take earnest caution. Looks like your worried disposition isn't any better, Gustav. I'm no longer a child. Your excessive concern is unnecessary. I beg your pardon for that. I, Gustav, have misjudged His Highness. 37 jest Gustav, and Alexander made a wry smile. Gustav inwardly gave priority to wealth territory over the empire, and Alexander only thought and labored to acquire the throne. These two people were on different sides, and they kept up a strange, mutual give-and-take relationship. This fight will be a bridge to our glory. Gentlemen, I expect much more labor from you all. Alexander expressed his determination, looking over the generals arranged around him, and all of them hardened their wills and nodded. Dash 50,000 of the Imperial Army began marching from the second fort. Their targets, the food storehouse and also Madro's castle. The 7,000 of Yalder's surrendered legion were on defense of the second fort. Assigned as a commando unit of the first corps, Skira's unit of 500 were the tail part of the Imperial Army's column formation. 
They had orders from their superior officer to defend against raiding cavalry of the kingdom's army on their supply wagons. The rest of Skira's unit, 1,500, were scatteredly arranged, and they were given the same duty of defending the convoys. In simpler terms, Skira had gotten the short end of the stick. Of course she would defend it to the end, but if by chance the convoys took damage, her head would likely be sent flying. Alexander stressed marching speed generally, the front of his army were light cavalry, the middle was the main body of the army, and to the rear were the convoys and siege weapons. They continued the forced march even during the night, relying on light from torches, and approached Madro's castle with astounding speed. A road which should have taken a week normally was traveled momentously in merely three days. They hadn't been discovered by the enemy, and 30,000 of the First Corps had been able to continue to promisingly march. 37 then, when they were a day away from enemy headquarters, Alexander had the entire army take a rest. Rest a lot tonight. Tomorrow we will finally attack Madros. Everyone maintain your spirits. Concealing themselves in the convenient woodlands, the Imperial soldiers relaxed their weary bodies while stifling their breathing. Fires to warm themselves were prohibited. There would be no point in coming so far if the enemy discovered them. For provisions, pre-prepared cold meat and bread, and potato were distributed. Even so, the soldiers put up with their discomfort. If they won this battle, they were promised enormous reward. Also, they were almost there. If the city fell, they would probably get the chance to plunder. On that occasion, they planned on letting out all of their boiling desires. Confirming that the vicinity had fallen silent, Skira came out from her shabby tent. Soldiers of her cavalry under compulsion to camp, wrapped in scraps of cloth, slowly raised their heads. Their eyes were keen with no sense of fatigue. Katarina sent the signal with her gaze, and Skira laughed, showing her white teeth. The cavalry members also were about to smile when, Carl, tasked with observing Skira and group, appeared accompanied by one infantryman. Just what do you intend to do so late at night, Lieutenant Colonel Skira? Leading your cavalry members, maybe you are heading out somewhere. It's too cold, so I thought I'd go move my body. Carl, how about you come too I wonder. 37 carrying her scythe, Skira replied undisturbed. The cavalrymen were silent, watching. No, I am fine. Apart from that, I have been put on strict surveillance. I have been given instructions to cut down anyone unnecessarily noisy and anyone moving without authority. Lieutenant Colonel, please go back. Otherwise Dash Carl raised his hand, and the infantryman unsheathed his sword with slow movements. Otherwise, what, I wonder. Hey, Katarina. I'm curious. Indeed, Lieutenant Colonel. Just what does Second Lieutenant Carl plan to do? Perhaps he is threatening us. Katarina responded to Skira's question with scorn. Behind her clouded glasses were concealed eyes brimming with madness. To make them understand that it wasn't just a threat, Carl ordered for Katarina, who had taken a defiant attitude, to be punished. Of course, they couldn't cause an uproar, so they couldn't do anything showy. He was going to gag her and then cane her. Thought it was cane, the strikes would be with a sheath, and it was quite capable of causing death if done improperly. I have received special orders from Lieutenant General Gustav. If Lieutenant Colonel Skira has suspicious activities, punish her. Second Lieutenant Katarina, I will drive into your body for you, that I am being serious. I do not discriminate against the female gender. I treat everyone equally, so be at ease. When Carl waved his hand down, the accompanying infantrymen grabbed the arms, forced the person to kneel, and put the gag in to prevent any sound. 3. Seeing the person writhing, wondering what was going on, Skira made a grand smile. Carl, because I am indebted to you for giving me food, I will kill you painlessly. You are a, really lucky man. Really, I intended on your screams substituting for the signal. Katarina snapped her fingers, and the accompanying infantryman corpse placed his sword on the nape of Carl's neck. This had been Katarina's measure to keep watch over Carl. With that, shall we do it, Lieutenant Colonel? No, I've thought of something good. I've, never seen fireworks before. In the clear winter sky, they appear very pretty, I've heard. So, let's make Carl a firework in the night sky. Great thinking. It will also be a signal easy for our other comrades to understand. Second Lieutenant Carl, this is farewell. Goodbye. The wealth potato, was truly delectable. After Skira gently stroked his face, she impaled his skull with her scythe, and gave him an instant death. He had probably died without feeling any pain. She pulled out, and grabbed him by the collar with both hands. 
she took a stance, and checked for confirmation with Katarina, and then the cavalryman. Everyone silently nodded and took up their weapons, their eyes fierily gleaming, saturated with bloodlust. 38 Well then, shall we begin? It's cold, so let's do this magnificently. Ready. Set. Skira hurled Carl's corpse up into the sky as hard as she could. A dark object climbed high in the air while spraying blood into the fluttering powder snow of the sky. Once it reached its apex, Katarina snapped her fingers, and the dark object was engulfed in dark red flames, and then exploded with a boom. Skira merrily watched, and then licked the snow dotted with red that had accumulated on her hands. The fun festival had begun. After the roar of the explosion, flames rose forth throughout the area, and shouts, screams, and shrieks covered the Empire's campgrounds. Skira's cavalry, wearing armor of the Imperial Army on their bodies, shouted false information while slaughtering and setting fire. The exhausted Imperial soldiers were crushed without time to decipher anything. Major General Gale's division has betrayed. Take up your swords and fight back. Surprise attack from the Kingdom's army. We're being ambushed dash. The supply convoys have been destroyed. All the provisions have been burned dash. It'll be a massacre at this rate dash. Kill them back dash. Reports contradicted each other, and the soldiers swung their swords and spears without knowing who the enemy was. In the darkness, terror and madness infected them. You idiots dash. Can't you shut up? The ones randomly making noise are the bitter dash 38 rebuked a composed officer, and a lance went through his throat from behind. The soldier pulled out his lance that had a black flag attached to it, and silently went to set fire to another place. Commanders who had jumped to their feet tried to calm down the chaos. But, Skira's cavalrymen that had been dispersed all over tried to kill those generals with maximum priority. Then, they would shout that the commanding officer had been killed and further expand the scope of casualties. Like termites devouring a tree, the casualties were spreading at frightening speed. There began to be vast amounts of victims killed by friendly fire in the first corps of the Imperial Army that had fallen into havoc. A staff officer that had received a report from a messenger entered Alexander's tent. Your Highness, Alexander, Your Highness Dash. Bad news. Enemy operatives have slipped into our army and are conducting arsony. Forcibly woken from his shallow sleep, Alexander unhappily scowled at the panicked staff officer, and give him instructions with an indifferent tone. Then immediately capture the operatives. What's there to be confused about? Calmly deal with it. We are no longer in such a situation. Our army has fallen into chaos, and soldiers are beginning to kill their comrades. Your Highness has to take command as soon as possible and personally control this situation. Getting the feeling that the state of affairs were more serious than imagined, Alexander commanded his retainers and had them hurriedly put armor on his body. He gave out instructions to the head of his bodyguards, and the soldiers tightly arranged themselves around Alexander. 38 Exiting the tent, Alexander was spontaneously lost for words. Flames rose from nearly the entire woodlands which were the Empire's campgrounds. Fire spread to the surrounding trees, dyeing the night sky with fluttering snow red. W, what is this? We're only a bit further from Madro's dash. What are Gale, Rap, Doors, and the others doing? Send out messengers to get them to immediately assemble dash. Alexander was enraged, and he angrily shouted the names of the division commanders of the First Corps. They were generals who Alexander had saw potential in and gave them their ranks. They were people who might even be called his protégés. T, that is, Major General Gale has turned traitor the soldiers say. One messenger pronounced, and Alexander rejected it. Foolish dash. Isn't that obviously the enemy's misinformation? Like there'd be anyone who'd turn traitor in this situation. Victory is right before our eyes. Alexander seized the messenger by the lapels. Something rolled at his feet, it rolled unevenly, and losing momentum before long, it came to a perfect stop at a place slightly away from Alexander. It was a human head. It had a dreadful look on it, and he remembered seeing it somewhere. It was an exceptional, veteran commander that Alexander had taken up. It was that of Gale, who led one of the divisions. Gee, Gale? Gale? Why are you dash 38 he had been a very excellent commander. Your Highness has a discerning eye it seems. That person, tried to preserve command of the soldiers until the very end. From the dark, resonated a voice that he was familiar with. Then, the atmosphere suddenly tensed. There was something abominable lurking. It was something sinister that made one feel dread. Something that couldn't be expressed with words. Snap, and something exploded nearby. Flames flared up, 
illuminating that thing. Lieutenant Colonel, Eskira. Alexander and his surrounding guards doubted their eyes. A little girl covered in blood from head to toe was trudging closer. In that thing's hands were held two more heads. I'll give these to you too. There were so many outstanding men in the Imperial Army. They were also quite loyal, and they worried about His Highness until their end. Your Highness is truly a fortunate man. Skira threw the heads. Those were of wrap and doors. Their eyes were wide open, and had an expression stuck on them that made one think they had a heroic end. That moment, the bodyguards that had fallen into distress unsheathed their swords and pointed them at Skira from every direction. D. Die, you monster. Skira. You traitor. It's the deceived's fault for being deceived. Staff Officer Saitamo told me. 38 After cleaving the foremost person vertically in half, the scythe turned, drawing an arc, and cut up the two to the left and right in turn. She dodged the spear coming at her from behind, and mid-turn the tip of that tempered blade split his face from the side. The bodyguards used their bodies as shields, obstructing Skira's path and not letting her approach Alexander. Some risked their lives to launch an attack, but their swords did not reach, and with one blow they were turned into pieces of meat. Even so, they continued to attack, everyone understood that it was their mission as bodyguards. No matter the situation, they had to protect the life of Alexander to the last man, they were bodyguards. In the span of not even a minute, tragic corpses were strewn about the area. Small sickles crookedly protruded from the brows of soldiers who tried to snipe her from the shadows. They had tried to stab her with spears all at the same time, but not one attack reached her. Every time, a strong counter from Skira had reaped their lives. Behind her, Skira's cavalry was drawing closer. White, ominous crows rushed through the blazing trees. They hastened to join their lord. So, your highness, it is dangerous here. Luckily under Sir Gustav's instructions the guards here have been augmented. Leave stopping the monster in its tracks to them. Let us temporarily retreat and rally this situation. Once the night brightens, the chaos will settle down naturally. A staff officer proposed carrying out his own duty despite his face pale from the tragedy before his eyes. Are you telling me to run away? You're saying that the first Prince Alexander is frightened of merely a few hundred traitors and must withdraw dash? I command a force of 30, 000. Why must I retreat? Your Highness, in the worst case scenario, our first First Corps will be rooted. Consequently, it is the commander's obligation to survive until the end. If you understand, then hurry and go. 38 shouted the aged staff officer, and Alexander was temporarily speechless. The staff officer ordered two bodyguards standing by to take Alexander to a safe place and take refuge. Protect him no matter the cost, he ordered. Take his highness to a place where his allies are gathered. The whole army could not have fallen into chaos. There are likely to be units waiting for instructions. Evacuate until there and then take command of the whole army. You two must protect his highness no matter what dash dot. Are you listening Dash? You guys are the glorious bodyguards Dash. What are you frightened of? Why aren't you answering Dash? Thundered the staff officer, and the bodyguards plainly responded. Understood. Leave it to us. The two large bodyguards firmly grabbed both of Alexander's arms and pulled him away. After seeing them off, the staff officer unsheathed his sword and joined the bodyguards stopping the monster. Reinforcements had joined death swinging its cursed scythe. They had set fire to the area as ordered, and they returned to beside their commander right after. There were 500 for the time being. The remaining soldiers were running full speed to come home next to Skira while fanning the chaos. Seems His Excellency Gustav's intuition was correct. Still, to have caused this many casualties. For our magnificent Imperial Army to have become like this due to just one lousy bug. 38 muttered the old staff officer. He reflected. Skira's betrayal was clear. Which meant that Yalder's surrender was also a fake. In that case, their entire invasion plan this time was read by their enemy. The Imperial Army had thoroughly fallen into their trick and revealed this sorry state. As a staff officer, this was a disgrace that he couldn't apologize for even if he gave his own life. If it were me, I would wipe out the second fort, take advantage of this turmoil and launch a surprise attack. Then, I would launch a pincer attack coordinated with Madro's castle. However, for us to have been so profoundly disorganized, could only have been done by the monster before our eyes. Is that thing human? Isn't it actually death? The 7,000 of Yalder's legion were racing towards the Imperial army that had frighteningly quickly marched here. Likely at dawn, or maybe even before then, they would sink their fangs into the First Corps. 
Having adequately rested, it was obvious that Yaldur's legion would be faster than the Imperial army. Any any rate, Kuka Dash, what is this? The stalwart Imperial guards are being slaughtered by just a single little girl aren't they? No, hold on. This is surely a dream. Yeah, definitely. There's no way something like this would happen otherwise. Hundreds of elites being killed by just one person, there's no way that could happen. This is a dream. This is a dream. This is a dream. This is a dream. The bodyguards were easily suppressed, and death that had eaten all of them, leaving not one remaining, approached the staff officer continuing to mumble with a blank look. With an expression full of pity, it brushed his cheek and gently whispered. Sweet dreams good night. 38 Alexander had been brought to a small, deserted hill by the two bodyguards. There were no signs of any allies. Thinking this strange, Alexander questioned them, but the soldiers said not a word. Even when he struggled against the hold on both his arms, he couldn't escape from the inhuman strength binding them. These guys, aren't breathing at all. They aren't even sweating. Their bodies are too cold. It's almost like, putting his disordered breathing in order, Alexander studied the soldiers' faces. There was no light in their eyes. Their faces were too pale. H, hey. You guys, when Alexander asked for the umpteenth time, there was the sound of fingers snapping, and both his arms were freed from their restraints with no prior warning. He fell forward, and someone hugged his body. When his brain registered whose face entered his field of vision, his body stiffened in overwhelming terror. Ah, ah, ah dash, good evening, your highness Alexander. You don't have to be so scared. There's no one here besides us. Cackling laughed the blood-smeared Skira in ridicule. Katarina and the cavalrymen surrounded them in a ring. W, what are, you going to do to me? 38 I'm thinking about that right now actually. Katarina, which do you think is better? killing his highness or capturing him alive. I don't really care so. Skira asked Katarina while wiping blood and sweat from her brow. Katarina closed her eyes and thought for a short while. In her palm were gripped the two walnuts that had been given as a present from her superior officer. She rhythmically rolled them as they clattered, collected her thoughts, and reported to her superior. I believe it will be more profitable to take him back alive. We can kill him whenever after all. We can likely use him as a bargaining chip for negotiations. That would be much more convenient for the kingdom I believe. So that's how it is. If, if I had to go along with your whims, I'd rather dash, the instant Alexander shouted, Skira's hands tightly grasped both sides of Alexander's head, immobilizing him. Alexander's eyes were forced to look at the monster before his eyes. He was made to stare closely at her bared, white teeth and eyes filled with a deep, unfathomable darkness. If you want to die, then please go ahead and tell me. But... I won't kill you so easily. I won't kill you even if you beg me to kill you. Until your voice dies out, until your consciousness shrivels, you will continue to live. When your very being collapses, then, I will kill you underfoot like a bug. If you have that resolution, please say it your highness. Her blood-stained hands affectionately rubbed Alexander's cheeks. The sensation of the lukewarm slime was strongly burned into Alexander's brain. After stroking his cheek several times, Skira happily smiled. 3, ah, uh, ahh dash, ahh. Lieutenant Colonel, you'll cripple him if you overdo it. That thing's value will drop if it breaks apologies. Certainly, it's not good to overdo it. His Highness did also give me food and money. If I'm going to kill him, I guess I have to do it more pleasantly. Also, we've been finally freed from that stuffy mission. She let go of the reactionless Alexander and lightly stretched, going ahh. Laughter came from the cavalry watching her. It was an action that didn't suit their superior officer who was called death. What shall we do from here on? His Excellency Yalder's legion will soon arrive, and it appears a pincer unit from Madros will arrive too. If we want to join the attack, we need to link up with them I believe. Yalder's legion and 10,000 sorted from Madros planned to launch a united attack soon on the first core of the Imperial army that had lost its convoys, fallen into chaos, and couldn't take action. They had further lost their main commanders, and the first prince of the empire was captured. They would be rooted with just one blow, no doubt about it. There remains one more person, who we have to greet. I've waited quite a while, so let's go see him. If we drive the cavalry, we'll probably meet him in time. Understood. Politely carry his highness to Madros. Please and thank you. Skira ordered the two cavalrymen who had recently joined, the two former mercenaries. Both of them straightened their backs and respectfully bowed. 
39 Sir Dash, we will make sure to bring this man to Madros. Leave it to us. Very well, we will march north from here, and strike the back of the Empire's 7th Corps. Skira's cavalry, begin the advance dash. Oh you dash. To raid the food storehouse, Gustav leading the 7th Corps were heading east from the 2nd Fort. At the same time as the sky brightened, a messenger conveyed an urgent report. Your Excellency Gustav. Bad news dash. What? Calm down and report. The first corps was hit by an enemy's night attack and annihilated. Our allies are rooted, and His Highness Alexander whereabouts are unknown. No mistake. With a grave expression, Gustav asked for confirmation from the messenger. Sir Dash, this information is for certain. What is this? The creases of Gustav's brow bunched together, and he crossed his arms while groaning. Yalder in the second fort has betrayed, and he plans to pincer with a unit that has launched themselves from Madro's castle. There are reports that traitors also appeared within the army, but the details are ambiguous. 39 read aloud a staff officer, skimming the report from the messenger. He was disturbed internally, but he made an effort not to let that show on his expression. It's hard to believe that His Highness's first corps would be decimated that easily though, however, it's hard to consider this misinformation. We ought to think that the first army has taken to their heels. I fear Lieutenant Colonel Skira may have induced havoc from the inside. No matter how elite the soldiers, an army is frail when the line of command breaks. So Yalder and Skira's surrender was indeed fake. We've been duped. The staff officers could only keep silent at Gustav's words. There were two roads the 7th Corps could choose from. They could continue east as they were and conduct a raid as planned from the beginning. However, that necessitated the resolve to be annihilated. The other was to retake the abandoned 2nd Fort and withdraw to wealth. That would also be quite challenging but there was a good possibility that the trailing units had drawn close enough to the second fort. We Wealthians, would never be beaten by Madrosians correct. Sir Dash, there is no need to show our backs. Please give your order to immediately charge forward. If we burn the storehouse, we can also make the enemy taste hell. Very well. Then, we shall advance forward. We can't show our faces to wealth if we can't even destroy a storehouse. Understood. We'll show them will absolutely obliterate the storehouse. Gustav decided to advance forward. If they burned the storehouse, he would be able to once again induce a stalemate. Also, assuming Alexander had been taken prisoner, he was considering the possibility of being able to carry out negotiations favorably. 39 and thus, with a certain static interfering with his composed thinking, he chose to take a path he would have never taken normally. When they finally arrived at a place where they could see the disguised and fenced storehouse, the 7th Corps increased their speed of advance, whether they liked it or not. They leaped. Onto their deathbeds, hidden by high thickets. W, what's this dash? Th, this is dash it's a bottomless swamp dash. Stop, stop you all dash. All members halt, halt dash. If you don't want to die, halt. Upon the vanguard group entering the marshlands, the soldiers met with disaster. Bodies sank into the mud, and they couldn't move. Not only that, they began to be swallowed up to their torsos, and before long, they were completely swallowed. Not everywhere was bottomless of course, but their feet had been resoundly stopped. Horses struggled and fell, and soldiers with the weight of their armor had poor footing and couldn't stand up. Gustav orders the entire army to stop and sent the order to slowly back up. But, it was already too late. The entirety of Kerry's 5th army had been deployed here in ambush, and had held their breaths, waiting for the Imperial Army to jump to their deaths. You shit face Gustav, how rare of you plunge so deep in. You saved us a lot of trouble. Surround the enemy. Push them into the marshlands and shoot them with arrows. Massacre the wealthians dash. Understood. Push them in dash. Rain down the arrows. 39 war drums beat, horns peeled, and the entire army began the assault. The men with their feet seized in the marshlands were doused with arrows like rain, and they helplessly collapsed. Awaiting those who tried to escape for dear life was a volley from mounted archers, the 5th Army's pride. Kerry had also taken up a bow, and with steady aim, was accurately shooting down soldiers. While knocking the next arrow, he thought, Gustav, it seems you've inhaled Sir Death's miasma, and never doubted us for a second. Why would they expressly build a storehouse here, straight ahead from the second fort whose defense was unreliable? There was no reason, except that this entire region was completely safeguarded by marshlands. Otherwise, there would never be a storehouse built on difficult to defend flatland. 
Carrie was more familiar than anyone with the Madros terrain. If it were the normal Gustav, he would have certainly conducted reconnaissance, cautiously marched, and seen through them probably. What made him not was that his eyes had been clouded by the oppressive presence known as death. Retreat dash, retreat. Break through the encirclement and return to wealth even if you have to do it alone. For I of all people to have artfully been ensnared in a trap dash. Yelled Gustav, encouraging the soldiers. He felt ashamed of himself for losing his composure this late in the game. He had been thoroughly duped by Skira who he had doubted in the first place, and then bit at the bait dangled right before his eyes. How foolish he had been. 39 He marshaled his soldiers while his face was flushing with anger and remorse. There was no time to regret. Your Excellency, Your Excellency cannot die here. Go back and live for us wealthians. That is the duty of a man of the wealth family. Please take care of our families. I cannot. I will with you gentlemen dash you mustn't dash. We'll launch an attack and open a way out without fail. Strike there and break through no matter what. Your Excellency Gustav, please stay safe dash. Wait, I'm dash. Shaking off Gustav's voice telling them to stop, the elite unit to his side began the assault, fervently thrashing the enemy infantry. They were impaled by pikes, dragged down from horses, and many people were killed. But, their intense onslaught was able to create an opening in the kingdom's army for just a second. Arg, don't let their sacrifices be in vain. Everyone follow me dash. We'll break through this encirclement for sure. Follow his excellency. Long live wealth. Glory to wealth. Kill even one more Madrosian dash. Gustav had broken through the encirclement, and took flight with all his energy, aiming for the second fort. Trying to prevent him, Carrie's pursuit unit relentlessly attacked them. There were no wealthy and prisoners. Everyone fought until they died, and thus the killing continued. As losses began increasing beyond expectations, Carrie reluctantly ordered the pursuit to stop. There was nothing more dangerous than soldiers who were prepared 39 to die, soldiers that had given themselves up to death. Gustav's soldiers had fought with that degree of determination. Gustav's 7th Corps that had been 20,000 was now reduced to 5,000. The survivors scattered loosely in all directions, and through their own respective judgments, tried to retreat to wealth. Those accompanying Gustav around him were merely 500. There was no command, and they did nothing but continue to steadily retreat. In the violent snowstorm, in front of them appeared an army of cavalry. Their flag was black, and it had a white crow coat of arms on it. It was the emblem of Skira, the character ought to be called the leading actor behind their defeat. So here is death's curtain up huh? Perfect timing to give them a parting gift. We'll make them accept their punishment. Gustav unsheathed his sword with a vehement look and gave the order to attack. Skira's cavalry similarly began the charge, and it became a battle royale with horses of both sides mutually stopped. Both sides had accumulated fatigue, and the only ones moving around robustly was Skira and a few others. Lively swinging her scythe, she reaped anyone she could get her hands on. Skira dash. You bastard, how dare you appear. If you have any pride as a warrior, kill yourself immediately dash. Ahaha dash. Lieutenant General Gustav, I've been waiting for you. I knew if I did that I'd splendidly run into you like this. The more heads of generals the better. Sorry, but please become my meal dash. Silence dash. By the pride of wealth, I will kill you dash. Skira's scythe swooped down at Gustav, but he parried her furious attacks, deftly manipulating his sword. His intuition from his many years warned him that he 39 couldn't take the blows with his sword. Gustav continued to flourish his sword, warding off her power. His horse wildly neighed, and Gustav's motivating shouts echoed around the vicinity. Ha dash. Hey 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 hey. There. Flowingly. Like this dash. Deflecting the force, he handled Skira's blows by a paper-thin margin. In this predicament, Gustav displayed his proficiency in swordsmanship. Naive, little girl dash. Skira got unintentionally caught in Gustav's feint. He had feigned his posture broken, and the scythe was swung downwards, but Gustav avoided it by centimeters. I've got you dash. Skira had overextended. Gustav aimed for her chest, sending forth a sharp thrust with all his might behind it. It was an extremely fast thrust, the fastest in Gustav's lifetime. How regrettable. Just a fingertip away. Lieutenant General Gustav, you really aren't lucky. Guga, ga, 39 Gustav's thrusted sword has stopped only a small distance away from Skira's heart. He had gotten her armor, but unfortunately, was unable to leave a wound. 
Skira's upswinged scythe sublimely stabbed into Gustav's jaw. Its tip could be seen penetrating through the front of Gustav's face. Gustav couldn't let out any screams at what intense pain must be running through his body. From his twitching mouth spilled volumes of blood. Skira violently extracted her scythe, and Gustav's head was cut off with a sideways flash. Then, she sucked in a deep breath, and shorted in a large voice. I, Skira, have killed the enemy General Gustav. The enemy's rooted dash, kill everyone you can reach dash. Oh you 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 dash. A unit that had lost its commander was extremely brittle. On the other hand, soldiers in victory gathered strength. Gustav's soldiers that had lost their fighting spirit were all crushed, and their corpses littered the ground. Even so, it ought to be praised that they fought to the end. In the end, no more than 3,000 of the 7th Corps made it back to wealth safely. The remaining soldiers had all died in battle. The 30,000 1st Corps was completely rooted, more than half of them surrendered, and the rest died in battle or escaped. The operation to invade Madros completely failed, and it ended with the Imperial Army suffering enormous injury. Also, the commander of the 1st Corps Alexander had become a prisoner of the Kingdom's army, and the commander of the 7th Corps Gustav had died in battle. The Empire had lost all its war potential in the East, and the higher UPS were in great commotion. The Kingdom began negotiations with the Empire using Alexander as leverage. First, they wanted the Empire to withdraw their troops from captured Kingdom territory, and also wanted them to pay indemnities. Furthermore, in exchange for the Delivery 39 of Alexander, they wanted the Empire to hand over the second Prince Alan. They sought to drive a wedge between the Empire and the Liberation Army. The Empire agreed to withdraw their troops, but would not pay indemnities. Also, they completely refused to hand over Alan. First time negotiations ended in failure to reach agreement. For the time being, temporarily established by continuing negotiations, a transient peace reached the wealth and Madros areas. In the defensive battle for Madros this time, Skira's participation had been tremendous. She had made incredible achievements, taking three heads of division commander rank generals, taking the head of the 7th Corps commander Gustav, and further capturing the first prince of the empire alive. She was enthusiastically praised by Kerry and Yalder, and she began being treated as a hero even in the royal capital. A letter of commendation from Prime Minister Farzam also arrived, and it was decided a medal would be conferred. With such meritorious service, she was immediately approved for promotion to colonel, and her adjutant Katarina was also cleared to be promoted to first lieutenant. As for Skira, rather than some promotion to colonel, she was much for interested in the seed of the wealth potato she had obtained during the raid on the supply convoys. She toyed with the seed potato, humming, trying to think of a suitable place to cultivate it. Lieutenant Colonel, congratulations on your promotion to colonel. You are also famed in the royal capital as a hero, the savior of the country. Is it okay to relinquish your name of Death God? For a hero to have the nickname Death God was inauspicious and would become a topic of discussion, said Katarina as she wryly smiled. Skira laughed, not worrying at all. The name finally stuck, and wouldn't that be a waste? Isn't it suitable enough? No problem then. Please call boldly call yourself Death God from here on as well. I shall. Good for you two getting promoted to first lieutenant, Katarina. Due to their successive losses, Katarina had said goodbye to promotion. Now she had finally been able to rise to first lieutenant. Even after promotion, her duties wouldn't particularly change though. She intended to work all the harder as Skira's adjutant. Sir, thank you very much. Also, Lieutenant General Yalder's reinstatement to general has been approved due to his achievements this time. He's in an extremely good humor, and he admires you, Lieutenant Colonel. Enough that he wants you as his daughter, he says. That wasn't a joke, he truly considered taking her in as an adopted child, but he was stopped by Sidemo. Saying he didn't want any more chores pushed on him, he persuaded Yalder desperately it seemed. Kerry also informed her that he wanted to accept her as a bride for Darius, who had safely survived, but Darius himself was begging in tears. It seemed he had some psychological trauma from almost being killed. When Skira smiled, his face paled and he escaped, almost flying away. They also said that we'll get a bunch of medals. When I said please give me something delicious instead of those, I was laughed at. Skira tossed the seed potato into the air like a beanbag, again and again. Katarina was having fun watching her. Forty in this battle, many of my soldiers died too sadly. Very unfortunate. Sir, among two thousand men, six hundred have died in battle or are missing. However, everyone fought with bravery until the end. 
It's really lonely, the people that eat meals together with me have decreased. We, will be serve you until our ends. Yeah. Mm, I'm okay. After all, I haven't killed enough at all. I want to eat a lot more. I want to kill a lot more. I can still fight. I will leave not one of the rebel army scum alive. That's what I've decided. After smiling cheerfully, Skira preciously put the seed potato in her bag. She took Katarina back to the cavalry, where everyone was making a stew. It was a rich stew with many wealth potatoes and fish they had gotten from Madros in it. It was really delicious. In the spur of the moment, Yalder, and Kerry, and also Darius with his face spasming, participated, and it ended up turning into a grand banquet involving the entire Madros castle. Skira ate various delicacies, drank wine, and greatly enjoyed the feast with all of her comrades. A room in Madros castle. After the feast was over, Yalder and Kerry were silently drinking together. It wasn't high-grade liquor for victories, but it was good liquor that Kerry prided himself on and had prepared to thank Yalder for his efforts. Yalder. Sorry for pushing this inferior role on you this time. It was thanks to you that we were able to kill Gustav and protect Madros. I'm truly grateful. Kerry poured drink into his cup. Yalder with his face full of bruises grimaced, and drank it all in one gulp. Forty Humph Lieutenant Colonel Skira was the key figure for victory. I was nothing more than acting a buffoon. It would have been difficult to rout the Imperial Army without her. Skira splendidly lived up to expectations. Where did you find that thing, Yalder? I've never seen a such a monster-like woman before. She was originally nothing more than a private soldier stationed at Antigua. She distinguished herself all of a sudden, and now she's joined the ranks of heroes. At this rate, the future of the kingdom is bright perhaps. Muttered Yalder while recalling Skira's figure. Her brilliant success story was at the same time Yalder's story of suffering. She had talent that made him as a warrior jealous. But, it was a pleasure to have been able to fight together with her. Him saying he wanted her as an adopted child was by no means a joke. If he could wed her to one of his sons and have her succeed his lineage, there would be no better happiness. Yalder. There's one thing I want to ask. How can you have so much faith in Skira? Didn't you ever doubt if she would really betray the Empire? I only let you put on the act because I knew you would never turn traitor. Kerry considered Yalder the foolhardy type of commander. At the same time, he knew Yalder also had a side as a firm warrior who would never harbor treachery. He had a dark countenance like that of a bandit, and he was an easily misunderstood human being. He didn't know if that was good or bad for the person himself though. Which is exactly why Kerry had Yalder act out the fake surrender and had him strike the Empire from behind. Yalder had indignantly hit him because his pride couldn't bear the humiliating duty. 40, do you want to know, Kerry? Yalder haughtily tilted his cup. I really want to know. Let me use it as reference later. Simply intuition. I had a feeling that she wouldn't turn traitor. And I fantastically won the gamble. Truly an auspicious matter. I'm so surprised I can't say anything. I knew you were stupid. That wasn't an answer. Carrie's expression said, and he poured himself more drink and gulped it down. With a triumphant expression, Yalder chewed on smoked meat that accompanied alcohol. Yalder had sent Skira into the main body of the Imperial Army because he thought just himself wouldn't be enough. A powerful poison was needed to break the Empire's large army. Just Yalder himself was severely insufficient. And, there was only one person under Yalder's command who could shoulder that important duty. The female commissioned officer taking the alias of Death God. That cavalry carrying a black flag with a white crow coat of arms. If he left it to her group, they would overrun the Imperial Army and cause ensuing pandemonium, he felt. That's all there was to it. Message from the Royal Capital to Canaan. There has been a staged attempt at a coup d'etat in the Royal Capital Blanca. The ringleader was the eldest son of the Bazarab family, Colonel Golf Bazarab and his faction. He planned to assassinate the king and prime minister and schemed to seize power. 40 He was successfully prevented through the workings of Prime Minister Farzam's agents. The regiment in Canaan is to immediately restrain Sharav Bazarav and send him to the royal capital. If he resists, take him dead or alive. Barbara is hereby appointed as commander of Canaan as substitute. 41 Month after the kingdom's army and the imperial army fought at Madros. In Madros Castle's audience room, the lord of the castle and commander of the 5th army, Kerry, and an uninvited guest were sitting across a round table from each other. Behind Kerry were waiting bodyguards fortified with heavy armor, and if the man in front of them had any strange behavior, they could immediately be take preparations for battle. With only one youthful officer accompanying beside him, 
the man's smile didn't change even while basking in the animosity from the surroundings. Kerry lightly cleared his throat, and then addressed the man in his usual tone. Yo. I want to say well done coming here, but sorry, you and I are mutual enemies now. Is it okay for you to come to this castle even knowing that? Don't complain if I have your head cut off without talking to you, spit out Kerry while putting his cup to his lips. That man, with the name of Diener, replied in a calm tone. How cold. I have come to this castle as a man who loves peace. I hope your excellency can understand. Leave out that mimicry of yours. Don't make fun of me so much got it? My intelligence unit has their hands on what you're plotting under there. Aren't you quite the low-life sleazebag, spewing poison everywhere? The face of a beast would be more appropriate for you than anyone. Forty Carey unpleasantly said. The Madro's intelligence unit had their spies in not just the Empire, but also the Kingdom and the Liberation Army. For the sake of sniffing out impending crises beforehand of course. There was no positive proof, but reports said that there was an extremely high possibility that the talked about Tenang atrocity had been orchestrated by the hands of the Liberation Army. Countries or armies would always have a dirty side they wouldn't reveal. They wouldn't be able to mobilize or kill people if they tried to stay pure. Only what they find convenient will enter the ears of the populace. No matter if the kingdom stands for justice, after all this, no one would believe it, and no one would even laugh at the idea of the Liberation Army disguising themselves as the kingdom's army and pillaging. Informed Diener, his expression tender, but his eyes weren't smiling. If he made a single mistake, he wouldn't have a head. Prepared for that, Diener had come along to Madros. It's as you say. No matter how the kingdom denies anything, it'll only be excuses at this point. However, if it's just vilifying the kingdom, I can do that whenever I like. Sorry, but I'm busy, I ain't got the time to go along with your jokes and the naivete of that foolish woman who can't tell reality from her dreams. If you've got actual business, hurry up and say it. Carrie violently struck his cup on the table and glared at Diener with a gaze full of killing intent. Diener lightly shrugged his shoulders and began quietly talking. It is a simple matter. Until we capture the royal capital, I would like you to not move the 5th army from Madros. Are you even listening to yourself? What comes out of the mouth can't be taken back. 40 When Carrie raised his right fist, the bodyguards unsheathed their swords. There would probably be two corpses made in this room when that hand was swung down. Of course. Presently, the Liberation Army's fighting power, generously speaking, is 150,000. Though our morale is high, to be attacked from three directions, the north, south, and then the Canaan area, would be, as one would expect, quite arduous. I don't believe you would move, considering how prudent you are, but you abandoning Madros and turning all your forces towards us would be unstoppable, even for us. And your reason for explicitly telling me this? You intend to threaten me. The instant you move your forces from Madros, the Imperial Army will launch a general offensive at this area. This is precise information gotten from Prince Alan. I also do not wish for further intervention from the Empire. Consequently, I have come to nail them down. I cannot let your troops move from here. Stated Diener while lightly tapping his finger on the tabletop. We have the Crown Prince Alexander here as a hostage. If they come invade again, he'll lose his life. The Emperor Alf is not so half-hearted to prioritize a prince's life over expansion of his dominion. Accepting negotiations is also just to buy time to put military preparations in order. Said Diener mixing fact with truth. Diener was currently watching whether the Emperor would prioritize Alexander's life. He understood that the Empire didn't simply say yes in the negotiations because once they accepted one proposal, the demands would escalate to no end. Naturally, the hostage wouldn't be released. So that's how it is. I understand what you're saying. But, your demand is completely rejected. Get out now that you know. You're an eyesore. Forty that is unfortunate. However, I was glad to have been able to have a direct conversation with your excellency. If an opportunity arises, let us meet again. It surely will not be too far in the future. Humph, <laughs> I have no desire to meet with you. Hey, the guest is leaving. Show him out. Sir Dash. Carrie stood up, indicating there would be no further conversation, and left behind the room. Diener and the officer accompanying him, Vander, were pushed by the soldiers and high-handedly made to exit the room. Sir Diener. That became quite unpleasant. Vander addressed his superior while straddling his horse. Negotiations had broken down with the worst possible result, he judged. I'm having a hard time understanding what was so unpleasant. 
Weren't the negotiations a resounding success? In the first place, I had achieved my goal of being able to meet Sir Carey at this point in time. S. Still. That man will absolutely not move from here. More than his loyalty to the kingdom, he only thinks about how to protect the Madros territory. That's what makes that guy tick. Even though he put an end to my negotiations, that hasn't changed. If you understand that, then why would come directly, Sir Diener? Preparations for after liberating the royal capital. I need him to defend against the Empire's expansion hereafter as well. Madros is an outpost region against the Empire, and the only ones who can accomplish that duty are those Madrosians. For that reason, this time's negotiation required us to meet face to face. After liberating the royal capita I, I don't want be under a puppet regime, even if we were to be independent. Forty Diener stated his own thinking in a plain tone. The current monarchy had already fallen in his mind. The aftermath was what was crucial. The empire would doubtlessly come to interfere with the new political power. That was Emperor Alf's aim. For Diener, he had to keep empire intervention to a minimum. To begin with, the empire tripping up this time had been an event beyond his expectations. It was unacceptable for the kingdom to have a momentous comeback, but it was a blessing in disguise that the empire's might had been curbed temporarily. Above that also, it was a godsend that the crown prince himself had been seized. That was same as having the strongest card against the empire for negotiations. The imperial army couldn't move with this. At the same time, the kingdom's victory invited unrest among the feudal lords who were currently on the fence, which made Diener's active projects more turbulent. The feudal lords didn't think the kingdom would hold on like this, but it was also hard to believe that the Liberation Army would gain victory without problems. They once again drew inside their turtle shells, thinking that it would be best to wait and see. In the southeast buffer zone with the Union were the kingdom's army, the Liberation Army, and the Union confronting each other, and they had fallen into a stalemate where no one could move. For now, the only thing the Liberation Army could pursue would be to crush the main force of the Kingdom's army, capture Canaan, and break into the royal capital. That was the only option. If the flow of battle went in their favor at this point in time, all the people waiting and seeing would all come under the Liberation Army's umbrella. The key to this Liberation War would be the next battle. Likely, it would happen in between Canaan and Belta, an engagement that would decide everything. Vander. The next battle, is now something we must not lose. Serve with everything you have, with that in mind. The successes you earn will absolutely be rewarded. For Diener was buying Vander's abilities. Diener had been the cause for Field Marshal Sherav being dismissed, and he was the one who devised the attempted coup d'etat affair. Obviously, it was all a ruse, Sherav had no intention of rebelling. They had sowed discord into Prime Minister Farzam, and forcibly turned mere smoke into a raging fire. Sir, I know my duty. I will head back to Belta from here and begin preparations before the battle. You take the funds and go provision some cologne cows as arranged. They'll be our trump card in the next battle. Gather as many as you can. One thousand at the minimum. Don't worry about their quality. Understood, however, just how will you use cows raised for their meat? I'll be treating the soldiers to high-grade beef. Leave it at that for now. Soon, you'll understand. Responded Diener, his mouth corners raising and he began to gallop his horse. His guards too, with a slight delay, hurriedly followed after him. The cologne cow was a large cow that grew sharp horns and lived only in the north of the continent. It may seem like a docile beast at a glance, but once it sensed it would be in danger, it has a furious disposition where it would continue to chase its adversary no matter where it went. Its meat was delicious, and coupled with its difficulty to capture, it was sold at high prices in the markets. Hunters would go out and hunt for cologne cows, but there were frequent occurrences of them having the tables turned and being killed. Having been promoted to colonel and appointed to a certain duty, Skira leisurely marched, taking along 100 riders, while sucking on a long and thin carrot stick in her mouth. Occasionally, she would throw one in front of her horse, giving him something instead of feed. At any rate, there was more than enough of the vegetable sticks 41 crammed into the pouch at her waist. Presenting several sticks wouldn't be much of a deal. Colonel, you seem to be in a good mood. MMNN, because I got this bag of vegetables before we departed. As congratulations for being promoted to Colonel. I'm glad I was promoted. Some children had come up to the hero, Skira, and asked her what she wanted as a gift. Hence when she responded that anything would be fine as long as she could eat it, she got this bag of vegetables the next day. Skira accepted it, more delighted than when she got some medal or a letter of commendation with its fastidious language. Good for you. 
Please allow us the privilege of congratulating your promotion afterwards. Don't push yourselves. That aside, you want one too. Thank you very much I gratefully accept. Skira threw him a green stick, and the rider jumped at it, ecstatic. Skira began crunching another one, while thinking that he was like a trained dog. Incidentally, Katarina, who was promoted to first lieutenant, was away currently on a different duty. She was in charge of training the newly assigned soldiers who would replace the riders that had died in battle. Skira's cavalry had been allotted 3,000 riders. Yalder had boasted that if they gave her 10,000 cavalry, the head of the rebel army's leader would be as good as theirs, but as there were still some doubts left about her leadership ability, despite her individual prowess being recognized, she was not permitted any further increases. Not intending to give Skira, whose birthplace was dubious, any more responsibility, Prime Minister Farzam's opinion also played a big role. 41 Yalder had been reinstated to general, but at the same time, Barbara was also promoted from lieutenant general to general. As Barbara's authority was greater since he had command over Kanan's defense, Yalder couldn't persist in forcing his opinion. The two were famous for being like cats and dogs, but having his desire for promotion satiated, Barbara had more or less regained his rationality, and even when confronted by Yalder, he did not display any of his earlier hostility. Yalder had also survived through harsh ordeals and seemed to have matured as a human being, gaining the qualities of self-control and patience. That being said though, that was just a story about the two generals. The criticism and pressure towards Skira, the youngest ever to rise to colonel in the kingdom's history, were exceedingly strong, and she was now showered in endless amounts of gazes, viscous with jealousy, envy, fear, and hatred. The especially strong ones came from the major generals, since the next time Skira was promoted, they would be of the same rank. The fear of being caught up with and then overtaken by a person of commoner descent was extremely nerve-wracking. To them, having their positions superseded by this kind of human that they utterly looked down upon was unbearable. The chief of which was Barbara's trusted confidant for many years, Major General Octavio, and the next one was Major General Bourbon. They repeatedly slandered Skira whenever something came up, and it wasn't rare for them to be yelled at by an enraged Yalder. Barbara pretended like it had nothing to do with him as one would expect, but even he ended up making an expression that said he was fed up with them. Humans who had no interest in promotions like Major General LaRue's were honestly scarce in the kingdom. Hence, having been freed from the gazes of her rotten colleagues, Skira was extremely cheerful, and in the bright early afternoon, was leisurely traveling with her horse while humming. Colonel, a party of cavalry and carriages coming from the front. Their flag is the first armies. All right. All members form ranks dash. We will welcome His Excellency, Field Marshal Sharav. Do not be discourteous dash. 41 Sir dash. At Skira's command, the cavalrymen split into two files and readied to welcome the Field Marshal's column of riders. Skira stood in their center and greeted the procession from the front. The rider running at the head of the party proclaimed in a loud voice, Black flag with a white crow coat of arms, the brave and prestigious Colonel Skira I suppose. We are cavalry of the first army attached to Canaan. Please take over the duty of escorting His Excellency Field Marshal Sharav. Understood. I swear by this emblem that we will see the Field Marshal to the royal capital without fail. Skira saluted, making a conscious effort to be as dignified as possible. Staff Officer Saitamo had really chewed her out earlier. As a commander, you must put on airs, he had said. She really didn't know how to wear air, but it would be fine if she just appeared commanding, she guessed. Please see to it dash. We must urgently return to Canaan's defense. Well then, please excuse us. After reporting only what was necessary, he turned his horse around, and the cavalry unit began racing away. The gist of the duty was extremely simple, escort Field Marshal Sharav, who was deprived of his military authority, to the royal capital. The reason why it took one month until the escort was because as his final service, Sharav had decided to curb the unrest in Canaan. There had been the possibility that soldiers who had sworn loyalty to Sharav would spontaneously blow up in frenzy, so they could not immediately deport him. The likelihood had been so great that Major General LaRue's and others had publicly declared that they would follow Sharav if he revolted. Thinking he must stop them, Sharav had personally set out to persuade them, and was somehow successful in getting them to understand. 41 Because Sharav, so deeply loyal to the kingdom, had persuaded the soldiers seething with righteous indignation, he was stripped of his peerage and rank, and it seemed he would be executed on top of that. Not understanding the logic of the world, Skira tilted her head. She had Katarina explain it to her, but as she thought, 
she couldn't understand. If they were going to annihilate the rebel army, she thought it would be more efficient to maintain Sharab's standing, however, she wasn't particularly interested in the matter, so she didn't put up a troublesome pretense of opposition. She couldn't help it, since she felt hungry when she thought about something she didn't care about. Eat, sleep, and fight. She wasn't very interested in anything else. From the carriage came out Sharav restrained on both arms by guards, and he performed a salute with slow movements. Good work carrying out your duty. This would make for a good story, to be seen off by the heroic and illustrious Colonel Skira. It is an honor. This unworthy Skira has the privilege to devote her body and soul to escort your excellency to royal capital Blanca. Skira nimbly dismounted, straightened her back, and saluted. Because it was an unused to posture, her shoulders were stiff. Her stomach was also empty. Incidentally, unworthy was something she heard was good to append before one's own name when speaking to a dignitary. If she did that, it was putting on air. It was one of the words Staff Officer Sidemo taught her. She was also told not to use it too often. Ha 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 dash, there's probably no officer more unsuited to respectful language than you. It absolutely doesn't fit. It's truly disappointing that there was no chance for us to fight together. Even myself has wanted to see with these eyes, that prowess deserving of death god. 41, Sir Dash, this petty official also thinks it disappointing. Well then, I'm relying on you on this journey, Colonel Skira. Understood Dash. While rubbing his facial hair, Sharav gently smiled. Skira had considered presenting a vegetable from the pouch at her waist, but the horses were greedily looking towards her, so she put it in her mouth instead. En route to the royal capital. A party had appeared, brought along by the Bazarab family's youngest daughter, but there weren't any particular problems, and the escort duty had proceeded. Because Skira decided for everyone to take a meal break, she had given Sharav the chance to talk to his granddaughter. There were some that thought it was out of Skira's goodwill, but she was actually hungry. Anna, don't be rash. If the colonel was on duty, you would have already lost your head. Grief, what a small mercy. Grandfather, Sir Sharav. Come escape with us. If you go to the royal capital now, you will be killed. Those guys do not intend on listening to you. They intend on executing you with no right to trial. Even father, even mother, everyone has been brought there. Sharav's granddaughter, Anna Bazarav, raised her voice. Skira acted like she didn't hear, and began wolfing down her boxed lunch. Only when she was eating a meal did she have to give her undivided attention. The other cavalrymen too began animatedly eating, making a din. Myself hasn't done anything bad, so why must I escape? Escaping would naturally be recognized as having something to be guilty about. Even if there were, for myself, the 41 field marshal, to put on such a cowardly display is unacceptable. I have to directly meet with his majesty and prove myself's innocence. However, listen well, Anna. You continue as you are, and go to the Union. Details are written in this letter. There are many of myself's friends over there. They'll surely treat you well. If Sir Grandfather will not go, then I will also go to the royal capital. You cannot take part in this old man's selfishness. I wanted to do the same for the others to the best of my ability, but... I fear that all of my relatives have been captured. Why, why is Sir Grandfather, who works himself to the bone, being treated like a criminal dash? Anna covered her face with both hands. Tears spilled out from them. In this world, there are many things which do not have a clear explanation. Even myself, now at this age, am learning. Though it seems the price I paid was a bit high, Sharav sighed with a weary expression. But Dash. That is ridiculous. I cannot accept it Dash. This talk is over, Anna. You cannot presume upon the colonel's kindness forever. Go live in good health. We are always praying for your happiness. Sharav sent a signal with his eyes, and the soldiers that had come along with Anna tightly held both her arms and dragged her away. 41 They were soldiers who had sworn loyalty to the Bazarab family, and they had more fealty than anyone. They would work for the Bazarab family to the end. It was a shame he couldn't reward their fidelity, Sharav thought. There was some resistance from Anna, but perhaps she gave up before long, she began crying with stifled sounds. What would happen to her from now on, Skira was not in a position to know. Maybe she would be captured on the way and die. Maybe she would safely escape to the Union. Or maybe, she would apply herself to the Liberation Army, but that would only be until she was killed by Skira's hands. Skira threw the last piece of meat into her mouth, cleaned off the grease on her mouth, and breathed a satisfied sigh. Sharav spoke up to apologize to Skira. 
Sorry, Colonel. For my relative's unsightly dash this petty official was having a meal, and knows nothing. If the field marshal is ready, perhaps he would like to depart soon. MMM, I leave it to you. Skira's cavalry will depart dash. Begin the march. Destination, Royal Capital Blanca. Begin the march dash. Raise the flag dash. Skira began speeding up her horse with her scythe postured on her shoulder. While carrying a falsely accused sinner, Death's procession earnestly advanced to the royal capital. After arriving at the royal capital, Skira was immediately ordered to head to Canaan, and wound up departing with no time to rest. Skira, who was looking forward to the royal capital's treats, complied with a sour expression, after clicking her tongue. It seemed she was never lucky in the royal capital, and she sighed all the while. When they were about to separate, Sharav took Skira's hands and said, I leave the kingdom to you, quietly, but powerfully. When Skira lightly nodded, Sharav nodded forty-one many times, his body shivering with regret. Eventually, he was violently taken away by the royal capital soldiers who had grown tired of waiting. Skira merely watched, expressionless. She didn't harbor any particularly strong emotions. Before long, she took a vegetable out from the bag, held it in her mouth, and walked to join her comrades. Sharav was entirely deprived of his peerage, territory, and rank, and above that, was accused for the crime of attempted rebellion, and imprisoned. He was not given a single opportunity to vindicate himself by the kingdom. After a week, Sharav died in prison. He had personally chosen a death not fit for a man of military, it was said, but it was gossiped among the people of the kingdom that he was poisoned at the hands of Farzam. That there were more people who believed the latter was an indication of Prime Minister Farzam's low popularity. Once even called a symbol of the Yiz royal family, the Bazarav lineage was wiped out. As for the family members, the men of age were given the capital punishment, those not of age and the females were dropped to commoner status, and this rebellion was temporarily settled. However, this attempted coup d'état ended up planting suspicion in the military officers towards the kingdom and the prime minister, and the seam between them widened day by day. Also, it could be called ironic that the internal insurrectionists that had been suppressed by Sharav's military fame began to move again. 41 The day after the veteran General Sharav died in jail. There were many people secretly mourning in royal capital Blanca. Rumors had spread that the attempted coup d'état incident was a fabrication of the prime ministers, and everyone sympathized with the wiped-out Bazarav family. Voices of dissent were raised not only among the populace, but even amongst the soldiers. The character known as Prime Minister Farzam had no popularity in any case. Among the people, he was regarded as the ringleader behind all the exploitation, among the soldiers, he was reviled as the main cause of their insufficient wages, among the military officers, he was made fun of as the someone who proudly rose to his position only through flattery, among the civil officials, they hated the way he wielded his power as much as they hated serpents. Even Barbara who had a favorable relationship with Farzam innerly looked down on him. Although the people's evaluations of Farzam weren't wrong, in the first place, the greatest cause was also King Christoph not concerning himself with politics. The king did nothing but seclude himself in the royal palace, having women waiting upon him and drowning in sensual pleasures, and if he felt like it, he would offer a prayer to the star god for his eldest son who had left the world at a young age. This man no longer had any interest in what would become of the kingdom. There was not a trace left now of his triumphant face when he had won the succession struggle and took the throne. Your Majesty, please excuse me for interrupting your pleasure. This is Farzam. Farzam respectfully greeted Kristoff, who with clothes disordered and face pale languidly propped himself up. Next to him lay two concubines, wearing only thin lingerie on their bodies and looking up at Kristoff with bewitching gazes. For after important matters had been sanctioned, Prime Minister Farzam, the only man given approval to enter Kristoff's private room, would thus came to report. Judgment of right from wrong was entirely done by Farzam, and the king only received the after reports. The basis for that judgment was only whether or not it benefited him. The prime minister in essence held the highest authority in the kingdom. Farzam huh? What do you want at this hour? It was already afternoon, but Kristoff had no feeling of time. He signaled to his concubines, making them prepare drinks. The dim room became almost chokingly saturated with the smell of spirits and the stink of a man and woman's intercourse. Farzam proudly began to speak while smiling. Sir. Sharav, the man behind the rebellion, has died in jail, so I have come to report. I see. So Sharav died huh? The man once even called the cornerstone of the kingdom. The gaze of Kristoff's lifeless eyes wandered. 
His concubine passed him a glass with alcohol in it, but he didn't react. Your Majesty, what is the matter? Are you not feeling well? Not moving and still sitting on the bed, he gripped the glass. He showed no signs of saying anything. Judging that he was acting as usual, Farzam continued to report on another matter. 42. About negotiations with the Empire, I have requested mediation from the Star Church. A pastor I am well acquainted with is proceeding to the Empire as an emissary. Likely, negotiations for an armistice will be settled in the not too far future. Also, I have given General Barbara, newly appointed to commander of the First Army, orders to recapture Belta. With the Empire's first attack foiled right now, the rebel army will absolutely collapse if we inflict a decisive blow here. Soon, days of peace will visit the kingdom, no doubt about it. Now that his greatest political adversary, Sharav, had been eliminated, Farzam had nothing to fear. Due to the activities of the death god he had heard about, the empire had self-destruct on their own. After that only remained crushing the Isor rebel army. For that sake, he had reinforced Canaan with an elite unit of 50,000. A large force of 150,000 was now gathered in Canaan. He had also sent messenger to the 5th army in Madros in the north and the 2nd army in the south, telling them to head towards Belta. There was no way the ragtag rebel army could handle a large offensive from three directions. Farzam. It's thanks to you that I was installed to this position. I am incompetent, and a human with no redeeming features whatsoever except being born as a member of the royal family. I don't have a single part of me that would win against my dead older brother. Even I understand that. It was thanks to your efforts that I could acquire the throne. I'm grateful from the bottom of my heart. Said Kristoff smiling like a reptile. Your Majesty, what are you saying? Without Your Majesty, the Kingdom Desh Farzam was perturbed at these unexpected words. He hastily went to say flattery, but Kristoff interrupted him in a strong tone. 42 Consequently, though you decided to implicate and kill my loyal retainer Sharav, though you decide to endlessly wallow in your own profit, I will permit it. I don't mind if you use my name and wield my authority as you please. I permit you to. Why, Your Majesty? But, when something happens, the only thing I won't permit is abandoning me. You and I share a fate. Only you surviving and living, I won't have it. When my kingdom crumbles, I'll have you die with me dash throwing aside the glass, Kristoff roughly tossed letters from out of his breast pocket. Those, were confidential messages that Farzam had secretly sent to influential nobility in the Union. Letters absolutely not to be seen by the king. They were something that should not have existed. They were insurance in case the kingdom was defeated by the rebel army. They were proof of betrayal, and by all rights it wouldn't have been strange for him to be immediately granted death. T, those are dash. An insolent spy that had creeped into my bedroom so kindly left them here. Wasn't he your subordinate? If he was of the rebel army, I would probably no longer have my life. It seems you have no popularity even among the subordinates under your supervision. But, I don't care. I permit you to. I saw nothing. Said Kristoff as he tore and threw away the secret messages. With a desperate look, Farzam tried to explain. Why, your majesty. You are mistaken. I work only for Desh I don't need your excuses. You're dismissed. Exterminate the rebel army immediately and bring Alchura's head before me. I put my expectations in you, Prime Minister Farzam. 42 simply said Kristoff, and he collapsed on the bed with a weary expression. Beside him lay down the concubines, joining him. Having lost his bearings, Farzam left the king's bedroom, his complexion pale. Ridiculous dash. How did those secret messages get in His Majesty's hands dash? Just who? Farzam's intelligence unit that he had raised was comprised of starving and dying orphans who he had rigorously trained and brainwashed so they would absolutely obey his orders. Consequently, it was entirely improbable for them to betray. He had driven into them that if he gave them the order to die, they would carry it out. But, I can only think that there is a traitor on the inside, maybe I need to investigate. The ones who did the work in the shadows so that Kristoff could take the throne had been Farzam's intelligence unit. They broadcasted a scandal of Kristoff's older brother, seized the weaknesses of the influential, assassinated, threatened, kidnapped, anything they could do they did. Many agents had died along the way, but Farzam had thus ascended to prime minister, and Kristoff had ascended to the throne. His agents would die for their benefactor who had gathered them. They were probably delighted in hell too, thought Farzam from his heart. <laughs> what drivel. He sure acts haughty for a mere puppet. Well fine, I won't lose. I won't ever let go of this power. 
This country is mine. I won't hand it over to anyone. Like hell I'd hand it over Dash 42 having risen to Prime Minister from Amir Retainer, Farzam's attachment and his desire for political power was almost unnaturally strong, and the sole thing that could stop him, the king, was utterly apathetic towards politics. And that's what had been rapidly eating away at the mighty kingdom. The infamy of these two would be left behind to posterity as feeble-minded Kristoff and sycophant Farzam. Having finished their escort duty, Skira's party had departed from the royal capital and temporarily stopped by at Cyrus Fortress before heading to Canaan. It was to link up with Katarina and the others who had finished training. These new recruits, who had even been unsteady on their horses, had now become able to fairly manage their horses. Though Katarina, who was in charge of their training, wasn't satisfied at all. Hey you can script dash. How many times do I have to tell you, don't be manipulated by your horse, before you understand. What's packed into that head of yours? Shall I'll try opening it up dash. P, please excuse me, first lieutenant. W, wa dash. The instant the new recruit looked away, he fell off his horse and became mudded. Katarina's face turned red, and she tightened the grip on her cane. If you don't get my words, I can only drill it into your body. Like a horse, I'll discipline you until you break. She took out a whip from her waist. After flexibly waving it around, she menacingly whipped the ground. The new recruit's face changed from pale to white. The other soldiers watching acted like they didn't see anything. 42 Skira, showing up at the training grounds, spoke up to the trainer who was swinging around a whip with a dangerous smile floating on her face. Katarina. Well done training them. How are these reservists I wonder? They seem decently enthusiastic. Eh, ah. Colonel. Why, you have returned. Quickly hiding the whip, Katarina saluted. Having suddenly thought of a good idea, Skira, while licking a hard candy, suggested, you rather fit the part. If you want, you should lead the cavalry instead of me. I don't know war tactics well after all. How about it I wonder, Katarina. I think it's a good idea. Skira PONPON patted Katarina's shoulders. Not joking around, Skira was wickedly serious. If Katarina said yes, she would actually be the commander probably. She promptly refused. Why, you joke? This cavalry owes its existence to the colonel. It is extremely unfit for the likes of me. Quite adept at flattery, Katarina. Suit yourself. By the way, what happened to Slash that Slash I wonder? S, sir, those are also growing well. They sprouted the other day. I see. Then I'll go check. Good work training for such a long time, First Lieutenant Katarina. Skira threw away her scythe and walked in the direction of the castle's courtyard. Katarina thought to prop the scythe up on the wall, taking it in her hands, but its weight was more than she imagined, and she couldn't lift it. She lost her balance, and 42 the scythe loudly hit the ground. The surrounding soldiers curiously observed her at the sound. Koo I knew it was heavy dash. But if I don't easily swing this around, I can't become like the colonel. The colonel's physical strength was indeed fearsome, thought Katarina to herself. She pushed up her glasses, and nodded many times. You, um, shall I help you? H, hey, that's the colonel's scythe dash, the new recruit from earlier, unable to stay idle, approached. It seemed he misunderstood that Katarina was weak. The other soldiers tried to stop him, but their warnings didn't reach the new recruit's ears. With a mischievous and cruel smile, Katarina ordered the new recruit. Good. Carry the colonel's scythe back to the barracks. Do it by yourself. You'll go without food until you're finished carrying it. By all means, if you find it impossible, come crying to me. Understood. Even a child could do something like that. I see. I look forward to it. The new recruit proudly drew near the scythe after subtly insulting Katarina. Able to imagine the outcome, Katarina lightly sighed and headed to the barracks afterwards. The new recruit would come crying to her three hours later. 42 Cyrus Fortress Courtyard. Several fields were plowed squarely in a corner. There was planted the seed of the wealth potato that Skira had brought home from the Empire as a spoil of war. Taste aside, it grew quickly, was strong against disease, and could be cultivated without regard to environment. Even in this mountainous area of Cyrus, it was sprouting favorably. Sprouts are coming out. This many. I'm really looking forward for them to grow up. Stooped over, Skira was gazing zealously at the small sprouts. A soldier coming to water them called out to her. Welcome back, Colonel. If you want, do you want to try planting one too, Colonel? 
it is kinda noisy over there with everyone trying to plant all the remaining ones so. But, I, farm work dash, a hazy memory flashed in the back of Skira's mind for only a second. A poor lifestyle, an all-consuming hellfire, a brandished naked sword, scattering fresh blood, the smell of impending death, a brigand with a vulgar smile, death's scythe on her thin neck. Then what? She. A nearly heinous sense of hunger assailed Skira. She frantically endured while trying not to let it show on her face. Kman, it is just burying a seed potato, hey, are you okay, Colonel? Your complexion dash, I'm fine. I'll also go try planting some then. Be careful so I don't accidentally eat one. Haha <laughs> dash, it is not like you will get poisoned eating it, but please do not eat them if you can help it. If you persevere, one will multiply to dozens afterwards, and we will take them home. 42, indeed. I'll be patient as much as I can. Joked the soldier, and Skira lightly brushed her hands and stood up. She threw the last vegetable from the pouch at her waist into her mouth. At first, it had a dull, flower-white taste, but it gradually exuded a sweetness. It seemed to be a fruit pretending to be a vegetable. A dried apple. Since it was dried, so she couldn't judge if it had been red or green. It didn't look too good, but the more she chewed it, the more delicious it became. Skira chewed the dried apple slice to her heart's content. Her sense of hunger abetted a little. Hey hey, say what you like, but you're crowding them too much. Do it more like this, evenly. We're making a potato field inside a fortress, that'll only make the military police mad. Shouldn't we make it as small as we can? HMF, and just what's wrong with a self-sufficient fortress? If they have complaints, I'll kick em around. Kman, spread them out. The Earth's nutrients won't spread to all of them. Geez, don't go too far or you'll bring trouble for the Colonel. Wait, see, Colonel. S, salute Colonel Skira Dash. Welcome back, Colonel Skira. A youthful man, noticing Skira, hastily stood up and saluted. The surrounding men covered in mud followed suit. They raised their voices, and welcomed their superior officer's return. At ease. Continue your work. Actually, I thought you'd allow me to plant potatoes too. 42 Skira pointed at the wooden box with seed potatoes inside. There were still a few dozen left. Sounds great. With the colonel's divine protection, they'll to grow up properly I bet. After we harvest them, let's call them death potatoes and sell them to the guys in other units. Joked in a low voice a young man while cheerfully whistling. The colonel can hear you, you big retard dash, dot the youthful man pushed that carefree man. Laughs leaked out from the surrounding men. When the youthful man glared at them, they frantically shut their mouths. I said it he's right? So don't worry about it. More importantly, Skira urged him to hurry and hand over a seed. Hee <laughs> hee dash, then colonel, please take this. Thank you very much, like this I wonder. Skira was handed a seed potato from the young man and buried it in a small hole in the field. The soldiers gently covered it with soil. Perfect, colonel. Forrelated. Skira steadily planted the seed potatoes, and an hour later, had used up everything in the wooden box. Phew, well done, Colonel. We're done with the seed potatoes now. They'll be fine if we reliable take care of the field afterwards. From what I heard though, these potatoes will grow fine even if we leave them alone. I see, it was very interesting. It might not be bad to grow one's own food. I'll say. But the fun part is after a few months. Cooking something you grew yourself and then eating it with gusto together with everyone. That is when it feels most worth it. While excitingly smiling, the youthful man actively shook off the mud on his hands. Well, that's if they aren't all taken away by the higher UPS. Really, there's nothing good about being a farmer. The young man gave a bitter smile while scratching his own head. The crops they raised themselves would all be theirs, there was no such happiness. No matter how much they produced, their crops would be taken away as tax. After the terrible harvests, they would all be taken away during tax collection time. The reason the man enlisted was because of food troubles. If someone didn't earn money, his family couldn't live. For the peasants of the kingdom, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to call these few years hell. Even so, that they somehow hadn't starved to death was because everyone had their secret fields. As this final amount of food was given with priority to the workers, there wasn't anything given to the useless. It was very much like Skira's former condition. These are our spoils of war, so they're all ours. We just have to take care that the military police don't take them. 43 muttered one soldier while glaring at the military policemen peeking over at them. Later, 
there was the danger of having their field dug up and cleared. I see. I know, let's make a notice so no one will dig it up. Using a nearby piece of scrap wood, Skira created a simple sign. The cavalry members were watching, interested. Colonel, what will you carve? That it's our field, and in a way that even idiots will understand, I think. Skira took out a small sickle from her waist and carefully etched on the wood. After several minutes, she stood the signboard ostentatiously in front of the field. Field of Skira's cavalry. Damage it and I will kill you. Colonel Skira's aide, how is it I wonder? Skira turned around to the soldiers while putting away the sickle. She took the opportunity to viciously smile and murderously glare at the military policemen. Their faces paled, and terrified, they dashed away like escaping rabbits. I think it is great. Very much like the colonel. It is super easy to understand, and yet, truly fine. 43 certainly. There won't be any idiots who will meddle with it. Whether it be bugs, birds, or sticky-fingered, evil military policemen, they'll restrain themselves for sure I think. Said the man, laughing as he looked back at the place where the military policemen were. After the men busily cleaned up, saluted, and left, Skira sat down in front of the field. The sun set, and not losing interest, Skira earnestly continued to gaze there at the earth's surface, until Katarina would come to call her. 43 Skira's cavalry of 3,000 that had departed from Cyrus' fortress were maintaining their spirits in the city of Canaan for the decisive battle that was expected to arrive. Orders hadn't been given yet, but a rumor had been spreading throughout the entire army that troops were gradually being dispatched to recapture Belta. No matter how thick-headed the person, if they witnessed the 50,000 elite troops being dispatched from the royal capital and supplies being further stockpiled, they would probably figure it out even if they didn't want to. All the more because Barbara, the commandant of the first army, was declaring the destruction of the rebel army more than usual. While the entire first army corps was all in a hurry, Skira had been summoned by Yalder, and she boredly headed towards the castle. Today, she wasn't wearing the black armor that she habitually wore but a tailored uniform reserved for high-ranking officers of the kingdom's army. On her white keynote military uniform, all the medals she had been conferred thus far were boastfully attached. Skira had complained that there was no need, but Katarina had forcefully persuaded her, saying that, formalities were important, so she had begrudgingly put on the stupid medals. The castle guards that passed her, after being fixated by her vast numbers of medals and insignia of rank, hastily saluted, with cold sweat dripping down their backs. A short, female officer. Medals, proof of magnificent military achievements. And with an insignia of colonel rank, there was no doubt. This was the rumored god of death who even village children knew about. 43 The number of enemy generals that she had killed were countless. She was a monster who could slay thousands alone. The cavalry under her banner were all stalwart men who didn't fear death. Disrespect her and be perpetually haunted, etc., etc. The rumors were embellished, and she was feared as a symbol of awe and terror by the non-commissioned officers. Expressionless, she gave the men with stiff smiles a glance and headed for Yalder's room. Before long, she stood in front of her destination's door. She slightly tidied her wrinkleless uniform, firmly knocked, and announced her arrival in a carrying voice. This is Skira. Please excuse me. Enter, was the only thing said from inside. It was the voice of that staff officer who was skilled in giving long lectures. While thinking the voice somehow nostalgic, Skira quickly entered the room. There was General Yalder with an upbeat smile, and Staff Officer Sidemo with a frown. It's been a while, Colonel Skira. I have heard of your exploits. To have caught up to me so quickly, my god you're an ominous woman. Sidemo's official rank was Colonel, and merely a year after Belta had fallen, Skira had caught up to Sidemo. Sir, thank you very much. Your words are encouraging. From here on as well. I will do my best, I regret to say. Put more emotion into your speech. Also, that's not how you use the words, I regret to say. Use your head a bit more. Sir. Please excuse me. 43, he's going to start lecturing again, Skira had thought and furrowed her brows, but she would be troubled if it got even longer, so she immediately apologized. There's this constant sense of discomfort when you speak formally because your speech doesn't coincide with your expression. As an officer, you must have an appropriate attitude and a conscious conduct. All the more so because you're a colonel now. Please forgive me, I will be careful from now on dash. She said in a loud voice, but it was apparent that she was childishly incompliant. Now able to read Skira's feelings better than before, Sidemo deeply sighed. 
What this woman before him was thinking right now was simple. Dash this is boring. I'm tired. Hungry. Sidemo pinched the wrinkles between his eyebrows and was about to let out a torrent of criticisms, but Yalder interrupted him while laughing. Ha 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 dash, oh come now. It's so very like her, and I think it's great. It's fine to let that disrespectful attitude go on. If anything happens, I'll take responsibility. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, you cannot be soft on her. We might even hear slander towards Your Excellency from this imbecile. I don't really mind. The colonel's activities more than compensate for this trifle of a fault. Also, we didn't call the colonel here today to teach her respect. Got it? Staff Officer Sidemo. Sir Dash. 43 Yalder tapped his desk with a finger a couple times, and Sidemo produced two packages from deeper in the room. He put these slowly in front of Skira on the table, and returned to beside his boss. Colonel, the left package was sent from His Majesty to you. Open it. Sir Dash. Excuse me. Urged by Yalder, Skira began opening the small package that was on her left. I hope it's delicious food, she expectantly thought. Carefully and gently opening the package, what jumped into Skira's vision, was an even gaudier, shiny, gold, fat metal than the ones already on her. Skira didn't hide her crushed, disappointed expression, and she silently put the lid back on the box, closing it. Colonel Skira, do you have something to complain about? As surprising as it sounds, it's a medal awarded by His Majesty the King. How about looking happier? I have no complaints whatsoever. This is too great an honor. Her words didn't match her demeanor. A feeling of gloominess oozed from her body. In that case, hurry up and try putting on the medal. If you parade around the town wearing that Star of the Patriot Knight, everyone will acknowledge your greatness. It's a marvelous medal suitable for a hero. This is honestly a special occasion. The people's evaluation of Skira probably wouldn't change much upon her medals increasing even further. No matter how numerous her medals became, she didn't have that special something. 43 Skira put the small box gently into the vegetable pouch at her waist and decided she saw nothing. The vegetables had all been eaten, so now it was just an empty pouch with the smell stuck to it. Cheer up, Colonel Skira. Sidemo, you have a terrible personality. When did that happen to you? Yalder asked with a sarcastic smile and Sidemo plainly replied, ever since working under your excellency, I became like this all of a sudden. That's so, that's so. Well my bad for troubling you. Go polish up that mean personality some more. I don't need a goody two-shoes staff officer after all. I expect you to do it, staff officer Sidemo. Thank you very much, your excellency. Umu. Well then, colonel. Try opening the next box. The thing you desire should be in there. I specifically called an artisan from the royal capital to make it. It's my personal, custom order. Sir Dash. Skira opened the big box on the center of the table. Inside, was an absolutely delicious looking confectionery, decorated with generous amounts of multicolored fruits. The instant she took off the cover, sweet and sour smells tickled Skira's nose and accentuated her hunger. Crusted in melted sugar, this round confectionery let off an enticing glitter, its appearance made one want to gobble it up immediately. It looked like someone almost haphazardly dumped many species and many varieties of fruit on a pie base. Yalder's custom order pie had a strange look to it, but the satisfaction it would give was unmatched. 43 Skira gingerly poked it with her finger, and then licked the syrup stuck to her hand. It was sweet and extremely delicious. It couldn't be expressed in words. She couldn't hold back any longer, she grabbed the Yalder pie with an eagle grip, when, Colonel Skira. Do you know where you are? Ah. Skira froze with her hand inside the box. Sidemo repeated his question. Colonel. I'm asking you, do you know where you are? Excuse my discourtesy. Crestfallen, Skira withdrew her hand. Seeing her despondency, Yalder desperately held back his laughter. He felt like he was at another place, watching two disobedient siblings arguing. Good. Now close the lid, and convey the correct words you ought to say to His Excellency. Now. Skira held the lid aloft as told and, with a never-before-seen sluggishness, she closed the box. Then, in an all-too-apparent sullen manner, she turned to Yalder and saluted. Thank you very much. Your Excellency. Umu. -uh. You should enjoy it later. I don't really mind, but there's a noisy-mouthed Sir Staff Officer right next to us. Sorry, but be patient for now. 43 It's upsetting to be called noisy. You cannot be soft on her. This imbecile is a woman who would likely even eat in the middle of a war council. 
This is a good chance, so we have to firmly train her here. Skira was about to say that she did eat during war council in Belta, but she stopped herself. Since she felt like the sweets would go even farther away. While pacifying Saitamo who started ranting, Yalder turned back to Skira. Colonel, our business is concluded. Probably soon, the orders to depart will come. I'm not exaggerating when I say the next battle will decide the fate of the kingdom. Give everything you have. Of course, we will also fight to the death. I expect much more greatness from you. Sir, please leave it to me. I will absolutely massacre the rebel army. Very well. In the event of our victory, I will invite you to my estate in the royal capital. I've hired many skilled chefs, so you'll surely be satisfied. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Skira had actually not even once entered the royal capital. No matter what, she had to win the battle, she wanted to get delicious treats. These were chefs employed by a high-ranking general. No doubt, there would be some foods she had never seen before. Just imagining them made her mouth water. Save imaging the luxurious food for after we win, Colonel. Before you drool, put preparations for the battle in order first. Understood Dash. Skira cheerfully responded to the exasperated Saitamo, preciously hugged the box with the confectionery in it, and left in hasty steps. She planned on eating it immediately after returning to her room. This was a matter of utmost precedence. For Yalder saw her off with a fond expression. Saitamo lightly cleared his throat, and he addressed Yalder. Your Excellency. Actually, there is a formal matter of such gravity which I must discuss with you. What, standing on ceremony all of a sudden? Don't tell me, you've fallen in love with Skira and want to establish a formal marriage interview? Sorry, but it won't work out. I must have Colonel Skira marry into my Gale family. Sorry, but restrain yourself for me. Said Yalder in a tone that didn't make one think he was joking, and Saitamo scowled at him with an expression as if to say, What nonsense are you spouting? He cleared his throat louder than before, and continued talking with a displeased demeanor. That is an unnecessary worry. I wouldn't, come hell or high water. I see, I see. That's a relief then. So, what is it? Sir, actually, I have obtained a strange piece of intelligence from those that have returned from the north. The members of the rebel army have provisioned a large quantity of cologne cows from the northern region. Said Saitamo, and Yalder rubbed his jaw, intrigued. Speaking of cologne cows, they're a famous livestock known for their delicious taste. But they have one more peculiar trait, yes. Those cattle have a brutal and ferocious personality, and if they were somehow so inclined, their disposition would make them endlessly run towards a target. If a large quantity of them were thrown onto the battlefield, 44 so that's the case. That would be somewhat troublesome. Soldiers who knew nothing would probably be thrown into chaos if they were attacked suddenly by a relentless herd. Very well. Tell Barbara for me that I want him to make it common knowledge amongst the soldiers beforehand. He might not like it, but that's preferable to losing. If he says no, I will arrange for it. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, also, about that used at the Alyosha engagement dash, AHH, the sorcery mines right? I know without you telling me. Even now, I still have bad dreams about that defeat. If only my character had just been a bit more prudent. I can't express how much regret I feel. Yalder's gaze dropped, and Saitamo was a little worried, but Yalder bitterly smiled, saying his worry wasn't needed. Your Excellency. We have to warn them about that too. We cannot repeat the same mistake. Send out droves of scouts and have them constantly observe the planes. We won't fall into that rut again dash. Agitated, Yalder hit his desk. Saitamo deeply lowered his head and departed from the room. He had taken measures for the situations he could think of. He had devised a counter plan for the sorcery mines, and had advised caution against the schemed cologne cows. But, he had a bad feeling. Like he had overlooked something. That kind of unease scrambled through Saitamo's mind. I should consolidate my thoughts one more time. There isn't much time until departure for the front, but we must have perfect preparations. We cannot permit any more defeats. 44 next week, Barbara, the Army Corps commander of the First Army, gave his orders to all the soldiers gathered in Canaan. Take back Belta, and destroy the rebel army in its entirety, he triumphantly and loudly said. Leaving behind 20,000 guards for Canaan and Roshanik, a large army consisting of all 150,000 departed for Belta. The supreme commander of the kingdom's army was General Barbara. Yalder's united legion was incorporated into the first army, and Yalder was placed under the command of Barbara, who was younger than him. 
Yalder had once been an Army Corps commander himself, but victory of all things was more important than his own useless pride, so he obediently followed. That sounded splendid when it came out of his mouth, but his face was flushed, and a blood vessel was furiously bulging out, said Sidemo waiting next to him. Leading the other divisions were Octavio and Bourbon, Barbara's confided generals. There was also Major General LaRouze who had displayed solid talent under Sharav. Favoring discretion, LaRouze had opposed the dispatch this time until the end. The words the passed away Sharav had left LaRouze were to never move from Canaan. Thoroughly fortify the defenses and wait for the enemy to destroy themselves. Aggressively assertive for quite a while, Barbara had rejected that policy and endlessly stated his own cherished opinion at the War Council. Now that they had won the war against the Empire, taking back Belta was the same as deciding the war. If they didn't make an offensive here, then just when would they? That opinion was supported by the staff officers and generals, but even so, LaRouze showed his disapproval, and in the end, he was silenced by a royal edict. Yalder had not given his own opinion and followed the War Council's plan. Even if they defended and followed Sharav's advice, it was hard to think their prospects would change for the better. But making a large offensive to take back Belta carried with it the risk of not being able to recover if they lost. 44 if they won, fine. But, if they lost, it was all over. If Canaan fell, the Liberation Army would gradually get their hands on the royal capital. In that case, the feudal lords who decided to wait and see would unanimously turn towards the rebel army. This is the only battle we absolutely cannot lose. We will win no matter what. I, Yalder Gale, will wager my life, and wipe out my disgrace from before Dash. Yalder steeled his resolve, and strongly gripped the flag of the Third Army, blotted by mud and blood. He would once again obtain the glory of victory, and this flag would flutter for his now deceased subordinates. This was a duty he ought to carry out, for shamelessly living on as a defeated general, Yalder thought. Mid-March, a grim-faced man approached next to Skira. Skira disinterestedly turned her head, and inclined her head quizzically, since she remembered that face from somewhere. Who were you again, I wonder? I feel like I remember you from somewhere. Congratulations on your promotion, Colonel Skira. The man casually handed over a small bag to Skira. When she took it and checked inside, the bag was full of roasted beans. These were the strange-tasting beans that were Belta's specialty. Skira's memories began steadily clearing. A-H-H, I remember. You, your Major Conrad that was at Belta, right? So your wounds have healed. I thought that they were serious enough that you couldn't move now though. Yes, Colonel Skira. Thanks to the Colonel's hard fight, this life was saved. In this battle, to repay that debt, I intend to work with the resolve to work my body to the bone dash. 44 Conrad spoke in bits and pieces as if checking each and every phrase. Respectful language almost deathly doesn't suit you. Can you speak like you always do without pushing yourself? With a self-satisfied face, she said words that had been said to her once before. Conrad shook his head side to side, saying he couldn't abide by Skira's advice. Rank is absolute in an army. Please excuse me, but, I cannot do that. I see. Doesn't really matter to me. Well, you were finally saved, so don't overexert yourself. This time, you'll probably die. That's just my intuition though. Conrad was blatantly informed of his death, but he responded to Skira without a change in expression. If he was afraid of death, he wouldn't have brushed away the doctor restraining him and participated in this battle. Conrad had something he had to carry out, even at the cost of his life. In this battle, I have to kill the enemies of His Excellency, David. If I can accomplish that, this petty life is worth it. His once superior officer David had died at Belta. He was a noble who valued him despite his poor socializing skills. David's reputation among others was unfavorable, but for Conrad, David was a man who he owed a debt of gratitude. He himself would clear up David's regret without fail. With just that tenacity, Conrad had made a recovery from wounds so serious he couldn't move. 44, I see. I can't stop you then. I expect great things from you this battle. For the kingdom's victory, let us expend all our power, together. Sir, understood Dash. The conversation between both of them, both unsuited towards respectful language, ended shortly. Conrad once again saluted atop his horse, and he returned to his own unit. Skira expressionlessly saw him off, took out a bean from the pouch, and threw it into her mouth. Spicy. The seasoning on today's beans were so spicy that even Skira grimaced. The Liberation Army received news that, the kingdom's army of 150,000 are in the middle of marching towards Belta. 
as they had obtained intelligence that forces were gathering in Canaan beforehand, their war preparations were already complete. It was the same for the Liberation Army too, they couldn't lose this battle. Now that the Empire couldn't take action, they had to let the world know that the Liberation Army could take control of the royal capital by itself. For that sake, they also had to achieve victory no matter what. The commander of the Liberation Army, Alchura, gave her orders to her gathered Liberation Army comrades. This battle will decide the fate of the Liberation War. Even now while we're doing this, innocent people are starving and suffering. We are not permitted to fail. We must overthrow the current monarchy, spreading its harsh tyranny, no matter the costs. For that sake, much blood may be spilled, and many comrades may lose their lives. I will carry all those sins, and then, we will undoubtedly kill Kristoff, the source of this forty-four misgovernment, this, I swear to you. To build a world where no one has to suffer, where everyone can live in smiles, please, I want you to lend me your strength dash. Altura unsheathed her sword and majestically raised it towards the heavens. Cheers rang out like an explosion, and shouts of, long live the Liberation Army, roared. Gazing at them with a triumphant expression, Altura lived up to everyone's cheers. The soldiers of the Liberation Army were not fools. They didn't think they could live in complete harmony like the princess described. But even so, it was hard to put into form their hatred and resentment towards the current kingdom tormenting them. That outlet for their seething rage that turned it into a just cause, that was Alchura and the Liberation Army. General Birouz received the signal from Alchura, and with a roar unbefitting his age, he gave his orders to the lined-up army. We will win this battle, and take back our abundant livelihoods in the kingdom dash. For that, we must make Canaan fall no matter what dash. Fight until you die. Justice is on our side dash. Begin the march dash. Begin the march dash. Target, Burtisburg Plains. The Liberation Army, totaling 130,000, departed from Belta to intercept the advancing army of the kingdom. They planned to annihilate the approaching enemy army, and instantly take Canaan lacking in men. If this went well, they could probably put an end to this war. Both armies would crash in Bertusburg plains spread between Belta and Canaan. The largest forces of the kingdom's army and the Liberation Army would clash in this battle. The plains had good visibility and gentle sloping terrain. Characteristically, there was a high ground called Karna's Plateau, and it rose up, looking down in every direction. Diener, tactician of the Liberation Army, had successfully deployed a formation quickly on that high ground. They built a quick encampment on it, and a division led 44 by Gomza was deployed for its defense. Gomza was also a general who burned with the desire for revenge. He had quit his post as staff officer and now led an army unit. Also, 2,000 cologne cows provisioned by Vander from the north were firmly bound, covered, and stationed at the rear of the army. Half of them were attached to wagons with their canopies covered. In these carts were stacked a certain something, on the other hand, the kingdom's army also spread out their forces and confronted the rebel army from the front. Having the advantage in numbers, the kingdom's army roughly planned to take the momentum and suppress them with a frontal attack. At the same time, an operation was worked out to take back the threat of Karna's plateau. Barbara and the main body of the army was the center wing. The left wing was Bourbon's division, and the right wing was Yalder's legion placed in the back. Skira's cavalry was entrusted with the role of advance guard for the center wing there would inevitably become the foremost front line and see the fiercest battle. Casualties would naturally be high, but there was also the honored duty of starting the battle. Skira's entrusted role was to drive a wedge between the enemy's center and left wing. Highly valuing Skira's prowess, Barbara had given Skira this important duty and had stifled his confident Octavio's opposition. Assigned as her support was Major Conrad formerly of the 4th Army, who recently had recovered from his wounds, and Octavio, who had opposed until the end. Barbara's main body and Bourbon's division would be a decoy to stalemate the front, and the main duty lay with the right wing led by Yalder. Desiring experience and valor, Barbara had ventured to select Yalder who he had an dog-cat relationship with for this duty. Now that his desire for promotion had been satiated, he intended to do everything he could for victory. He also had reason to harbor doubts about the leadership ability of his confidant Octavio and the others. 44 After they divided and isolated Karna's plateau, Yalder's right wing would circle around, aim for the side thin in defenses, and annihilate them, which would bring the operation to its final stage. After gaining control of the high ground, they would use that momentum and descend on the enemy headquarters. This was Barbara's drafted operation. Your Excellency Barbara. Why did you let General Yalder command the detached right wing dash? Not only that, 
I cannot believe you left the role of the wedge to that little girl. Please entrust such an important role to the senior generals of our first army. Knowing the details of the operation, Octavio appealed to Barbara while sending Spit flying. Why was Yalder entrusted with the detached right wing that seemed to have the most reward? Above all, he couldn't accept that he, of such long service, was to be the rear guard of a little girl who recently became a colonel. If this operation went all, Skira would have the achievement of successfully dividing the enemy, and would be promoted to Major General, the same rank as Octavio, despite her humble birth. He couldn't even laugh. Just imagining it made him dizzy. Octavio. We must win this battle no matter what. Colonel Skira's almost terrifying prowess is known not only by our allies but also the enemy. I have deemed that she is the most suitable for the role of cutting in and breaking apart the enemy line, and, that you are the most suitable to back her up. Barbara level-headedly declared. Octavio persisted, but Barbara took no notice of him. Your Excellency. You're annoying Dash. This is a decided matter. We cannot make changes now. You should obediently follow my orders Dash. Dash. B. By your will. 44 Barbara scolded, and Octavio was unwillingly cowed. Normally, he was very daring, but in crucial moments, he had a timid side to him, which Barbara had seen through. Octavio left the pavilion, and took along his adjutant who was waiting outside for him back to his own camp. Barbara rubbed his temples. He now finally realized Sharav's troubles. He had been able to complain as much as he wanted precisely because Sharav was there to complain to. Now that Barbara was burdened with the lives of the entire First Army, he wasn't allowed such behavior. Shit dash dot. Sir Octavio. Are you fine with this? The adjutant who had been listening asked Octavio whose face was red. Was it really fine having the role of a little girl's rear guard, he reminded. Octavio's promotion went hand in hand with his. Humph war, is something that once started, judgment on scene takes priority. Commanders who adapt themselves to the situation are who we need to be our generals. Besides, that Colonel Skira will sadly overextend, too hasty for merit, is another situation we can consider. If that happens, then there will be nothing we can do. I understand. It cannot be helped if that happens. It is a common story where someone dies in battle, too impatient to distinguish themselves and too lustful for promotion. The adjutant had a seedy smile. Octavio continued further. In fact, it might be better to abandon that little girl, and when the enemy is negligent, we cut into them. Kuka Dash, if she has as much prowess as the rumors say, she'll for probably survive. There's absolutely no need for us to support. I'll win this battle, and the nuisances will disappear. It goes without saying that Skira, who had been promoted with frightening speed, was included in those nuisances. The nail that sticks out gets hammered down. He had to quickly deal with this dangerous sprout that was likely to threaten his position, and he would nip it in the bud. It was these kinds of pointless political disputes that had been corroding the kingdom's army, but the persons themselves didn't care at all. Leading her cavalry and standing on the front lines, Skira took out a package she had fastened to her horse and devoured the final slice of the Yalder pie. Mixes of fruit juices gushed in her mouth, and Skira had a beaming, happy smile. To be able to enjoy the tastes of so many fruits in just one pie, Perhaps Yalder who had thought of this was a genius. Skira's impression of Yalder improved. The surrounding soldiers were watching her affectionately. There was an alluring, gap feeling about death who everyone feared stuffing her cheeks with sweets like a plain village girl. Colonel, you saved His Excellency Yalder's present for this day? I thought you had ate it all. You had seemed much captivated by it. Inquired Katarina, and Skira shook her head up and down while slowly chewing. Today is a special day. I'll be able to kill tons of the rebel scum to my heart's content. That's why, you know, I thought to eat something good before the important battle. 45 Skira had prepared the tastiest food she could, and that was this Yalder pie. If she could go to the royal capital, she intended on using all the money she had and going on a shopping spree. Yalder's feast, this delicious treat, she thought about going to the royal capital right now immediately, but she held back. Eating was important, but dealing with these scum was just as paramount. So that is the case, I understand now. Actually, I wanted to share some with you, but I ate all of it and there's nothing left. Sorry. If we go to the royal capital, I'll buy you all your share. Look forward to it. Not at all. Your feelings are enough for me. Katarina courteously declined. To be honest, she didn't like sweet things that much. Oh, said Skira. She licked her fingertips and stretched. Ahh, 
Dogs of the rebel army as far as the eye can see. Annoying trash in swarms. Infestation to the extreme. Don't you think so, Katarina? The vexatious forces of the rebel army were spread out far in front of them, and their green flag that made her irritated just by looking at it was fluttering. Genuinely displeased, Skira narrowed her eyes and grimaced. Her happy feelings instantly changed to something darkish. When Katarina handed her a hard candy, she threw it into her mouth without saying anything and pulverized it savagely. Thick killing intent began radiating from her small body, and her expression changed to something feral. Your orders, Colonel Skira. 45 kill everything within reach. Don't overlook a single rebel army scum. Kill all of them, whether they be civilian soldiers or young soldiers. No buts, kill them. Slaughter the rebel army dash. The colonel's orders are absolute, you must carry them out dash. If you understand, let's hear the colonel's orders dash. Katarina raised her voice, and all the cavalrymen lifted their spears and yelled, Death to the rebel army dash. Victory to the colonel dash. Death to the rebel scum. Victory to Skira's cavalry dash. Victory for Colonel Skira dash. Hail Colonel Skira dash. They shouted praise towards Skira, not loyalty towards the kingdom. Soldiers not of Skira's cavalry were petrified and overwhelmed by their spirit. Skira smiled contentedly at her cavalry, then glanced at the flock of prey spread out before her, and deliciously licked her lips. Well then, let us conquer. Skira easily rotated her scythe above her head and began galloping with all her energy taking the lead. Her cavalry hoisting their black flags, a step behind, followed after her, kicking up a furious cloud of dust. 45 The Battle of Bertisburg, the fight to decide the fate of the kingdom's army and the liberation army, began. 45 Three hours after the battle began. The kingdom's army couldn't contain themselves and moved first. The liberation army followed suit, and the center advance guards of both armies collided in the middle of the plains. In the skirmish between these two vanguards were FYNN of the Liberation Army displaying his spearmanship and Skira with her scythe. Together with archer support, they both resolutely attacked the line of battle drawn by the infantry and grievously overran them. The adjutant Mila came to advise FYNN, who swung his spear even while doused by blood. Colonel Dash. Major Karnak's unit is being attacked by enemy cavalry Dash. They're likely to be annihilated at this rate Dash. Mila pointed behind her. The line of battle was in a sorry state, and cavalry carrying black flags were crushing the infantry with the force of a tsunami. Karnak was shouting, trying to somehow rally the troops, but he had no effect on the infantry being pushed back. They would be rooted eventually if this were to continue. The main bodies of both armies had not yet moved, so this loss would not be a fatal blow probably, but the tides would turn in favor of their adversaries. They must protect Karnak's unit. FYNN sweeped off the head of a kingdom soldier and immediately gave his judgment. 45 The Lion's Cavalry will change course and cover Karnak's unit in the back dash. Mila, I leave the rear guard to you. Please leave it to me Colonel Dash. A hundred riders follow me Dash. Lure the enemy. Oh you Dash. The rest follow me Dash. We will take Death's head this time for sure. We will honor our comrades who died on the road here. You oh 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 The cavalry raised their voices, responding to FYNN's encouragement. The morale of this unit comprised of elite soldiers was the highest in the Liberation Army. A hundred riders followed Mila, and they began to ride to attract enemy soldiers. Not wasting the opportunity, the main body of FYNN's unit began heading to Karnak's unit in the back. Conrad's unit of the Kingdom's army went to obstruct them, but the cavalry's momentum would not come to a halt. They couldn't let Skira's back be attacked like this, and Conrad's unit pursued with raging spirit. Karnak's unit. He had been granted 5,000 infantry, but their casualties had already exceeded 1,000. More than half of his remaining soldiers had wounds of some kind. Though they weren't homogenous in their birthplaces, his soldiers had high morale, and shouldn't have by any means been defeated by the kingdom's army. But, that was exactly the disaster occurring before his eyes. The line of battle they had frantically trained for had completely collapsed. Red blood flowed all over the earth, and evil demons were squeezing the last drop of life from the soldiers on the brink of death who couldn't move. M, Major. Let us escape. We are no match for death dash. Give the permission to retreat. 45 An adjutant with a sobbing face approached, but Karnak gripped him by the collar and shouted at him. You fool dash. This battle decides the outcome of the liberation war dash. Do you think that our vanguard in front of all the others could retreat? H, however dash. Shut it. 
Death God though she may be, she's human like us. She's nothing but an embellished and spread rumor dash. And take a look, Colonel FYNN's cavalry is heading our way. We just have to hold out a bit longer. Then we can launch a pincer attack. At Karnak's words, the adjutant focused far in front of them. Certainly, there was a party with the lion's flag galloping towards them. But, he didn't think they could hold out until they would arrive. Because, Ma, Major, we've been surrounded dash. Endure dash. Take a square formation dash. Line the spears and don't let them cut into us dash. Remember your daily training dash. Show the enemy no weakness dash. Karnak haphazardly wiped his streaming sweat and grasped tightly his personal weapon, a trident. After the line of battle had been broken, Skira's cavalry raced in a circle and broke into Karnak's unit from all around them. While constantly moving, never stopping in their movements, they continued to create fountains of blood. Stationary cavalry was fragile. As Skira understood that through instinct, she strictly ordered her soldiers to never stop moving. To supplement that, Katarina was preventing Liberation Army soldiers from reinforcing Karnak's unit. The black flag with a white crow coat of arms was already well known among the Liberation Army. A tragedy of slaughter was playing out while death's flag fluttered. 45 There was no one who would willingly jump to their deaths. They tried their hardest to fire arrows from a medium range. About time I wonder. Sir Dash, I think this is sufficient Dash Dot. All right, smash the enemy's formation Dash. Everyone follow me Dash. Oh you Dash. Skira's cavalry that was trampling them with circular movements nimbly took an arrow-like formation under her orders. Their completely disciplined movements would not lose to even the most seasoned of soldiers. This taut, rippling arrow was mercilessly fired at the hiding spot of their pitiful prey. S, stay back. D, death is dash N, no, I don't want to die. M, mom, why, what have I done to deserve this? The hands of the soldiers holding their spears trembled, and their faces paled. It was outrageous, what possibility was there to stop death? But even so, they had to fight. A platoon leader person tried to rouse them, stimulate them, and encourage them. Save your complaints for later dash, set the spears dash. They're coming dash. A juvenile-faced female could be seen at the forefront. Wielding a scythe dripping with fresh blood and a joyful smile on her face, she swooped down on them. Her black armor was already smeared with red fluid. A young soldier who made eye contact felt his knees give way, and he soiled himself. H, H I H, C A, I can't dash. M, M O, monster dash. Four pikes dash. Forward dash. The platoon leader gave his order, and the pikes were sent out. Their tips were easily cut apart, and the large scythe split the bodies of several men on the return swing. The cursed cavalry instantly surged into that opening. Soldiers whose strength left their legs were trampled by scores of horses and became pitiful corpses. The head of the platoon leader was sent flying by Katarina's sword. A few riders of Skira's cavalry were impaled by spears, but they paid no attention to them and continued to run as they were. Raising mad laughter, they continued to kill soldiers, brandishing their spears, and then they suddenly toppled, like dolls whose strings had been cut. Or rather, it would be more appropriate to say they had used up all their life force. They followed Skira's orders to trample and slaughter until their final moments. They died with extremely satisfied expressions. The robust square formation was crushed in one breath, and the demented blade gradually approached Karnak. His adjutant had already died in battle. That was a stroke of luck probably. He had died before confronting the monster before them. Definitely, that was a fortunate matter. At least, more fortunate than him. Karnak lowered his hips so his gaze wouldn't meet Skira's atop her horse. His target was the horse. He would stab the horse, and kill death when its posture was in disarray. He could see himself winning on equal footing. The horse must fall first. Major of the Liberation Army, Karnak. Here I come Dash. A dog shouldn't bark so proudly. I don't care about a trash's name Dash. Skira spurred on her horse and approached Karnak. Her scythe was held out horizontally, and she planned on splitting his torso with one blow. 46 Karnak postured straight in front of her. He concentrated all his nerves on this one attack. Got it Dash. Karnak's trident sailed true, and it pierced the throat of Skira's horse. Karnak was showered in its blood. As Skira's balance was broken, she couldn't swing her scythe. Karnak extracted his trident and waited for the moment the horse collapsed. Once it fell, he would kill death. So he waited. Waited. And he waited. Why, why won't it fall? 
Why won't it die dash? Is even your horse immortal dash? Who knows why, I wonder. Dumbfounded, Karnak studied the horse. He was sure his trident had torn the horse's throat. Yet, why wasn't this horse dead? Why wouldn't it fall? He couldn't kill death if it didn't fall. In the horse's empty eyes, the agitated figure of Karnak was reflected. That moment, he thought he saw it smile. Like it was scoffing at the few seconds he had left to live. No, the horse was certainly laughing. The horse of a monster, was after all, a monster. Why, you monsters dash. What the heck are you all dash? 46 fallen into a state of panic, Karnak again lunged with his spear. Didn't you guys give me the name? Death. So that's what I am. Farewell, then. Ah Karnak and even his trident was cut apart by her large scythe. His body split into two, and his organs splattered onto the ground. With blood dripping from its throat, Death's horse crushed underfoot Karnak's skull with all its weight. Like smashing a fruit, brain matter scattered. Satisfied. Skira tenderly brushed her horse's mane, and it lightly neighed, showing its agreement. Colonel Dash. Enemy cavalry are approaching from the rear. They have a lion emblem. Today is just preliminary fighting I was told, so we'll fight them while heading back, form ranks Dash. Skira's cavalry is changing course. Understood Dash. All units move out Dash. Begin changing course Dash. Follow the Colonel Dash. From Karnak's position, they again reformed the ranks, and Skira's cavalry began heading towards the center wing of the kingdom's army. FYNN's cavalry rushed into them, obstructing them. Behind FYNN raced Conrad to support Skira. They crossed, and it became a momentary battle with only one blow exchanged. They must not stop. A cavalry that stopped its movements lost its offensive ability and would become a target for archers. 46 at the head of both cavalries, Skira and FYNN were confronting each other while galloping. Death God Dash. I knew I should have killed you that time. Just how many people will you kill until you're satisfied Dash? Until I kill all of you, I won't die. I'll kill you like that dog earlier. Enemy of Karnak Dash, my name is FYNN, the Lion General FYNN. Oh how great for a dog Dash. I don't care about any of your names Dash. FYNN's spear and Skira's scythe crossed. Soldiers of both cavalries collided while wielding their weapons. Many riders fell from their horses at this collision. Riders died, their heads separated from their shoulders. Helmets were smashed, and soldiers fainted in agony holding their heads. There were people crushed under horses, and unable to move, their breathing ceased. During all this, Skira and FYNN were swinging their weapons, unleashing intense blows trying to take their sworn enemy's head. They never stopped moving, and their horses galloped while they exchanged many, many furious blows. H A A A A A A A A. Die Dash. Blood coming from her head, Skira's frenzied attack was stopped in the nick of time, and FYNN sent out a sharp thrust of his own. Despite gritting his teeth at the weight of her blows, he was somehow standing firm. If Skira was the hero of the kingdom's army, then FYNN was the hero of the Liberation Army. They could not have made it this far with only luck. They exchanged many bouts, they exchanged many tens of bouts, but neither of them could inflict a fatal wound. Both Skira's cavalry and FYNN's cavalry were holding 46 their breaths while watching attentively. Their cavalries had already crossed each other, and normally, they should have stopped their duel and returned to their groups. But currently, neither Skira nor FYNN could be stopped. Then, they could only watch and believe in their leader's victory. In the center of the battlefield, the general skirmish still going on, a weird space was created where only these two riders crossed weapons. Conrad's unit who came to back Skira, and a unit of the Liberation Army that had come to pursue Skira, couldn't move. Ha dash, ha dash, Skira dash. If you have this much skill, why are you supporting the Rotten Kingdom dash? Asked FYNN in a tone with not a trace of his normal collectedness. If she had this much ability, she should be able to distinguish herself even in the Liberation Army, no doubt. There was value in just trying to extend an invitation. Having actually crossed blades, FYNN thought so. This woman, was certainly strong. You guys are more rotten dash. The ones who stole my last bit of food, were you guys dash. I will never, never forgive you dash. Shouted Skira in a rage. Come to the Liberation Army dash. You won't die futilely here. Let's overthrow the kingdom together dash. Princess Alchura, will surely build a world, where no one will suffer dash. Shut up shut up shut up dash. I'll make it so you can't spout that nonsense ever again dash. 
I'll kill you in Altura Dash. Mad, Skira unleashed an attack charged with all her power. It was in blow unleashed with her eyes bloodshot and her teeth clenched to their limits. It was Skira's greatest 46 swing, loaded with all of her energy that would smash even the strongest impediment without any resistance. Her scythe howled in displeasure. Of course even FYNN couldn't receive this blow, he judged, and he promptly threw himself off his horse to evade. FYNN's horse in the wake of the scythe was cleaved in two, spasming while its viscera flew out of its torso, and it died. Skira with her breathing ragged approached FYNN with his posture broken, to give him the finishing blow. This is the end. Regret that mouth that made fun of me. I'll cut you limb from limb. Cut dash. Having thrown his spear away, FYNN drew his sword while on the ground. He wouldn't be able to stop the next blow like this. He would be cut along with his sword. And he would die. FYNN steeled himself, when, save the colonel dash. Repulse that death god. Archers ready dash. Fire dash. Receiving adjutant Mila's orders, the archers volleyed at Skira. Several fired arrows struck Skira's armor and her horse, hindering her before her final blow could reach her prey. Arrows were fired again. She didn't receive any fatal blows, but Skira couldn't go on the offensive. You trash get out of my way dash. Kill the death god dash. Use any means necessary dash. Kill her here dash. Another volley, fire dash. Aim for that thing's horse dash. 46 Skira spun her scythe to brush away the drizzling arrows. Seeing that opening, FYNN corrected his posture and ran towards his own soldiers. Skira clicked her tongue, and returned to beside Katarina and the others while knocking down arrows. She could have killed that man with one more blow. But, he was lucky until the very, very end. And, her luck was bad. That's all it was. Are you unhurt, Colonel? Damn it, to intrude upon a one-on-one -on -one fight dash. Katarina and the others had restrained themselves from interfering in the commander's one-on-one -on -one fight in fear of incurring Skira's displeasure. She deeply regretted her mistaken decision. Yeah. When I thought about a duel, I got too heated, and lost. This isn't a match, but a battlefield. There is no cowardice or cheating. Next time, don't hold back you guys. Kill them all. Sir, understood Dash. Horns resounded, calling them back. From both armies. The sun would set soon. The first day of battle would probably end here. Well then, let's go home. I'm hungry. I've moved a bit too much. All troops pull back Dash. Don't be negligent with your guard. Skira gave the order to pull back, and the cavalry took formation, surrounding their commander, and began repatriating. 46 The first day of the Battle of Berdisburg ended with 6,000 casualties for the Kingdom's army, and 8,000 casualties for the Liberation Army dead and wounded included. The fiercest battle unfolded in the center wing. Constantly, the kingdom's army was superior as Karnak's unit was destroyed. Bourbon's division of the left wing succeeded in causing a stalemate, and Yalder's legion of the right wing had waited for the sun to set, and began marching towards Karna's plateau. There would be many more casualties after this first day, and both commanders, Barbara and Altura, struggled with their power of command. With one order, they would create many thousands, many tens of thousands of casualties. They especially could not miss an opportunity to put a strategy into action. Also, they could not allow their inner anxiety to show on their faces. It would cause unrest in those around them and would probably become a weak link closely tied to their defeat. These rigorous days that shaved away at their spirit would continue until this fight was over. Until then, they wouldn't know who held glory, and who held ruin. Having narrowly avoided death, FYNN thanked his own good fortune, and thanked his excellent adjutant. Mila. You saved me today. Really, thank you. That I'm able to live on like this, is thanks to you. FYNN fixed his eyes on the face of his adjutant and said his thanks. Her face red, Mila flusteredly shook both her hands. And, no. It was nothing. When I thought that you, Colonel, would be killed, I was frantic myself. Also, protecting you is my mission. All thanks to your accurate judgment. I got greedy by mistake. If possible, I thought I could win over the death god to our side. Now that I think about it, that was a stupid endeavor. There is no way death could understand the language of humans. 46 It was the first time FYNN had been struck by such powerful killing intent. It wouldn't be strange for plain soldiers to be unable to move with their knees quivering. That monster, returned safely despite receiving so many arrows. That horse too. I cannot believe it. She really is like, death itself. Muttered FYNN, 
touching a wound on his cheek. Skira had said earlier that, the ones who stole my last bit of food, were you guys. Around when the Liberation Army was in a dire financial situation, there was a rumor that Diener had provisioned food from somewhere. Perhaps, death was spawned from those sacrifices, FYNN thought. Which meant that she was an irreconcilable enemy. There would be no accommodation. Until she met her end, she would swing her scythe, killing, killing, and killing. Persuasion would absolutely not get through to her. Diener's thinking was always grounded in reason. He was a man who wouldn't mind killing a hundred by his own hands to save ten thousand. That probably wasn't wrong. But, for those people included in the hundred, they wouldn't forget their resentment. And that resentment which burned hotter than the fires of hell. Though thinking about it won't change anything. Nothing can be done about it, now that it's come to this. The only solution is to kill death. If we can that is. The biggest problem was whether or not they could kill her. Frankly speaking, she couldn't be fought one on one. He couldn't believe it, but Skira surpassed him in physical strength. FYNN was probably better in technique and spearmanship. But, strength was what it came down to in a battle to the death. Superficial technique would be blown away in the face of overwhelming strength. Really, FYNN had been driven one step away from death. 46 Next time, we will fight with you. Death God though she may be called, if we all fight, I am sure we will manage somehow. Justice is on our side. We will not lose to something like death. FYNN smiled at his constantly optimistic to a fault adjutant. FYNN was captivated by that side of her. But, for that very justice, how many thousands of lives had been lost today? It would be fine if they had resolved to die. But, what about the volunteer soldiers or the militiamen? And who would take care of their families left behind? What even was justice? FYNN didn't know. But, he couldn't vocalize that. He had gambled on the Liberation Army's victory. That's why he had decided to rise up. He would keep running until the end. No matter how much blood would flow. He wouldn't die until then. Like he could let himself die. He would necessarily live until the end, and leave behind his name as a hero. Momentum has gone to our adversaries for the beginning of this battle. We have to recover from here. Starting tomorrow, we have to work even harder to make up for our disgrace today. Sir, we will serve with everything we have. That night. Skira was having a meal next to her beloved. While gently petting her dear horse lying beside her with his eyes closed, she was drinking now cold soup. Seeing her, Katarina hesitantly asked her. Colonel. For Katarina took out her cane from her waist. If Skira wished it, it wasn't impossible for this corpse to move. She began preparing her sorcery, and waited for the signal. No need. Even if you force it to move, it won't be my horse anymore. So, I will separate from this child here. It's a little lonely though, since this child has always been with me. Skira quietly shook her head sideways. If Katarina used her necromancy, they could certainly be together like always. But, it would be different, she thought. The soul accompanied the self. In that case, what was here, was only a lump of meat. Though she looked at this meat, she felt no surge of appetite. Even if she ate it, she wouldn't be satisfied. So she wouldn't eat it, it surely wouldn't be delicious. Forgive me for being so obtrusive. I beg your pardon. Deeply apologizing, Katarina fixed her askew glasses. It's fine. I honestly thought about eating it, but I'll stop this time, since I don't have the appetite for some reason. So, I won't eat this child. After this meal, I'll give him a burial. He carried me all the way here, even with his throat cut. Don't you think he did his best? Sir Dash. While his throat was perforated and his entire body was showered with arrows, he had carried his master back to her allied camp. That wasn't something that could possibly be believed. Yet, this horse had done it. While dribbling bloody saliva, he had carried out his duty. 47 It was originally Colonel Voller's horse of the Imperial Army, but he had been tamed by Skira. Since then, he had carried death and gone through fierce battles together. After struggling along to the ally camp, he silently kneeled, and snuggled his face up next to Skira's, and then expired, like he had used up all his vitality. While still riddled with arrows, Skira took out all the arrows on her horse. After cleaning up her horse's body as much as she could, she thus then had a meal together. The people not of Skira's cavalry gazed uncannily at her. How could a person who showed such lack of mercy towards her enemy show such deep compassion towards just a horse? They couldn't understand. The cavalry members could understand the feeling. 
Like the saying, horse and man are one being, a horse was one's partner. The soldiers of Skira's cavalry, no longer able to bear this treatment akin to a criminal being publicly exposed, chased away the onlookers, and then only Skira and her horse's body were left. Can you prepare a horse for me to ride tomorrow? If possible, a strong horse like this child. The fight will yet continue. Katarina, sorry, but please. Please leave it to me. I will procure the finest and swiftest horse. Then, I will take my leave. Please call me if you need anything. I will leave one man behind nearby. She gave a signal and called one cavalryman over. Katarina gave her orders in a small voice, and the soldier stepped back. Katarina wanted to stay behind too, but there were many things that needed to be done. An enemy night raid wasn't impossible. They couldn't slip in their vigilance. Yeah, please do. I will stay a little longer so you go ahead. Katarina saluted and left the place behind. In the darkness now returned to silence were left death and her beloved horse. Until Skira felt satisfied, she kept on brushing the cold body. 47 with an expression unfit for a grim reaper who spread death, she rested her head on her horse's abdomen, caked with dried blood. Oh yeah, I haven't given you a name yet. We've been through so much, so I'll give you one now. Stay with me a little longer, until I can think of a good name. The pale horse that raced across the battlefield with death on his back, would never move again. 47 Second Day of the Battle No large-scale conflict occurred like the day before. It ended with small skirmishes where only arrows were fired. Third Day The war was a complete stalemate. Both armies fell into a situation where they couldn't act. Both lines of battle glared at each other, and the sun idly set. Then the fourth day. Yalder's legion had arrived near Karna's plateau. Receiving that information, Barbara gave the order to commence the recapture of Karna's. As planned, Octavio instructed Skira and Conrad's unit to drive into enemy lines. In tandem, Barbara and Bourbon's units gradually advanced their lines to attract the enemy. The Liberation Army also deployed FYNN, Biraus, and Altura's main force. This nightmare of a day would become the bloodiest day for the Liberation War. Under the strong, blazing sun unthinkable for spring, the battle began. Yalder's legion took formation to the west side of Karna's plateau. Yalder grimaced, seeing the firm encampment built on the plateau. 47 This won't be good. They've built a tougher formation than estimated. This'll be tough to break in a short amount of time, the enemy's commander seems quite competent. Your Excellency, this is not a situation to be admiring them. We must capture it in haste. Warren Sidemo, and Yalder decisively nodded saying that was obvious. I know that. Launch the signal flare. Inform the detached force on the other side to begin the assault dash. Sir Dash. Obeying Yalder's orders, a soldier launched a signal fire. This was to signal Skira and the others who should have been deployed to the east. The plan was to divide the enemy's left wing and then pressure Karna's plateau from both sides. Afterwards, they planned to gain control of it. The success of this plan hinged on matching their timing. Sidemo Dash. Advance the infantry. Target, the encampment on Karna's plateau Dash. Coordinate the longbowmen and rain on them incessantly Dash. And break the enemy's defensive position with catapults Dash. Understood. Messenger, tell all the infantry to march. Have the engineers construct catapults and then go support them. Absolutely do not expose them. Advance while staying together Dash. Understood Dash. After instructing the messenger, Sidemo studied Karna's plateau. From the encampment on the high ground proudly fluttered the Liberation Army's flag. 47 It seemed nearly all the garrison was deployed to face them. Which meant that their east side was short of hands. If they attacked there, that would absolutely turn the tides. They could not overlook this chance. It was his given duty as a staff officer to seize even a moment's opportunity. Rouse yourselves everyone dash. This fight will decide the kingdom's fate. We must win. You oh 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 Encouraged Yalder, and the long-serving soldiers that followed him from Antigua and Belta fervently cheered in response to their commander's inspiration. The training and morale of these soldiers that had gone through many hardships together were of a relatively high level in the kingdom's army. There was no longer anyone here who would abandon the kingdom. Fighting erupted in the west of Karna's plateau. Bourbon's division had attracted the enemy's right wing. Their leader Major General Bourbon was an extremely passive and indecisive man, but this duty could rather be said to be perfect for him. He hesitated at everything and took much time before making a decision. Your Excellency Bourbon. Your orders. You, hmm. 
I received instructions from General Barbara to attract the enemy but... Yeah, maybe we should attack? Or maybe defend? I didn't learn about this you know. To stalemate the war front, we first dash your excellency. Wait, I'm thinking. I'm a man who's made it to Major General. No matter the situation, I must move prudently. Losing here will create a situation we can't recover from. If 47 we don't take the time. Let me think a bit more. In that one practice simulation, what did I do again? Carefreely, Bourbon tried to remember the contents of the simulation. His staff officer drew closer, losing his temper, but Bourbon was not at all agitated. Your Excellency, we do not have such time. Battle has already started. You have to immediately give the soldiers instructions dash. Shut up. I'm thinking right now. Why Your Excellency? Should we attack? Should we defend? Bourbon didn't know which was better. Should they assertively launch an attack? Or should they devote themselves to defense? He hesitated and hesitated, and couldn't give instructions to his subordinates. Ironically, that turned out for the better. Confronting them, Birouz's vanguard of the Liberation Army came for a resolute attack, but Bourbon's division didn't go at them from the front, but evaded, slippery like an eel. Bourbon's inability to make a decision ultimately became instructions for them to make the decisions on site. On the other hand, as Birouz had long years of experience with commanding, his subordinates unconditionally abided by his instructions, believing that he would lead them to victory if they followed him that dependence brought forth some delay in their movements, and they couldn't catch up with the kingdom's army arbitrarily moving, making decisions on site and adapting themselves to the moment. What the commander of the kingdom's front line prioritized above all was to not die. He would fight such that he wouldn't violate military regulations, deal with it adequately, and then retreat. And then when he judged that there was an opening to take advantage of, he would adequately launch an attack, distinguishing himself. 47 Though their morale may be low, they were picked troops thoroughly trained by the now deceased Sharav. There were many excellent men among their non-commissioned officers. Likely, had Bourbon directly took command, they would have probably been quickly cornered and rooted. That man had no experience fighting while leading a wing. Erg, the enemy seems quite capable dash. They pretend to attack and then withdraw, they withdraw, and then attack. Avoid chasing too far, there's likely troops in ambush. Do not be pulled in dash. Birouz threw down the cane symbolizing his command enraged. They were an extremely difficult opponent to deal with. They skillfully warded off his momentum. It would be to the enemy's plan to attack them if they chased too far like this. Your Excellency, how about ordering a general offensive? From what I can see, it is hard to say the enemy's movements are deliberately commanded. Shall we apply some pressure and see what happens? Unexpectedly, they might readily collapse. A staff officer who held doubts about the leadership ability of the kingdom's commanders didn't think those commanders could wield their command in such a way. He sensed that, likely, the unseen non-commissioned officer was moving of his own accord. Of course, Birouz understood that too. The enemy had no plan. From his long years of experience, he could tell that from intuition, but, Birouz shook his head sideways at his impatient staff officer's proposal while having an expression of regret. Our tactician firmly forbids a general offensive dash. Until his strategy is put into action, we must not launch a general offensive, he told me. Perhaps the enemy commander is a genius, or maybe an incomparable idiot. It would be impossible for me to do what he's doing. And trusting command to on-site judgment, if that goes poorly, the entire force will fall into chaos. 47 Presently, Birouz had to continue this clumsy battle since his main unit was ordered to not move. The right wing had completely fallen into a stalemate. Likely, as the enemy had expected. Endure until the start of the Operation Dash. This battle's victory and defeat lies with Sir Tactician's command. You have to win at all costs, I leave it to you, Sir Diener. Bertisburg Plains Eastern Front, stalemate. Divide the enemy's left wing. Having received Octavio's orders, Skira's cavalry and Conrad's unit fiercely and resolutely attacked, cutting into the border between the plains and Karna's plateaus east. The cavalry led by Skira cut a hole in the Liberation Army's line, and plunged forward while rigorously coordinating with Conrad. Colonel, everything is as planned so far. I will send the signal to Major General Octavio. Katarina dismounted and began preparing to raise the signal fire. All right, I leave the signal to you dash. Someone. Send contact to Conrad. Tell him to maintain his position until His Excellency Octavio arrives. Afterwards, we will invade Karna's plateau dash. Understood. 
Cavalry once merged with Conrad will fortify the line. Absolutely do not stop your movements. You'll be sniped. Move around and trample the enemy dash. 47 Skira pointed her scythe and raised her voice. The morale of her cavalrymen raised in conjunction. A messenger began running to Conrad's unit. They had achieved their first aim of dividing the enemy, but that was just like temporarily splitting the seas. If they didn't immediately build a dam, the waters would once again swallow them. Around them, the Liberation Army began reorganizing their lines to surround them, and it was only a matter of time before their preparations were in order. Skira's cavalry had risked their lives to open a small hole. The rush of Octavio's division was essential for this operation's success. Skira's cavalry was 3,000, Conrad's unit was 5,000, and Octavio's division was 30,000. That was the total number of men invested into diving the enemy's left wing. If all went successfully, Karna's plateau would be taken back, and besides that, they could even aim for the enemy's headquarters. The orders given to them by the division commander Octavio were simple and clear. As soon as the signal flare came from Skira's cavalry, he would instantly give the order to charge. For something as simple as that, even the weak-hearted Octavio could accomplish it, Barbara had judged. Your Excellency Octavio, the signal flare has come from Skira's unit. The adjutant Gerard reported to Octavio while peering through a spyglass. Octavio detestably smiled and replied, Kuka Dash, the judgment of a novice commissioned officer who doesn't know the art of war is unreliable. I decide when to move the division. It's still early for the assault. It's too early, don't you think? For Sir Dash, it does appear that the occasion is premature. Too impatient for merit, Colonel Skira has erred in her judgment. I believe the judgment of the man polished through hundreds of battles, His Excellency Octavio, should take precedence. Famu, then let's go with that. Contact all the units. Strictly order them not to move no matter what until my signal. They are not to move no matter what occurs. Transgressors will be charged with violating military regulations and will necessarily be given strict punishment, tell them that. Understood, however, this is just as your excellency predicted. Your discerning eye leaves me in admiration. Flattered Gerard, and Octavio pleasantly laughed. It seems that the Star God is our ally too. If General Barbara is promoted to Field Marshal, I will also surely be promoted. The rebel army will be annihilated, and the nuisances will die here. There will be no one standing in my way. Of course, you'll be following me too. I'm not a man who forgets loyalty. Sir Dash, I will follow your excellency to the ends of the earth. Well then, let's watch together, the final moments of that little girl who doesn't understand her place, the collapse of the famed death god of the rumors. Just how will she die? Kahaha Dash. This is so pleasing. Taking out the spyglass on his waist, he gazed with a sneer at the place where Skira's unit was fighting. The Liberation Army was hastily moving their lines to surround Skira and the others. The gap that they had gambled their lives to open was closing without any resistance. Stupid little girl. This is what you get for thinking to stand shoulder to shoulder with me. Kuka dash, cry, resent your own stupidity, and die dash. Octavio's division, didn't move. 48 without Octavio's division supporting their rear, Skira and Conrad's units had been completely isolated. In not even an hour. They were entirely surrounded, and like drawstrings being pulled tight, they started being pressured by the Liberation Army. Katarina had sent up signal flares many times, but Octavio showed no signs of moving. They only watched them from far away. Why, why won't they move Dash? At this rate, the opportunity we created will Dash Katarina threw down the fuming cylinder emptied of its flare. Skira calmed her while bitterly smiling. We were abandoned by that trash Octavio. It's so refreshingly easy to understand. But why dash? If they don't rush in right now, this operation will be a complete failure dash. For that garbage, I'm probably more of a hindrance and of an eyesore than the rebel army. And so, he would throw away victory, and he would choose to let 8,000 soldiers die. Isn't that it? Slowly rocking the scythe on her shoulder, Skira informed Katarina. All while gently brushing the body of her new horse that she wasn't used to riding yet. As soon as she made it back, she would kill Octavio. Absolutely, kill. Skira etched that onto her heart. And, no way. 48 while touching her glasses with trembling hands, Katarina stood in mute amazement. This kind of unreasonable thinking, letting their chance of winning slip from right under them, was absurd. Why did such a fool have the position of a division commander? It was entirely incomprehensible. Nevertheless, the reality was as Skira stated. 
Octavio's division would not move. Colonel. At this rate, we will be annihilated without accomplishing anything. We ought to leave behind one unit to buy time, and, the other will invade Karna's plateau, as per the strategy. Yalder's legion is, even now, conducting an offensive. We have to back him from our side. Sweat smeared and dust covered Conrad, out of breath, proposed to Skira. His infantry in a square formation was eagerly taking up bow and arrow and lunging with spears, not letting the enemy approach. The cavalrymen, who must not stop moving, were tracing a circle while battling with the enemy. But even so, they were at their limits. The enemy's forces were growing denser. Soon, their dam would break. The numbers were too different. S, still, we're not in a position to go support, and if we do that means dash, Katarina voiced her doubts. Conrad's proposal would end up sacrificing a unit. Of course, they need to be ready to be annihilated. Actually, they would certainly die. But, if, we take back Karna's plateau, this battle is still up in the air. If, we can't take back the plateau here, and we are annihilated, this battle is lost. So, we must launch an offensive, no matter the cost. Well then, I and my cavalry will stay. To the east of here is seen the flag of the rebel army's supreme commander. Probably, Altura is there I think. If we kill her, this battle 48 will be over won't you say? We'll act as the diversion, and kill the chief of the dogs while we're at it. Skira pointed at the company lined in the distance. On the Liberation Army's flag was drawn the crest of the royal family. It was Altura's flag. Still, struggling over there, no matter how one theorized, was impossible. They would have to break through many lines of battle stretched around that destination, and then further crush the defensive encampment. If one considered that enemies would come in support from all four sides, it was as impossible as overturning heaven and earth. No matter how hard Skira fought, she couldn't defend against a rain of arrows. Even if Skira could defend, her horse couldn't. Once she lost her legs, she would be surrounded by infantry and eventually killed. Conrad shook his head sideways and objected to Shara's opinion. Colonel, with your cavalry, you can break through this encirclement and attack Karna's plateau. Also, my infantry, I'm afraid to say, do not have any mobility. Let us remain behind. Major Conrad. Rank is absolute in an army. Didn't you say that the other day? A superior officer's order is absolute. That's what it means to be an army. Abide by my orders. Your unit will immediately commence an assault on Karna's plateau. Skira knocked down a flying arrow, and ordered. She took out a sickle from her waist and threw it at a man commanding the archers in the distance. The sickle stuck into the breastplate of his armor, and her target stopped breathing. The archers of the Liberation Army were unnerved, and they momentarily stopped their attacks. Judging there was no more conversation, Skira decided to give the order to assault Altura's encampment. Conrad let out a deep sigh, and took out a certain thing. This method would be faster than talking to this woman. 48, you haven't changed at all since Beltaha, Colonel Skira. Even on the verge of death you can be so aloof from the world. This way of talking suits you more than awkward formalities. Also, if you understand, hurry and go for me. We'll go take the head of the rebels now. There's no time for idle chatter. Conrad pulled on the reins Skira was holding, and took out two large beans. There was one roasted bean with an X mark on it. Roasted beans, a product of Belta that Skira had coveted before battles. We'll decide it with this. Like how we did it at Belta. The one with the mark is the winner. The winner will advance toward Karnas, and the other will remain here and buy time. Okay. I want to say I refuse, but you wouldn't accept that would you? Asked Skira with an amazed expression. Conrad nodded. That's correct. Listen to the opinions of your seniors. Fine. Let's hurry up and do this. There's really no more time. Conrad mixed them in his hands, and held a bean in his left and right. Skira chose the left. When his large hand with clots of blood stuck to it opened, there appeared the bean with the X mark on it. Your luck is good, Colonel Skira. As agreed, you are the winner. The colonel will go to Karna's plateau. Leave the rest to me. 48 Conrad threw the bean with the mark to Skira, and hid the other. Show me your right hand. Open your right hand and show me, Major. Not abiding by Skira's words, Conrad threw the bean gripped in his right hand into his mouth and exaggeratedly chewed. There is no time, Colonel. As quickly as possible, head to Karna's plateau. Shouted Conrad, and Skira silently turned her horse's head. A promise was a promise. She was the winner, and Conrad was the other. That was it. Katarina Dash, 
have the cavalry form ranks. We will charge towards Karna's plateau. Yes, sir. Dash. Understood. Conrad, I leave the rest to you. Let us meet again. Please leave it to me. Dash. Someday, once again. Conrad split his unit into three, and he made one go northward as a decoy and another one advance with the aim of enemy Supreme Commander Alchura's encampment. The last one would support Skira's assault until their end. None of them could hope to return alive. The enemy had to protect Alchura while preventing their withdrawal and further obstruct Skira's charge. The line of battle should be greatly disordered. Conrad would participate in the assault at Alchura's camp. He had decided to wield his spear until his life died out. 48 Skira reorganized the cavalry, and commenced the assault towards Karnas. Conrad's infantry cut into the enemy line to cover for them. The exhausted soldiers died one after the other, but Skira's cavalry was steadily advancing. Conrad took one last look at death, and strongly burned the sight into his eyes. Despite being a little girl, she was a brave woman like from a fairy tale. Yet even so, she had a gluttonous disposition, as well as behaviors and expressions unbefitting of a hero. Conrad couldn't hold back a sarcastic laugh. A senior staff officer standing next to him spoke. Major, I have brought something nice, do we have permission to raise it? You will also be quite pleased with it, Major. What is it? This. What the senior staff officer took out was, the flag of the ruined 4th Army. It had the now deceased David's coat of arms on it. I permit it. Humph, <laughs> you're a fine hoarder. I didn't really like General David that much, but you've taken good care of us, Major. It has been an honor, coming this far together with you. The surrounding soldiers looked at Conrad fleetingly, and nodded in agreement. Then, they pointed their spread towards Alchura's camp in the distance. Everyone had resolved themselves. Sorry. I'll have you accompany me until the end. Your orders dash. 48 4th Army of the Yuz Kingdom, Belta Infantry Battalion, will begin the assault dash. Show them our medal dash. Take Alchura's head, the leader of the rebel army dash. Forward. The 4th Army's flag fluttered grandly. Conrad held his spear aloft and began running, acting as the vanguard. The soldiers followed after him. Everyone was tired, and their breathing was erratic. A hail of arrows created many corpses. Regardless, they charged into the enemy's line while shouting angrily and showing no fear. Long live the 4th Army. Long live Conrad's battalion. Long live the Yuze Kingdom dash. Charge dash. Here we go dash. Conrad's spear pierced a Liberation Army soldier's throat. He immediately pulled it out and mowed down the body of a flustered young soldier. You oh 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 oh. The guys from the kingdom are coming dash. Get ready dash. Don't these guys, fear death dash. Don't let them break through. Ahead of them is Princess Alchura's camp. The enemy has split into three directions dash. Why, your orders to pursue dash. The enemy's a small force, what's there to be scared about dash. Can't you calm down. 48 The kingdom's army charged until their ends, unafraid of death, and threw the liberation army surrounding them into chaos. The enemy forces had split into three directions, who and how would they pursue? The commander's instructions were slow, since at this rate, it was certain their encirclement could be crushed. Just by his wavering, the number of victims increased. Conrad's unit fought heroically. They broke through the line at three sites, and they used up all their strength struggling to the defensive encampment. Ha dash, ha dash. In front of Conrad who wielded his spear all alone with wounds all over his body appeared the Liberation Army's second in command, Alan. He thought it strange that he was forced to kill a soldier. A commander with much renown I suppose. I am the Liberation Army's vice commander, Alan Keeland. I would like to have a bout with you. Major Conrad of the Kingdom's Army. Here I come dash. Sword and spear struck each other. Alan made the best of his sword's lightness and unleashed a flurry of blows. Conrad awaited his chance while blocking them with his spear. He made Alan overextend, and immediately afterwards brushed away the blade with Alan's weight behind it. Cut dash. Eat this dash. 48 Conrad's thrust grazed Alan's cheek. Alan flinched for an instant at the extreme sharpness of that spear thrust. Seeing this opportunity, Conrad went to unleash another one, but he collapsed to his knees the moment he did so. His stamina, had been exhausted. S, shit dash, prepare yourself dash. Alan's longsword was swung down from above. D, David. Your Excellency, I, Oppo, Logi, Z. Colonel, the rest dash Conrad fell forward. 
After Alan decapitated Conrad, he ordered for him to be courteously buried. He had been a magnificently brave warrior, rare in the kingdom's army. Conrad was killed, the isolated soldiers were dying like following after him. The diversion unit that headed to the north was similarly annihilated. The unit that supported Skira, when they exhausted their arrows, charged in, and were extinguished one by one. Riding parallel beside Skira, Katarina turned and looked behind her for a second. Conrad's unit was swallowed by the masses, and she confirmed their annihilation with her eyes. At the same time, corpses planted behind them exploded, throwing up a smoke screen. Colonel, Conrad's unit was annihilated. That's so, unfortunate. But, we'll surely be able to meet sooner or later. For while swinging her scythe with one hand, Skira took out the bean Conrad had duped her with and put it in her mouth. It was very bitter, and astringent. Skira's face scrunched up. Thanks to the blood that had been on his hands, it also tasted of iron. Colonel. Nothing, it was just a bit bitter. From behind them, enemy cavalry came in pursuit. The speed of Skira's cavalry, advancing while crushing the enemy in front of them, was helplessly slow. Katarina sent a signal with her gaze to one rider, such that Skira wouldn't notice at all. She didn't need to know. Fight until you die, and buy time. This was the order Katarina had conveyed to them beforehand. In the end, she too intended to hold her ground and fight to the death. Three hundred soldiers farthest in the back silently turned around and began charging at the enemy pursuit force. They were like sacrificed pieces. So that their superior officer could advance forward, they were to buy time. Katarina judged that they wouldn't be able to make it if she didn't prepare sacrifices, no matter how much skill Skira had. Glaring at Karna's plateau, Skira didn't notice. Also in a way that she didn't notice, Katarina and the others advanced while surrounding Skira. So this side really is lacking in men. The enemy garrison has sent their main force at Yalder's Legion. We'll go and raid the enemy encampment. We cannot waste the valuable time Major Conrad has created for us. Indeed. As planned, we will capture Karna's plateau. I will absolutely do so. Skira and 2,000 riders forcibly tore through the sporadic resistance while determinately rushing up the high ground. Yalder was making a fierce attack from the 49 West. Karna's plateau had unexpectedly been pincered according to plan. Of course, it could also be said that Skira's cavalry was being pincered too. How long could the 300 riders prevent that? A hopeless struggle to the death began. The cavalry holding their ground to hinder the pursuit were loyally carrying out their duty. We are Skira's cavalry. You shall not pass. Long live Colonel Skira. Victory for the Colonel. Skira's cavalry swung their spears, shaking off fresh blood. Many arrows stabbed into their armor, and there was also someone who had one stuck in the middle of his face. Yet even so, the cavalry didn't lose their will to fight, and continued to be an obstacle halfway up Karna's plateau. They had earned more than 30 minutes. They were approaching the limits of their endurance, but for their lord, they kept on wielding their spears until their deaths. Dash 200 riders remained. D. Don't be scared dash. The enemy is wounded. Spearman, advance dash. B, but dash. There, monsters dash. They shouldn't be able to move. Silence dash, this is an order. Advance dash. Receiving orders from a Liberation Army commanding officer, a spearman unit comprised of 500 men timidly sallied forth. Seeing that from behind, Vander encouraged them, presenting a certain premium. 49 He had received orders from Tactician Diener and had come to this place leading a unit. Those who kill that cavalry will be awarded one gold coin per head. Everyone liven up dash. A oh, one gold coin dash. P per head. Yes. Authorized by Tactician Diener. For the Liberation Army's victory, forward dash. The eyes of the soldiers changed. If they had one gold coin, they could live a life of luxury for months. Although the enemy soldiers were strong, they were already on the verge of death. They could crush them if they all went at once. Vander raised his right fist and had the soldiers under his command wait on alert. They were equipped with mechanical bows, crossbows. Crossbows were a weapon that anyone could regularly earn results with. It took time to reload them, but their power was guaranteed. In a way unnoticed by the spearman unit, they formed file and notched their arrows. Spearman, charge dash. Kill the enemy. 500 men under the infantry commanding officer commenced the assault. Undaunted, the cavalrymen of Skira's unit flourished their weapons, spreading death. It instantly became a melee, but the spearmen that had the advantage in numbers were completely pushed back. These cavalrymen, 
who had given themselves up for dead and in a sense had become death's soldiers asterisk, were not afraid of being injured. Their fighting spirit was incomparably different from the soldiers of the Liberation Army who had attachment towards life. 49 S shit dash. S save me dash. I knew this was impossible. Vict zero re for Colonel Skira dash. A rider pierced the head of the soldier seeking aid with a lance held in reverse grip. A spear from the side stabbed into the rider's abdomen, and he coughed up blood. He snapped the spear, and while toppling, gouged out the face of the paled man with its tip. The infantry lost his life, and the rider was still living. Seeing this state of affairs, Vander executed the one order he had been given from Diener while shuddering inwardly. No matter how many sacrifices must be spent, kill the death god and her cavalry. He lowered his right hand, and the crossbowmen fired their arrows. The arrows pierced into not just the cavalry, but also their own allied infantry. See, Captain Dash. What are you doing? Are you sane Dash? Angrily shouted another infantry commanding officer encircling the cavalry. Firing arrows that would friendly fire their allies was not a sane command. Silence. Those guys cannot be killed if we don't do this. In that case, these are unavoidable sacrifices. They will throw away their lives and be pierced with death's cavalry. Next, fire dash. The second volley was fired. The cavalry and spearmen were mutually pierced and died. W what you're saying doesn't make sense. Stop this for now dash. 49 first lieutenant. This is a battlefield. This is a plan to keep sacrifices to a minimum. Don't you understand? With an aggravated look on his face, Vander admonished the first lieutenant still young in years B but, it is not right to friendly fire allies. They are our allies right? Those guys are death's cavalry who will simply deflect our arrows. So live decoys are necessary to stop them. They are charging of their own free will, brave and steadfast for the Liberation Army's great cause. I can only respect their determination. There's no problem, wouldn't you say? Because you were the one who lured them with money. Do you curse their deaths? Our men are fighting for justice. There shouldn't be anyone among our comrades in the Liberation Army who works for money. Their deaths are something to proudly boast of. Tisk. End them. Leave not one of them alive. Give them rest. They can't be saved anyway. Vander snapped his fingers, and a third volley was done. There was not a single man moving after that attack. The soldiers of Skira's cavalry on the verge of death were finished off by the soldiers surrounding them. The arrows had been coated in poison. No matter how much fighting spirit they had, it was meaningless if their bodies couldn't move. This was the weapon prepared to reliably kill death's soldiers. This, this is wrong dash. The young first lieutenant threw down his sword. The soldiers under his command tried to pacify him, but he indignantly shook them off. 49, first lieutenant. Watch your words. Any further rash remarks will be taken as violation of army regulations. I will overlook it this once. Think well before you speak from now on. Tisk. I will begin the pursuit now. Excuse me dash. With a strained face, the young first lieutenant returned to his unit. Vander saw his former self in that man's image. This is for justice. I'm not mistaken. I'm different from those guys who kill children. I am fighting for the people so. So, I'm not wrong. Right, I'm not wrong. I should be right. Repeated Vander in his heart, and he clenched his fist. Before him were strewn the corpses of his former comrades, and the corpses of his current comrades. He was in the right. If he didn't believe so, he wouldn't make it out of the battlefield. Therefore, he wasn't wrong. I, am not wrong dash. Groaned Vander, running up the high ground while gazing at the cavalry raising that cursed, black flag. He had one more duty. The messenger carrying a certain directive had probably already reached the plateau's Garion. 49 Kingdom's Army, Barbara's headquarters. Send a messenger to Octavio Dash. Order him to immediately advance Dash. Barbara turbulently kicked his desk and ordered a messenger. He had received reports that Skira and Conrad had already attacked and successfully divided the enemy. He was furiously angered at why Octavio hadn't began the assault according to plan. They would be set back at this rate. No they were probably already too late. If he resists, have the military police restrain him. Can that man not even march his troops dash? The messenger hastily ran, and Major General LaRue's next to Barbara observed the state of the battle using a spyglass. The opening that Colonel Skira had created, risking her life in a charge, was already filled. The surrounded soldiers that had charged in had a high possibility of being annihilated. 
they would die in vain. This was around the time Yalder's legion would be climbing Karnas from the west. They couldn't change the operation now. Due to Octavio's foolish decision, the danger of being defeated drew near for the kingdom's army. They had divided their large army to take back the plateau. If that came to naught, the pace of this battle would lean towards the enemy, shit dash. They're useless, every last one of them dash. Why can't they just take command? What the heck have they been learning while rising to a general those retards dash? Octavio, this won't end with just a warning dash. Barbara's angry voice resounded emptily. LaRue's headed back to his own unit in silence without answering Barbara. He knew that Barbara didn't have the capacity for leadership. How would this have ended if Sharav were here? While remembering his now deceased superior officer, LaRue's deeply sighed. 49, it still isn't decided who the victor and loser will be. It'll be difficult, but we have to recover somehow. No matter how completely rotten it is, this is the country His Excellency Sharav had decided to protect. I must repay the favors I've received from His Excellency, even at the cost of my life. Having received Barbara's urgent demand, Octavio's division finally decided to move out. The horns trumpeted sonorously while they exultantly pushed forward to the line of battle. The units in front of them were awfully exhausted after doing battle with Skira and Conrad. Octavio was convinced that if they were rushed by his large army from the front, they would certainly be broken through. Kill the foes of Skira and Conrad's unit who had fought hard in vain and were annihilated. O oh brave warriors of the glorious first army, advance forwards dash. Don't fall behind. Relentlessly trample them. If you want achievements, they're yours for the taking dash. All units, charge. While spitting out shameless words, Octavio raised his sword. Clad in gorgeous armor without a flaw, he had a triumphant smile on his face. In this man's mind, he had already won. High ground encampment built on Karna's plateau. Gumza's division of the Liberation Army was being forced into an unsparing fight. The aggression of the kingdom's army making an onslaught from the west was severe, and the 20,000 soldiers given to him were split in half for defense. Precisely because it was a plateau, its terrain was rugged, and it took time to rearrange the units. He had been told by a messenger that the enemy unit assault unit to the east was completely surrounded at the foot of the plateau, and that their annihilation was only a matter of time. Having no more pressure from the east, Gamze had decided to meet Yalder's legion, who was making a suicidal attack, with all of his forces. He was enthusiastic about letting them taste a charge from the high ground. 49 face the enemy soldiers, and descend upon them dash. Messenger, order the entire garrison to take the momentum and charge from the high ground dash. Distinguish yourself as much as you want dash. Our numbers are the same, and we have the advantage in morale and terrain, we cannot lose dash. Understood. We'll get our revenge for the humiliation at Galbahar Ridge Dash. All units get to it Dash. If we distinguish ourselves here, the Belta faction will be no more. We must annihilate the enemy division no matter what. It's not at all enough to just defend a high ground. Like I'll go along with Diener's whims Dash. Having finished organizing, the garrison at the worst possible time launched a general offensive at Yalder's Legion attacking them, when, why, your excellency Gamza. E. Enemy raid. Calm down dash. The division to the west is the only enemy. Seize all of them dash. T, that's not it dash. Enemy cavalry are flooding from the east of Karnas with unstoppable pace dash. Be black flag with a white crow coat of arms. It's death. Death god Skira is here. Don't be ridiculous. Aren't those guys completely surrounded at the foot of the plateau dash? Have you lost your dash and explosion blasted apart the defensive encampment as the enemy cavalry appeared? Running ahead of them was death painted with blood. A corpse dangling from the tip of her scythe, she dashed towards him. Death threw the corpse like a sandbag, and pillars of flame erupted along with the shock of an explosion. His soldiers writhed as they lost their lives. The cavalrymen behind her spread out and trampled the guards who had fallen into a state of panic. 49 Gumza doubted his own eyes. S strange. Though I shifted the soldiers in the east, how could they have been broken through so easily? I should have kept 5,000 guards there dash. A misgiving flitted through the back of Gamze's mind. Wait. There was a report that one of Diener's subordinates was moving around the plateau for some reason earlier. Don't tell me, this was Diener's fresh, warm blood splattered on Gamze's face, engrossed in his thoughts. When he suddenly snapped out of it, before his eyes was death. All of Gamze's bodyguards had already been killed. In such mere short amount of time, a hideously cold-blooded spectacle had played out on the high ground encampment. 
you're surprisingly lax to be looking elsewhere in the middle of a battlefield. Well then, hurry up, and die. Kadash. That evil blade was swung downward at him, and tore Gamze's upper body. As he had reflexively lurched back, he had avoided receiving a fatal wound, but it was now impossible for him to avoid the next blow. While looking at his scattering, red blood like it had nothing to do with him, Gamze was convinced of his own death. And, he understood why he would probably die. He had been tricked by Diener. No matter how great she was, he didn't think she could break through 5,000 deployed in the east in such a short amount of time. No matter how strong she was, they should have at least been able to stall for time. But, here death was. Right, there were no guards. That man, had given death a helping hand. Or rather, he ought to say that Diener had used death's scythe. This Karna's plateau, was a gallow prepared for him. This was an execution for Gamze, who would obviously become Diener's political opponent after the war. And the executioner, was the female officer in front of him. Gamze somehow unsheathed his sword with his slightly trembling hands. Diener. I wish I could kill you directly. I'll be waiting for you in hell dash. The moment he tightened his grip on the sword, the crooked blade wailing in malice took off his head. Having taken control of the high ground, Skira dismounted and picked up Gamze's reaped head. His head had a resentful look on it. Give us a shout of victory. With everything you have, so Yalder's legion can hear. Convey to everyone that Karna's plateau has fallen, that we've the enemy general's head, and that the operation, has gone properly. She threw the head to Katarina and have her instructions. Sir Dash, please leave it to me Dash. Skira noncommittally scattered roasted beans that she had gotten from Conrad on the red-stained earth. She wasn't thinking of anything in particular. It's just, she felt like she should do this. She closed the pouch and retied it to her waist. One mustn't waste food. Fifty Katarina installed the flag of Skira's cavalry on the plateau's encampment. Then, she raised the enemy general's head and yelled. Skira's cavalry has taken out Karna's plateau. Victory is ours. Long live Colonel Skira Dash. Hail Colonel Skira. Long live Skira's cavalry Dash. Hail. Hail Dash. The cavalry members triumphantly waved their battle flags. Though they had been abandoned, they had under Skira captured Karna's plateau. While looking down at Octavio's division, the soldiers of Skira's cavalry forever raised their weapons to the sky and shouted in victory. War cries resonated across the corpse-riddled plateau. The Liberation Army to the west of Karnas, shaken by the captured plateau, began being rooted all at once. Yalder crushed them as he ascended the high ground and successfully merged with Skira. Karnas' plateau had completely fallen under the influence of the kingdom's army. Liberation Army Camp, Diener's Pavilion. Sir Diener. Karnas' plateau has fallen, and Gamze has died in battle. The Death God is shouting in victory at Karnas. I see. As arranged, bring the special duty ox cart unit to the front. Wait for the signal. Understood. Fifty having received that report from his spies, Diener glared at Karna's plateau with a cold, penetrating gaze. A black flag was fluttering on the high ground. Mostly according to plan. I've gotten Gumza who would probably become an obstacle later on to die, and I've chased death away to the high ground. My calculations were slightly off since the kingdom's army was much too incompetent but that's not a problem at all. Enemy division is approaching from the front. Do not make any movement. Tell everyone to pull them in as far as they can. Also have the archers on standby. Until I give my instructions, you must not move. Those out of line will be strictly punished. Sir Dash. After the surrounding soldiers left, Diener stabbed a knife into one point on the map that was on the table. The sharp blade pierced where royal capital Blanca was. At last. Now just remains my signal. With just that, this war will be put to an end. Everything is in the palm of my hands. Let's fully witness the kingdom's end. Kukadeshi stifled the laugher that almost leaked out, and he headed to the front lines after tearing the map with the knife. The state of the kingdom's army as it was brutally annihilated, the soldiers of the kingdom's army that would die screaming in anguish, this comedy of unsurpassed laughter that would soon unfold, he needed to watch this from a special, front row seat. This was his retribution to they who had raised him, used him, and then thrown him away. He wouldn't let it end just yet. Prime Minister Farzam and King Kristoff, until he sent them to hell, his revenge wasn't over. He would never let it end. Fifty with restraints installed on their heads, a unit of Cologne cattle attached to wagons were released, in a way that only the lines of the kingdom's army lay in their field of vision. 
They breathed wildly through their noses, and they would begin intimidation and showing aggression towards the foes, but they couldn't move their heads in the ways they wanted. Their fury seemed to be rising. The color of their eyes changed to an aggressive red. The special duty sorcerer's deployment is finished. Whenever you are ready, on your mark. Special duty ox cart unit, commence the assault on the first army. Diener plainly gave the order. The soldiers moved behind the oxen and took up their torture weapon, a curved short spear with a turn, ox cart unit commence the assault dash. Commencing the assault dash. Target, enemy foremost line, the infantry line. All right dash, get M dash. The soldiers stabbed the rears of the oxen with their spears, twisted, and gouged into them. They bellowed almost deafeningly, and the cologne cattle began charging. An appropriate word to describe their stampede was headlong. Only the kingdom's army in front of the beast centered their eyes. While pulling the carts loaded with gunpowder and sorcery mines, the herd of cologne cows plunged forward. Forgetting themselves at the sharp pain, the cologne cattle thought only to charge forwards, and forwards. They did not falter even when hit by arrows. Fifty here they come. First line, raise the shields dash. As long as we can stop the first charge, there's nothing to fear dash. Archers, shoot them down as best you can dash. Brace shields dash. Don't break the line dash. The kingdom's line went to stop them. Since they had gotten intelligence beforehand that the Liberation Army would probably be using cattle, they entered defensive postures with shields set. So that not even a bug could squeeze through, the soldiers huddled their bodies, lowered their waists, and braced their legs to stop the cattle's rush. The instant the ox carts with momentum behind them brushed with the large shields braced by the soldiers, the sounds of chain explosions boomed on the battlefield fifty shrieks and screams of the kingdom's soldiers echoed on the plains. The cluster of ox carts wreaked havoc on the line of battle of Octavio's division. They had done fine up to pushing back with their shields. Immediately following, the carried sorcery mines exploded at the special duty sorcerer's signal for ignition. To enhance its destructive power, the carts were packed with large quantities of gunpowder and sharp, metal scraps. Those scattered in all directions, maiming the limbs of the kingdom's soldiers or flat out penetrating their bodies, and many lives were stolen. Those that died were still counted as lucky. Soldiers struck by the iron shrapnel were in agony. They were deprived of their strength to fight, and they couldn't even die only able to writhe in intense pain. The sorcery mines were gotten from the Empire, but they didn't particularly excel in killing or wounding. Sure, they had destructive power, but they could blow away several tens of men at most. If their purpose was to cause losses in men, a large quantity of them needed to be invested, and the cost and labor would be too much. For the sake of reducing costs with more or less the same effectiveness, Diener had improved the weapons, which originally had to be laid, for use in a charge. The role expected of these ox carts, was to unveil a depiction of hell and to drain the enemy's fighting spirit, to reveal all too sickeningly that even if the soldiers stopped them, they would die, and to display that if they evaded, the oxen would plunge even further deeper into the formation and spread the damage. It was their aim to force the enemy into two unreasonable alternatives. Against the kingdom's soldiers who had low morale, these ox carts were almost painfully effective weapons. There was no soldier of the kingdom brimming with loyalty and bravery who would volunteer to be a shield, seeing the disaster before their eyes. Two hundred ox carts each were sent into the center wing and left wing as the first wave. Fifty the battle lines of the kingdom's army had fallen into chaos, and there was no longer any control. It was inconceivable that either generals, Octavio, or Bourbon, had the leadership ability to rally the present state. In this like a bolt out of the blue situation, they only stood in simple amazement. And, there were still prepared many more ox carts, loaded with weapons of slaughter. Calm down dash. Don't break the line. You must not let those ox carts through. Didonti joke around. Do you think us shields? Do you think to go against orders? If they break through the line, they'll explode inside the ally camp. Stop them here and keep the damage to a minimum. I won't forgive running away. Like I can follow that order. You retard dash. W. What did you dash, knocking down the officer loyal in his service, the kingdom's soldiers began running away for their lives. The second wave of ox carts broke through the advance guard and detonated inside the formation of Octavio's division. W, W, what is this? Just what the heck is going on? Adjutant, explain. I do not know. B, but, at this rate, our division will be annihilated. Your Excellency. Your orders. The adjutant sought instructions for Octavio, but he was in panic and not in a position to give any. W, wait. 
Those oxen are coming this way dash. Hurry and stop them dash. Make them stop. Fifty bodyguards, stop those ox carts. Protect his excellency's body. Why have they been allowed to penetrate this far dash? What are the frontline soldiers doing? The bodyguards around Octavio blocked the ox carts using their bodies as shields. No matter what kind of person their chief was, bodyguards had to protect at the expense of their lives. The Cologne cow's rush was stopped a small distance away from Octavio's headquarters. The Liberation Army sorcerer watching with a spyglass chuckled, and sent the signal for detonation. Half of the bodyguards enveloped in the explosion at point-blank range died instantly, and the rested squirmed on the ground while sustaining fatal wounds. The entrails of his bodyguards flew around before Octavio's eyes. Death had come this close before him. Octavio felt deep-seated terror. T, this is the enemy's new weapon. I must go report to General Barbara. If he doesn't immediately receive the particulars from me. G, Gerard, I entrust command afterwards to you. Cried Octavio tremblingly, wiping off the clots of blood stuck to him. He didn't want to be in this kind of place. Why did a high-ranking general like him have to be in danger of death? In Octavio's mind existed only the thought of leaving this place immediately. Why your excellency, if your excellency escapes now, our allies will be rooted. We must rally our position, somehow, here. I beg of you, please, refrain yourself and take command. This is something only your excellency can do. S, shut up, silence dash. I'm not running away, I'm just going to directly report. I'll be back instantly. I give command to you until then. Why, your excellency? A are you abandoning us? I leave it to you, Gerard. I won't forget your loyalty in my lifetime. 50 Octavio quickly got on his horse and began heading towards Barbara's headquarters while taking his remaining bodyguards. Left behind in hell, Gerard muttered one phrase while his face was turning pale. Despair, disappointment, regret, he fully let all of it out. It's over. This is, hopeless. The kingdom's army, his own fame, and the Yuz kingdom. Rampaging ox carts were imminently approaching. In the end, after calling to mind as many defamations as he could think of against Octavio, Gerard's time came. Octavio's division of the center wing completely fled. News spread that the commander had taken off, and the soldiers of the kingdom's army were falling apart, rooted. Diener released oxen which were not carrying sorcery mines and had them drive into the infantry again. The soldiers of the kingdom began escaping at the mere sight of them. The flow of battle had instantly gone to the Liberation Army. Bourbon's division in the left wing was in mostly the same state. The commander had not run away, but he couldn't give out effective orders. He couldn't even make the decision to retreat. This was karma for having him here entrusted with command. The non-commissioned officers, prioritizing their lives, threw down their weapons and deserted. Birows of the Liberation Army wouldn't let that chance go by, and he decisively carried out a general offensive. He stood at the head of the army and overran the left wing in a single stroke. Major General Bourbon escaped to the rear with what little troops he had under his command, with a staff officer and bodyguard dragging him by both arms. Barbara's headquarters in the middle of the torn-off middle and left wings. Larousse, seeing through the nature of the enemy's weapon, immediately spread out the soldiers, trying to keep damages to a minimum. For the ox carts, he ordered them to halt the oxen's feet. Though it was a makeshift plan, it was also the best means in this situation. Fifty throw your spears, stop the oxen's feet. Don't rush, calm down, and aim. Spearmen, throw dash. Despite being on the back foot, Larousse's soldiers followed directions and threw their spears. With several spears striking their legs, the Cologne cattle's balance was broken, and they toppled sideways. The ox cart's weakness was the weight of the wagon. Their advance could be stopped by pushing it over from the side or attacking the oxen's legs. From behind the infantry braced with shields, archers disposed of the ox carts with fire arrows. The sorcery mines wouldn't explode so long as they weren't given a signal of magical power, but the loaded gunpowder was another story. When they ignited, the carts scattered iron shrapnel with a thunderous roar. Tell the soldiers on the front lines to aim for the oxen's feet with their spears dash. Or try to topple them over with an attack from the side. We can't deal with them any other way in this situation. Absolutely do not stop them from the front, don't die in vain. Sir Dash. Larousse raised his voice, and the messenger saluted and headed to the front lines. To think they'd let regular herds of cattle infringe this far dash. If we lay out stakes, or maybe defense fences, we can cope. But we won't make it in time. Shit Dash, at this rate, 
Looking around him, all he saw were injured officers and men. Looking at the front lines, his allies were completely rooted. Just what should he do in this situation? LaRouze turned around, and headed to Barbara's headquarters with quick steps. Now that five their main forces had collapsed, the next to be surrounded would be their headquarters. They had to make a decision. LaRouze recalled Sharav's final words, and cursed in his mind. As Field Marshal Sharav said, I knew we shouldn't have started an attack. We should have hardened our defenses and waited for an opportunity. If we were in the mountains, this predicament would have been impossible- dash. Headquarters. Messengers were coming back and forth in a flurry. Octavio who had made a getaway and came here was giving a frantic explanation to Barbara who had a vein bulging on his head. The disapproving gazes of the staff officers shot through Octavio. Barbara was holding back his anger while grinding his teeth. Why, your excellency. That is the enemy's new weapon. It has terrifying power. I had to come report immediately and came here without looking back at the danger. Please, please understand Dash. I absolutely did not run away. And so, what happened to your soldiers? Did you, the commander of all people, abandon his soldiers and scurry home alone? And you still call yourself a division commander? Do you have no shame as a major general? Why, you are mistaken. I was just too anxious about your excellency's well-being, and I could not stop worrying dash shut up you fool dash. No some shame dash. Barbara's fist impacted Octavio's face. Blowing blood out of his nose, Octavio prostrated. 51, F, F, forgive me dash, and that's not all. You bastard, why didn't you rush in like the plan said? What were you thinking idly letting our chance of winning escape dash? He kicked Octavio's body. That didn't quell his anger. T, the signal flare. The signal flare did not go up. All the blame is with Colonel Skira. It should have been impossible for such a lowly little girl to accomplish that important duty in the first place. Protecting himself was more important than victory or defeat. If he was tried for violating military regulations, it would be capital punishment. Octavio frantically pleaded to avoid that. The signal flare did in fact come from Skira's unit, and reports say you disregarded it. Octavio, I'll have you make up for this misconduct with your life dash. Barbara was clearly at the limits of his patience. He unsheathed his sword and pressed it against Octavio's neck. Frightened, Octavio grinned at his forehead on the ground as a sign of remorse until he bled, and he apologized profusely. With tears and mucus streaming down his face, his figure as he begged Barbara for sympathy wasn't very much like a general's. Your Excellency Barbara. We do not have the luxury to concern ourselves with this idiot right now. I believe we should save dealing with him after this is over. The morale of the soldiers, which are already low enough, will drop even lower. Advised the returned LaRousse. Even as a joke, he hadn't ever heard of judging a man entrusted with an entire division during a battle. Their precious time was being 51 wasted even now like this. In the first place, just who was the person who appointed this fool to division commander and gave him an entire wing? After glancing at Octavio, LaRouse gave Barbara a cold look. Military policeman, restrain this buffoon dash. I'll lop off that filthy head another day. Why, your excellency, pardon me. Please, have mercy. Your excellency, Barbara. Silence dash. Policeman, hurry up and take him away. I can't bear the sight of him. Sir dash. The policeman grabbed Octavio's hair and left the headquarters. His crying voice faded into the distance. The place fell into silence, and Barbara adjusted his loud breathing. He could hear the sounds of explosions in distance every so often. Major General LaRouse. How's the situation? The battle is on the brink of being the worst case scenario. There are already strong indicators of defeat. It probably would not take even an hour until the entire army is rooted. Will we fight until the end, or will we escape? I would like instructions from you, the Army Corps Commander. Where, where, where did it all go amiss? Shit dash. Why dash? Didn't we have the overwhelming advantage until just a while ago? Barbara derangedly mangled his pavilion with his sword. While expressionlessly observing him, LaRouse stated his opinion. We can still maintain semblance of an army. Yalder's flag can be seen from Karna's plateau. A withdrawal is possible right now, and we could probably minimize the damages. Your Excellency, your prompt decision. 51 Why, you're asking me to run away? The kingdom's fate hangs in the balance of this battle. Do you understand that? If we, retreat, we no longer dash being defeated in this battle, meant losing their hegemony of the Canaan area. 
the taking of the city of Canaan and Roshanic stronghold would be forced down their throat. Those places would be helpless in enemy territory. If they lost control of Canaan, the gates to the royal capital would be opened, and all the feudal lords that had stubbornly stayed on the fence would all go join the Liberation Army. And if that happened, it was over. There is no longer anything we can do. Will you have everyone die here? Or retreat, rally our forces, and attempt to come back somehow? Your Excellency Barbara. You must decide. This is your final duty as an Army Corps commander. Tisk. Barbara couldn't do it. If he wanted to chose a proud death, he ought to bravely fight to the death here. But, the lives of several tens of thousands of men were in Barbara's hands. As a commander, wasn't it the right choice to save even one more soldier? His pride as a warrior, or his duty as the highest commander. Barbara anguished, caught between the two. He couldn't answer. If you will not do anything, I would like you to let me return to my unit. I want to die together with my subordinates if I am going to die. Sorry, but I do not have any interest in staying with you until our final moments. Cold-heartedly declared LaRue as he turned on his heels, but Barbara detained him in distress. I, I understand. We'll retreat. Order the entire army to retreat. We cannot be wholly annihilated here dash. 51 understood. I will notify the entire army. I will also send a messenger to General Yalder on Karnas. Excuse me then. LaRue saluted and began preparations for the retreat. Barbara covered his face with both hands and crumbled down on the spot. For this man who took command of the first army after Sharav died, this was his first, but greatest failure, and it crushed him. At the same time, Karnas Plateau, high ground encampment. One could witness all too clearly the sorry state of the kingdom's army from the high ground. Yalder and Sidamo had troubled expressions. As for Skira, she finally was able to have a satisfying meal and was cheerful. She got hungry after being active. Today's lunch was cologne beef jerky taken from the enemy camp. She didn't know why they had such an expensive item, but who cared, and Skira chewed well and savored the delicious meat. The more she chewed, the more the taste came out, the taste of high-grade cologne beef. A cavalryman next to her was humming. Skira drank water from a bamboo flask, put the meat between two slices of bread, and bit down. If this meat was fresh and eaten just slightly grilled, it would probably be supremely delicious. But, she couldn't be spoiled. It was happiness just being able to eat. Sidamo. I think we ought to descend the plateau and immediately retreat. We would die in vain trying to attack the enemy lines right now. Yalder cast aside any wishful thinking and calmly surveyed the situation. If he were a commander on the front lines, he would have charged in even if he had to do it alone. This battle's significance was just that immense. He far from intended on shamelessly surviving after being defeated. 51 But, as a division commander right now, he had to take the soldiers home to the royal capital, while keeping sacrifices to a minimum somehow, for the royal capital's defense. I am of the same opinion. The soldiers have expended all their energy to take this plateau and are exhausted. Regrettably, we would probably be annihilated before reaching the enemy lines. Even fighting on willpower has its limits. In that case, we ought to immediately change course and head to Canaan. We can still repel pursuits. This situation, has happened before. Sidamo, at the same time we withdraw, send scouts to Canaan and Roshanik. Have them verify that the flag of the kingdom's army is being flown. When Yalder was defeated trying to capture Salvador, Antigua fell during his retreat. This situation resembled that. Nay, this situation was probably even worse. It wouldn't be strange for the enemy to have already reached them. Have they already fallen, or have they dash? If we tell them of our defeat, what those guys on the fence will do is evident. We must avoid being pincered. For now, we evacuate. Before we're surrounded. Colonel Skira. We'll be changing course. Your unit will stand as the vanguard, and we'll head towards Canaan. Use your mobility and throw the enemy into chaos. Make them know the terror of death. Sidamo shouted his instructions in an angry voice rare for him. Suddenly receiving a directive, Skira choked a couple times, and then saluted. The dried meat had caught in her throat. Understood. I leave all decisions to your judgment. 51, Colonel, don't die in a place like this, let's, meet again. Yalder patted Skira's shoulder and left to command his soldiers. Seeing Sidamo chasing after him at a quick pace, Skira spoke up to Katarina. We've gone through so much securing this place, yet it seems like it was a waste of effort. Just why did we fight I wonder? Conrad's death, and the many deaths of her important comrades. 
The remaining forces of her cavalry were probably around 1,500. All their sacrifices to take control of the high ground amounted to raising a flag and everyone shouting. Colonel. So be it. When we return, I'll kill that pig Octavio. In a way he'll really feel it, and never forget. Sir Dash. Also, I won't forgive you for moving my cavalry without my permission a second time. Engrave this upon your heart. Skira glared at Katarina through narrowed eyes. Katarina lowered her head in shame as she touched her glasses with trembling hands. S, sir. You understood. Please, forgive me, Colonel. I don't want to be saved if it means abandoning my subordinates. After all, I would rather be with you all, my comrades who I've eaten together with for so long. You need to include me too, and I won't ever allow you to leave me out. 51 with a faint smile, Skira affectionately tapped Katarina's shoulder. See Colonel. All right, let's go. It won't do if we're not the vanguard. Skira's cavalry will descend Karna's plateau, and change course for Kanan Dash. We'll trample anyone who dares get in our way. Understood Dash. Skira's cavalry, move out. Yalder's legion and Skira's cavalry gave up Karna's plateau and withdrew, aiming for Kanan. While repelling the pursuit units, they had a splendidly successful retreat. There were hardly any casualties, but that was ultimately because the Liberation Army soldiers, upon seeing Skira, had gotten cold feet. Skira was feared to that degree. On the other hand, the remaining soldiers of Barbara, Larus, Octavio, and Bourbon were relentlessly pursued by the Liberation Army, and they received heavy losses. All will to fight gone, people kept surrendering or deserting, bringing about a state which could only be described as a scene after a disaster. The city of Canaan, hearing about their defeat, acted on a secret agreement made previously and changed affiliations to the Liberation Army. They postured to repel the retreating army of the kingdom. Obviously the feudal lords would protect themselves. They immediately persuaded the guards, and as a result of giving speeches to the populace, there was no one in opposition, and the city of Canaan fell into the Liberation Army's hands. Opinions in Roshanic's stronghold were split. Should they continue in their loyalty to the kingdom, or should they surrender to the Liberation Army? In the end, a fight to the death broke out, and when the gates were thrown open by the advocates of capitulating, the Liberation Army surged in, and the stronghold fell, the resistance of the guards in vain. 51 Having lost the critical position that was the Canaan area, the kingdom's army continued to take flight and headed for the royal capital. The soldiers that had numbered 150,000 before the battle had now already diminished to 40,000. Only 20,000 had died in the pursuit, but the number of deserters was unerred in Ari. Yalder, who had volunteered to be the rearguard, stretched out a formation across the thin road connecting Canaan to the royal capital and resolutely resisted. They smashed a unit of the Liberation Army that was impatient for success, and he displayed such command that he rooted them. Ha 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 dash, that's not nearly enough to surpass I, Yalder. Come at me with at least 100,000. Like I'll easily be killed by you rebel army youngsters. Sidemo, raise it dash. Let them know that Yalder is here. Sir dash. At the signal, Sidemo hoisted the flags of the ruined 3rd and 4th Army Corps. They were symbols of Yalder's glory, and his failings, but they were also his pride for having fought and survived with his soldiers. The blood smeared, mud-caked flags caught the wind and sailed, like showing themselves to the Liberation Army. As long as I'm here, the kingdom will not perish. To the bitter, absolute end, I will fight. Ha 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 dash. Sidemo, sorry, but you'll be accompanying me to the end. If you must resent, resent your own bad luck dash. I've prepared myself for that way ahead of you. I as well must beg your excellency's forgiveness, but I will be interrupting you a bit. Send the signal to the scouts dash. When Sidemo gave his order, his soldiers turned to the cliffs and waved red flags. Conspicuously, they used their whole bodies to wave them. A short second later, sounds of an explosion roared from the cliffs on both sides. And a few seconds later, a landslide of boulders sealed the narrow road. 51 The Liberation Army spread out in the front hectically began backpedaling, else they'd likely be caught in the avalanche. They hadn't known this area's geography in detail. Having researched the topography beforehand, Sidemo, assuming the worst, had prepared a plan to impede them, a plan to stop them on their final steps, in the very worst, worst-case scenario. Nice going staff officer. But, this means that you were resigned to losing. I'll have you court-martialed dash. Said Yalder at an attempt at humor, and Sidemo feigned ignorance with an innocent face. It is difficult to ascertain what you mean. Anyway, with this, 
we have bought a short amount of time. Let us garrison Cyrus and Saya and ready ourselves. All right, then we move out. This is not a retreat. Don't forget that this is just changing course. Ha ha ha, I'm absolutely not making excuses. This is empty bravado. Move out. We're to move out before the enemy readies themselves. Yo Saitamo, hearty as usual. What a reliable man. All right everyone and all you staff officers, follow his example and stick your chests out. We are the elite unit that took down Karna's plateau. We march, I intend on making a triumphant return. Heroically laughing Yalder swept up his formation and marched. He knew that the situation would become unsalvageable soon, but as a man of military, he would fight until his end. He had resolved himself a long time ago. From that day his suicide was stopped. Barbara, Bourbon, and the restrained Octavio entered into the royal capital. Octavio was house-confined until the investigation was over. Five Yalder's legion entered Saya Fortress, and Larusa's division and Skira's cavalry garrisoned Cyrus. They had to buy time in these two fortresses until the first army could finish their reorganization. They tried raising supplies from the surrounding cities, but the feudal lords refused them. Their defeat was widely talked about due to Diener's workings, and the feudal lords had the strong impression that the kingdom was already finished. Unable to prepare sufficient supplies in both fortresses, Cyrus, and Saya, it seemed likely that a siege was heading their way. On their separation, Yalder had strongly taken Skira's hands and spoken to her with a mischievous feeling smile, a smile wicked like a brigand's wrinkled his face. Colonel Skira. Let's meet again at the royal capital. When we repel the rebel army, come to my estate like I promised a few days ago. I'll prepare a huge feast to your pleasure. Look forward to it. Acknowledged, Your Excellency. I will visit without fail. Saitamo, you say something too. We won't be able to meet for a while. I only have one thing to tell you, Colonel. I said this before, but if you are going to die, die outside. It takes money and hard work to raise cavalry. Dying inside a castle is nothing but wasteful. Do you understand? Colonel Skira, completely understands. Then good, let's meet again. My god, you guys have no sense of glamour. Well, it's probably good that you stay true to yourselves. Wahahaha dash. Remembering their conversation, Skira was resting in one of the rooms in Cyrus. Skira was slightly tired. 52 her body was wrapped round and round in bandages. Her arrow wounds hadn't yet healed. It wouldn't be a problem on the battlefield, but her body was slightly feverish. So she could recover before the next battle, she had secluded herself in her room like this. When she reclined on the bed face up only in her undergarments, a grand knocking came at her door. Colonel, excuse me for interrupting your rest. What is it? Languidly replied Skira. Sir Dash, there is an urgent matter that must be conveyed to you Colonel, and I have come to report. What is it, I wonder? I'm changing right now, so will you tell me while I'm at it? Skira received the most crucial piece of information from the cavalry soldier. Sprouts of the colonel's potatoes have come out. Potato sprouts. A mass of seed potatoes appeared in the hot, hazy depths of her mind. Sprouts shot up from the seeds one after the other, and collectively became stalks as tall as trees. The stomach wouldn't be filled by potato sprouts or stalks, but when they grew that big, it honestly seemed like a substantial meal. The potatoes that the colonel planted. They seemed to be growing well, and sprouts have come out. 52 Hearing that, the giant potato sprouts in her imagination vanished somewhere. I'll come immediately, stand by at the field. Skira jumped off the bed, just so that she could say it faster, and replied loudly. Whether the potatoes would remain safe was extremely important. She had to deliberately check. This wasn't the time to be lying down. Understood. I will do my best to not let the crows devastate them. From behind the door, the footsteps of the soldier enthusiastically leaving could be heard. Skira stood up, opened the window, and looked up at the sky, the blue sky, with not a single cloud. Blowing against the wind swayed the kingdom's flag and the flag of Skira's cavalry. Around them, crows were circling. Was it perhaps because they had no food and were searching for some? There were no breadcrumbs left over there though. Skira closed the window. The crows looked over her, as if demanding food. After everything, I'm back here. I wonder, if my final home is this fortress. It would be nice if I could eat my own grown potatoes. 52 Skira's home, Cyrus Fortress, was already preparing for battle. Defense Commander LaRouze was endeavoring to raise supplies until the time came, and was also striving to fortify the ramparts. He prepared for enemy trench warfare, laid out many traps, 
and deepened the outer moat. Larus did everything he could. After the Liberation Army gained total control of Canaan, they would sortie in no time and head for both Cyrus and Saya. The battle would begin extremely soon probably. There's many things left to do, so we have to keep doing our best, just a bit more. It's not over yet. Right, wouldn't you say? Just a little bit more, let's do our best. Only for a moment, Skira looked over her shoulder and smiled, then she turned back and began walking. But there was no one behind her. 52. The kingdom's army has been defeated at Bertusburg Plains, Canaan has fallen, and the Liberation Army is beginning to march towards the royal capital. The sensational news was advertised everywhere by the Liberation Army, and it had even reached up to Madros in the kingdom's northern region. Leader of the Fifth Army, Kerry, urgently assembled the military and staff officers to discuss about their policy hereafter. Everyone's faces were gloomy, and they couldn't conceal their unease. With his arms crossed, Kerry's eyes were shut in his seat. Your Excellency. Now that Canaan has been lost and the first army that was the bulk of the kingdom's forces was devastated, the kingdom's fate is in a precarious situation. You must decide. Said a staff officer, resolved. Resolved, for something everyone understood, to abandon the kingdom and side with the rebel army. This was the only road that would ensure Madrosa's survival. So it ultimately comes to this, old man. That isn't the case right? Yalder and his group risked their lives and fought to save Madros. Isn't it our turn now to save them? Kerry's second son, Captain Darris Madros, slapped the round table and stood up. He normally wouldn't have been permitted to participate in the war council based on rank, but he was attending as Kerry's son. Either way, he would one day aid his older brother and protect Madros. He needed to accumulate experience. 52 The eldest brother, Denim Madros, was taking command at the front line forts. If he were to die by chance, Darius was obligated to succeed after him. That was the destiny of those born into the Madros family. Sir Darius. What you say certainly stands to reason. As a warrior, that is correct. But, you fail as a politician. Admonished the staff officer in charge of Darius's education. What failure? To even throw away our pride, why must we join the rebel army dash? What justice do they have? They aimlessly spread the fires of war just who is the one tormenting the people. Then tell me, Darius, what concrete plan do you have? If you have one, let's hear it. You don't need to hold back, tell us your great idea to save the kingdom while protecting Madros. Right now. There's not much time left. Pressed Kerry in a composed tone. Darius hesitated. There could be no such convenient plan. In order to buy time, send out the troops. Even a little is fine. Support the first army until they can rally themselves and fight back. There's significance in the fifth army showing themselves, we can show them that we won't abandon them. Our fifth army is occupied keeping the empire at bay. We cannot deal with a threat from behind us. If you plan to save the kingdom, you must also forsake Madros, and such an act is impossible for me. My mission is to protect the lands and people of Madros. I don't even have to think about it dash you would throw away your honor and pride for that. Exactly. Whether it be honor, whether it be pride, do you think you can survive with such crap like that? Every man on this earth if shown an opening are beasts who would steal for their own profit. Even if I have to drink mud, eat bugs, and cover myself fifty-two in filth, I will protect Madros. At the very least, I've seen the Liberation Army's tactician. That man plans on using us. We probably won't be treated poorly. Shit dash Darius kicked away his chair and went to leave. He too saw himself as a man of the Madros family. But, was it really okay to take it this far? Hadn't Yalder saved them from the Empire's invasion? And hadn't Skira braved the danger, stepped into the heart of the enemy, and saved Madros? In their predicament, why did they have to turn their backs on and point their blades towards their benefactors? The young Darius couldn't agree. Well, whether you agree or not, my decision won't change. If you don't like it, then go to the royal capital yourself. I won't stop you. The Fifth Army will capitulate to the Liberation Army, however, on the condition that we won't participate in the attack on the Royal Capital. Oh I'll do so, you piece of shit old man dash. I'm different from you and my elder brother, I'm just a fool. Do as you like. But, don't call yourself by the surname of Madros. Not just me, you'll trouble everyone living in Madros. You'll live as simply Darius, and you'll die as simply Darius. You're disinherited. Don't show yourself before me again. Ha, huh, you don't have to tell me, you rotten shits. I'll show you my spirit dash. 
he kicked open the door and went outside with squared shoulders. Carrie sent a signal with his eyes, and a senior bodyguard followed after him. Perhaps this could be called a final sign of parental love. Now that the idiot has left, let's restart the discussion. Immediately go and greet the Princess of the Liberation Army. Tell her we'll release the prisoners. Take the fastest horse. The faster we go, the better the impression we'll make. 52 Sir Dash. But, tell her that we cannot participate in sieging the royal capital. We won't surrender that far. If she says no, threaten her that we'll fight against her. If this area becomes Empire Dominion, that'll also be to their detriment. There's no need for us to excessively depreciate ourselves. If they sent soldiers to the royal capital and Madros became undermanned, the Imperial Army would once again draw close. The Liberation Army wouldn't want this area to be occupied by the Empire either probably. Understood. This discussion is over. Everyone return to your duties dash. Proclaimed Kerry, and the military and civil officials saluted and stood up to leave. Kerry stared at the ceiling with a weary face, still seated. God, I didn't think they'd lose. If you'd won at Canaan, Yalder, we'd be able to see each other again. You really do have rotten luck, while he clicked his tongue, the face of that idiotic and heroic warrior floated in his mind. I must protect Madros. Just like you have your unyielding pride, I have Madros. I cannot have the people suffer for my selfishness. Yalder, sorry, but I cannot come aid you. If only, I were a bit younger. 52 Kerry suppressed his own desires and endured. The Liberation Army had the momentum. He couldn't gamble now of all times. Yalder would fight until the end, and then he would probably die. That man was that kind of human. With his pride as a warrior in his chest, he would sacrifice himself for the kingdom. For the sake of Madros, Kerry had resigned himself to letting his comrades and friends die. Tactician Diener of the Liberation Army went to the neutral city of Arte for a conference. A vacant house on the outskirts with no signs of life. Disguised operatives fortified the surroundings. Why they had chosen a place all the way out here, was because both parties were in positions where they had to conceal themselves. Next to Diener was Vander under his direct control. He had been promoted to major for his deeds at the previous battle. This young man who was walking well on the road to success could also probably be called Diener's right-hand man. Knowledge, connections, the art of spy work, and also strategy and tactics were driven into him, and he was trained so he could work as Diener's assistant. Answering the expectations placed on him, Vander achieved splendid results. It seems they have arrived. I see. Don't be discourteous. Our company is a man of a different standing than us. Muttered Diener with a sarcastic feeling. A person appeared from the back door wearing a black hood, his body covered. The person's name was Farzam, the Prime Minister of the Kingdom. So he could conduct negotiations with the Liberation Army who should have been his sworn enemy, he had directly visited this place. He had made a trip under the pretense of observing the front lines of the kingdom. Several people in black clothes stood behind Farzam. They were an intelligence unit of the Prime Minister's protégés, and disposable pieces. 52, Prime Minister of the Kingdom, Sir Farzam, or am I mistaken? You're correct. I am Prime Minister Farzam. And would it be appropriate to take you as Sir Diener? Indeed no doubt. What are you standing around for, please sit. Though, I cannot provide any hospitality in this kind of place. Invited Diener, and Farzam took his seat vigilantly. If he snapped his fingers, that would be instructions to immediately cut Diener down. Sensing the hostility, Vander put his hand on his sword's grip and got ready for battle. There were soldiers concealed above the ceiling. This situation would obviously happen since they were mutual enemies. By the way, is Princess Altura in good health? I never would have thought I'd hear those words out of your mouth, Sir Prime Minister. Was it not you who entrapped that lady's father and drove him to death? Asked Diener in an amazed tone at Farzam's shameless remark. The Prime Minister without at all any display of agitation exaggeratedly denied the claim, making a hurt expression. What an unhappy misunderstanding. I did nothing more than investigate into a likelihood. The one who doubted that person and exiled him was the late king. I did nothing. It hurts me that you've misunderstood. Fufu, as expected of Sir Prime Minister of the Kingdom, your tongue is quite glib. How many people have you driven to death with that skillful speech? I only faithfully perform my own duties. Never would I harbor treachery. I swear upon the stars. There exists no human as upright and clean-handed as me. Five smoothly and fluently turned his tongue. How dare you prattle on like that, Diener was about to burst out, 
but he resisted. Entertaining monkey shows were needed even in a place like this, and he had to have the monkey dance for him as much as possible. Diener advanced the conversation. Well, let's leave it at that. Our greetings have deepened our friendship to this extent, so now let's move on to the main question. It seems Sir Tactician of the Liberation Army is busy. How different it is for those with momentum behind them, as I would expect. Haha, <laughs> it is all thanks to you. My work is piling up like mountains, because the guys who ought to have done it originally hadn't you know. I don't even have time to sleep. It's so troubling. While releasing killing intent, they both bared their teeth at each other. This was duel of words. Let's not beat around the bush. There's no need for excessive tedious talk. We of the The Yus Kingdom would like to propose peace talks with the Royal Capital Liberation Army. Oh. His Majesty Kristoff wishes to hand over the throne to Princess Altura after an interim period of half a year. Afterwards, he would like to be promised a retirement in the north. His Majesty does not wish for any more useless fighting. Farzam held out a letter with the king's seal on it. Of course, it was a forgery. There was no way Kristoff would accept such a plan. But, Farzam intended seeing this through. He could save the king's life and could also retain some political power. It was possible for him to take back his authority if he waited for an chance to. If he were the one doing it, it was possible. Farzam had 53 confidence in himself. He couldn't handle a spear, but he had made it to the top with his brains and speech. Hmm. But, I could not possibly accept this. We already have our hands on the royal capital. There is no need for us to give you an extension of half a year after all this. What you can do, is promptly give us your unconditional surrender. That's about it. Obediently surrender the royal capital and take your judgment like a man, how about it? Diener threw away the letter. He mustn't show weakness in negotiations. Furthermore, the Liberation Army was in an overwhelmingly advantageous position. There wasn't any reason to accept such a foolish policy. In that case, why had Diener come to this meaningless negotiation table? I see. Certainly, your opinion is reasonable. But, if you don't accept this proposal, we will resist in the royal capital to the last man. The people's blood will flow, the royal capital will be destroyed, and who would like that outcome? Think about this carefully. Indeed. The problem was the royal capital. It was their target of liberation, they couldn't destroy it. The royal capital becoming a place for a decisive battle would also make bringing in siege warfare a terrible idea. They couldn't purposefully destroy the kingdom's greatest metropolis city that would later become their dwelling. Moreover, they wouldn't be able to avoid causing casualties among the royal capital's populace. It would be terrible if the people's resentment turned towards the Liberation Army. For the Righteous Liberation Army, they currently couldn't allow any injury to befall the innocent people. If they affected the current reign, the ones standing to gain would probably be the Empire and the Union. Especially the Empire, who would be wholeheartedly delighted surmising the chance to create a puppet regime. Under the name of assistance, they would possibly deploy soldiers to Royal Capital Blanca. 53 you've struck where it hurts. This humble diener has misread Sir Prime Minister. I apologize for my impoliteness. What, I also care for the citizens of the kingdom. This humble Farzam would give away his life for the kingdom. Farzam had a seedy smile. I thank Sir Prime Minister for his kindness. Then, shall we compromise? Those are the words I wished to hear the most. By all means, please allow me to hear your proposal. In response to him, Diener proposed a matter Farzam hadn't expected. We, plan on capturing Cyrus and Saya afterwards. During that time, I would like Sir Prime Minister to keep a tight grip on the military and civil officials, and arrange to open the gates as soon as we arrive at the royal capital. I can't understand the meaning of what you're saying, just what do you mean? We should have be discussing about peace. For me to do such an extreme act of disloyalty, why Dash Farzam was bewildered, not understanding at all. Diener shrugged, and spun his tail indifferently to persuade him. It's a simple matter. I want Sir Prime Minister to become a patriot hero. If you perform a bloodless surrender to save the royal capital's people, everyone would praise you, Sir Prime Minister. And, if you persuade the king and he abdicates, your fame would be limitless no doubt about it. For such an esteemed person, we would have to prepare a corresponding rank. 53, though he was masking it with pretty words, behind them importantly lay a demand for betrayal. He was saying to freeze the military while they were attacking the fortresses, to make the king abdicate, and to hurry up and surrender the royal capital. Change sides, and I will prepare for you suitable rank and fame, Diener was saying. 
Princess Alchera who will succeed the throne and her fiancé Prince Alan will one day produce a prince. He will be a star of hope, burdened with the next era of the kingdom. His guardian, will be you, Sir Farzam. I request of you. You, who unites both good and evil, would surely be able to guide him. Diener took out a letter with Alchura's seal on it. It was all empty promises now, but this article had value that would one day bear fruit. And you have proof that you'll soundly keep that promise. First of all, we've prepared the money to cover everything. Use it by all means, and work to avoid any feudal bloodshed. Also, please take this. Vander opened a stuffed wooden box, and it was packed with an enormous quantity of gold coins. Money for the plan. Diener offered it to the Prime Minister. And one more thing. An item which could be called his trump card. Carefully packaged, it was, T this is Dash. Yes. One of the holy relics handed down the royal family, the mirror that only members of the Unicaf lineage are allowed to hold. I dedicate this as a substitute for proof. I think you understand that Princess Alchura is of the same intention. 53 There were two holy relics of the Yuz Kingdom. The sword in possession of Kristoff's Unimat family, and the other was the mirror of Alchura's Unicaf family. Their value couldn't be put in terms of gold, and they were practically national treasures. The air left Farzam's lungs. It wasn't a counterfeit. He could tell just by looking at the etched characters. Farzam was a man who had come into contact with many high-class items and was experienced in appraisal. I do understand. I will exhaust my body and endeavor to avoid useless fighting. For the sake of the people. For the people, those words didn't match him at all. For his own gain, how many thousands, how many tens of thousands of peasants had been killed by him. Vander was hard pressed to hold back his desire to kill. If he relaxed, it seemed like he would cut him down. I am in awe, Prime Minister. What magnanimous judgment. However, the instant troops from the royal capital reinforce the fortresses, this conversation would be as if it never happened. Please, I beg of you to understand. I know. But, it will take a month at the very least. Naturally I'm aware. We will be making a, very slow, attack. Please take your time to persuade everyone. Negotiations ended. Farzam would abandon the fortresses for his own protection. He had no intention whatsoever of committing a double suicide with that fool Kristoff. If he could settle into the role of a guardian, there would be many chances to restore himself. Deciding to forsake the current kingdom, Farzam would exert his skill and contrive to take hold over the military and civil officials. This was something he was doing even now, and it would be extraordinarily easy. 53 Farzam left the private house behind. In it were Diener and Vander, who looked like he couldn't agree. Sir Diener. Why would you make such a promise? Not only that, to even present the princess's heirloom, the mirror. It's just a mirror. We can make as many as we want later. If we can obtain the royal capital with just gold and a drab mirror, I would call that phenomenal. Not a bad transaction. Nevertheless, you would be employing a parasite. That man is a fiend, the root cause behind the country's ruin. Vander, do you really think I'd pardon such a man? A brute even more foolish than that dog? I'll have that thing act as a clown until the kingdom collapses. He'll surely dance madly for us. And then, in the end Deshdiener gestured, cutting his own throat with his finger. Vander reflexively shuddered. Diener intended on putting all the onus on King Kristoff and Prime Minister Farzam. And then, he would kill them before they could say anything out of place. He would probably assassinate them after they had expended their use. It was like the noose was already around their necks, just the people in question didn't notice. You're a fearsome man. Vander, you've become one too. One man dirted, ten killed, and thousands saved that is the best course of action. There's no need to waver. We ought to take the initiative. They would rebuild the kingdom and save many thousands of people. For that sake, they would sacrifice many. What was bad about that? While saving the country, Diener would carry out his own revenge. He himself had formerly been disposed of. He wanted them to taste hell. 53 Diener smiled inwardly. He had taken the alias Diener, stood as the Liberation Army's tactician, and led them to victory. Using his connections in the intelligence unit he was formerly a part of, he tore apart Farzam's information network and took control. The Prime Minister had abused them until they died, never giving his agents the carrot. There was no one who swore allegiance to the Prime Minister, and it had been simple to break them apart. It starts now. It all starts now. Vander, we go together. We'll perform a clean sweep and build a new age for the kingdom. We will be the cornerstones, 
We must show them the way. Sir Dash, please use my power as you see fit. Diener stood up, but he stopped moving. He remembered a discomforting worry. I just remembered. Where has the rumored death god run off to? Sir Dash, according to reports from scouts, she headed for Cyrus Fortress. I see. I owe a debt to that thing from Belta. I'll make her know the severity of her committed sins. With a cruel smile on his face, he thought of the execution for the death god. As soon as we return, send the soldiers to Cyrus and Saya. Send a messenger and offer a full report to Princess Altura. Saya Fortress will fall through force. As for Cyrus Fortress, Diener stopped his words there, and headed out of the house. Vander, confused, chased after him. The feeble-minded king, the clown prime minister, and the little girl who didn't know her place. He would kill all of them. Diener would see to it that all who hindered the liberation army he had built and poured his lifeblood into would die. 53 He couldn't hold back his smile, and he covered his lips with his hand. Glory was approaching before his very eyes. It was so close that he could reach it if he extended a hand. Cyrus Fortress, Mess Room. The soldiers who were preparing for battle, after completing Stage 1, were resting. Katarina was in a corner of the noisy cafeteria, brush in hand, for the purpose of a daily routine. This was a job she had undertaken on a whim, and it had stuck with her ever since. Her feelings, her thoughts, fun things, sad thing, she wrote all of them down. She heard people called this a diary, but Katarina didn't think so. She was carving proof of her existence. Katarina didn't fear death, but she was terrified of being forgotten. Hence, she was etching her existence in this white-paged book. After she died, someone would see this, and know that there was once a person known as Katarina. The instant she thought of that someone, Katarina's face scrunched. She couldn't control her emotions swirling with love and hate. She pushed up her glasses and endured that overflowing something. The necromancer who had called her back to this hell, her stepsister, and her innocent-looking stepmother, who at the same time was her father's killer, had raised her those two were special for Katarina. They were targets she ought to resent, and also humans she ought to thank. And then, the final one she thought of, the one who had become a greater existence than those two, was her lord, Skira, who she ought to serve. Of course, she had no resentment towards Skira. She was strongly captivated by Skira's almost severe way of life, and nothing more. And if Skira were to die, it would be nice if she could be by Skira's side. She not only wanted to witness her way of life, but also her manner of death. Revered as a hero, feared as death, how would Skira meet her final moments? Was she meant for having such thoughts? She exhaled, sighing, and looked up, and there was Skira peering at her, seemingly deeply interested. 53 Katarina involuntarily jumped up. She hadn't felt a presence at all. See, see, Colonel. Do you have a habit of shivering in the cafeteria? Or is that a ritual before meals I wonder? How interesting. T, that's not it. This is, that is, I don't really mind. What you decide to do before eating is up to you. So, what actually are you doing? S, sir. I was, writing, this, diary. It wasn't a diary, but when she went to explain, she couldn't respond in any other way besides that it was a diary. Katarina hid the book so it wouldn't stand out. If Skira asked to see the contents, that would be bad in all sorts of ways. She touched her glasses, trying to deceive her. But, Skira didn't pursue it further. I see. I'm, pretty bad writing diaries. It seems hard, and also dash, and also. Katarina prompted Skira, who rarely decided to talk about herself. I don't like thinking about the past. Same with the future. I decided to think only about the present. Or perhaps I can only think about the present I wonder. That's why I'm bad with diaries. 53 answered Skira while eating beans belonging to the deceased Conrad. Her expression was aloof from the world, and Katarina couldn't get a read on her emotions. Colonel, that dash, Katarina searched for the following words. She didn't know what she should say. Well then, I'll be at the field. Contact me if something happens. UND understood. Interrupting Katarina's salute, Skira lightly waved her hand and departed from the dining hall. Though they had come this far fighting together, Katarina barely understood Skira. She didn't know why Skira fought this far. She herself said that it was to eat and for revenge. Then, why did she become so strong? What spurred Skira on to such lengths? It seemed she wouldn't be told even if she asked, but Katarina wanted to know one day, she thought. They're growing day by day. I won't ever tire of just looking at them, 
and if I diligently take care of them, flowers will bloom I'm told. Ah, I'm really looking forward to it. Just what kind of flowers would bloom? Small, white flowers she had heard, but was that true? While watering them, Skira was taking care of the potatoes in a good mood. Five her fever hadn't gone down from that day for some reason. Her nausea wouldn't lessen. It was like something was trying to break free from the core of her body. That's what it felt like. And, the greatest problem was that her appetite wasn't very good, though she felt her stomach empty. Despite being able to satiate herself with well water and Conrad's beans, her loss of appetite was a big problem. She tried racking her brain, but since she couldn't think of anything good in particular, she decided to let it resolve itself. She couldn't do anything about it anyway. Also, she was busy with various things. Visiting the stables, watching the soldiers, gazing at the field, Skira greatly enjoyed her life in Cyrus Fortress, her home. 54 While the Liberation Army's predominance strengthened day by day, a large-scale reorganization was going on in royal capital Blanca. Cutting to the chase, it started with Barbara, who had suffered defeat at the Battle of Bertusburg and lost cannon. The personnel reassignments were criticized for throwing the military into disorder, but Farzam firmly stifled the opposition. Since it proved difficult to placate Barbara, who called for a final, all in resistance, just throw him away, Farzam decided. Bourbon, who had put up a good fight at the previous battle, was inaugurated as the commandant of the First Army as Barbara's successor. This man who couldn't make decisions on his own was an ideal figurehead. Also, Octavio, who was in the middle of his trial for war crimes, was freed from house confinement and recklessly instated as his assistant. He was informed of Farzam's intentions and well understood his own purpose, his role was to observe Bourbon and make sure he never made an offensive. The dissenters like Barbara were reorganized into positions with no real power, and the weakening of the military proceeded favorably at Farzam's hands. The urgent requests for reinforcements from Cyrus and Saya were dismissed, the defense of the royal capital was strengthened, and no soldiers were sent out, under the pretense of reorganization. The season was early summer. Exactly a year had passed since the Liberation Army made an uprising at Salvador Fortress. Altura began the final step to liberate the royal capital, the capture of Cyrus and Saya. 54 Diener and FYNN were given 50,000 to capture Cyrus Fortress, and 70,000 lead by Biraus were mobilized to capture Saya. The Liberation Army broke through Canaan's Road without any difficulties, and they advanced while taking over the surrounding cities. The garrison stationed in castles surrendered without a fight and in truth they joined the Liberation Army. While showered by cheers from the people, the officers, and men of the Liberation Army flooded into the royal capital area. Without anything that could even be called resistance, the Liberation Army successfully surrounded completely both fortresses. A request for surrender reached General Yalder defending Saya with 10,000 soldiers via a letter tied to an arrow. Dash I guarantee the lives of the garrison if you surrender. Immediately open the gates and throw down your swords. Exasperated, Yalder had rejected it. Negotiations for surrender broke down before they had even begun. From the next day onwards, the Liberation Army of 70,000 began the siege. Yalder ascended the ramparts and took command on the front lines. Preserving morale was more important than anything else in a siege. Don't let the towers approach. Pour oil on those guys sticking to the gates and shoot them with fire arrows. Sir Dash. Saya is a mighty fortress. Show them that we can defend even if they send 100,000. The approaching siege towers were vehemently pelted by projectiles from catapults installed on the castle walls and destroyed, and those attempting to break down the gates with a battering ram were doused with boiling oil. In the mountainous area of Saya, the Liberation Army's catapults were hindered. 54 archers aim dash. Target, the enemy battering ram at the main gate. Fire dash. Die dash. The Liberation Army soldiers, bearing shields, could withstand attacks from atop the ramparts, but they couldn't deal with the fire. Poor soldiers fired upon by fire arrows writhed like mad and became corpses in front of the castle gates. Sidemo in charge of defense in the back was preparing for the enemy's tunnel warfare. The soil on their north side was weak, and it was the most suitable area to dig under the castle walls. He predicted their route beforehand and constructed water-filled moats there in advance, ready to hinder the enemy's excavation with them. The instant the enemies dug through, the water would rush onto them, and the soldiers wouldn't be able to do anything except drown inside the tunnels the enemy will definitely plot a surprise attack. The concentrated attack on the front gate is to deceive our eyes. Their real target is our rear. Sidemo himself had also joined in the digging work, constructing moats together with the soldiers. 
his moats would bear fruit three days later. As Sidamo had surmised, the Liberation Army dug forth their tunnels, and he succeeded in making them sacrifice a great many of their engineers. Yo Sidamo. At this rate, if reinforcements from the royal capital arrive, we'll prevail in defending Saya. The morale of the Sodders is also high. Sir Dash. The soldiers are doing well. As of now, the siege force have not gotten close at all. 54 like Yalder had said, the morale of the Saya defense garrison was high. Before cooping themselves in the castle, Yalder had told only those who had the resolve to stay. The soldiers remaining were the defeated soldiers of the 3rd and 4th armies, as well as those who had many chances to leave. Despite all that, they chose to fight to the end with Yalder. Saya was a fortress carefully planned to be held by 10,000 men, and around it was a region of steep mountains. This was an advantageous position for the defending side. Barbara will probably finish reorganizing the army corps soon. While they conduct this attack, they'll have to start being vigilant for an attack from the royal capital. Then it'll be our turn to strike. When Barbara had appointed Yalder as the defense commander, he had declared, I'll definitely come back and bring reinforcements. These two who had a bitter relationship let their past grudges be like water under the bridge, they exchanged a firm handshake and vowed to meet again. They could understand each other, ironically, because now they were both generals who had suffered defeat. Though our supplies may be limited, we have enough to hold out until the first army arrives. The Saya garrison wasn't informed that Barbara had already been dismissed. Their faith that reinforcements would come, would surely never be answered. Both fortresses were only there to buy time until Farzam could convince those in power in the kingdom. It didn't matter to him that they could only endure for a month. They were sacrificed pieces, but they, who were fighting and risking their lives on the brink, had no way of knowing. 54 Haha, I'm blessed with great soldiers so late in the war. It's an honor fighting together with them. Your Excellency, there will be more fighting here on. The rebel army is not entirely unified. If we can buy time here, an opportunity will present itself without fail. Umu. From tomorrow onward, we'll go all out. Colonel Skir is probably struggling at Cyrus about now. We can't fall behind Ha. Huh? Even after two weeks, Saya showed no signs of falling at all. The Liberation Army Commander Biraus had failed his plan for a tunnel, and his siege towers had also sustained great damage. The assault on the castle gates had also gone unfavorably, and the casualties were increasing. Biraus was a general skilled in field warfare, but he lacked experience in sieges. He had strong leadership, but he could only conduct sieges by the books, fill in the moat, fire arrows from all sides, break through the gate or ramparts with catapult support, and if the ground allowed tunneling, build a tunnel underground and break into the castle. What should one do if none of them worked? The answer wasn't written in military texts. Biraus had launched a fierce attack regardless of day or night, but that altogether backfired, creating a mountain of corpses. A feeling of war weariness was spreading through the soldiers, and morale was dropping. This is bad. Yalder and the kingdom's soldiers are quite competent. Our attacks are being pushed back admirably. Our catapults are few, and our siege towers were destroyed, we can only force through the gates perhaps. The soldiers attempting to forcibly enter the fortress through ladders were doused with boiling water or blazing oil, and they were dropping, dying. Was it really okay to let this continue? Biraus anguished. 54 Your Excellency. You mustn't be impatient. I understand your enthusiasm to take down the castle quickly for the sake of the people, but the losses of soldiers will only increase at this rate. It is also important to wait and watch. Biraus nodded at the staff officer's words and ruminated on himself. He had gotten too used to victorious battles, and he had begun to overestimate himself. He had believed that the kingdom's army was entirely full of frail soldiers. The other officers and soldiers were sure to have the same belief, the groundless confidence that the enemy would easily fall with just a slight push. That they ought to liberate the royal capital as soon as possible, this idea had consumed him. How unlike me. What have I learned after living so long? Chief Staff Officer, thank you for your criticism. You're right that temporarily taking a wait-and-see approach is best. We've overcome many hardships to come here, what need is there to be impatient now of all times? We'll prepare an endless amount of catapults and siege towers, and only good things await us if we attack composedly. Sir, that is exactly right. I will immediately begin the arrangements. It will take time, but we will be able to confidently take down the fortress. No matter how courageous the enemy General Yalder is, he cannot replenish his soldiers. Starting tomorrow, let us surround and contain them with only arrows fired. That will force the enemy to exhaustion. 
Ugu. Give the directive at once. Especially in times like this, we mustn't rush. It was a bold decision to withdraw the plan for an all-out offensive despite having over seven times the enemy's numbers. He would inevitably be criticized for his incompetency. Any other general would have decided to capture the fortress though force. That he could accept his staff officer's criticism and decide to change the plan was one of Birao's virtues. 54 The Liberation Army forced to capture Saya ceased fighting two weeks into the siege. The force sent to besiege Cyrus, the Liberation Army commanded by Diener on the other hand, had not fired even a single arrow during these two weeks. This man only did one thing, thoroughly surround Cyrus. Not just the engineers, even scouts were not an exception. All officers and men were invested into constructing this encirclement post-haste. Palisades were erected, trenches were dug, and fences to guard against horses stretched all around. Braziers brilliantly illuminated the night, showing the enemy no gap for a night raid whatsoever. Patrols were frequently sent out with no slip in their surveillance of the enemy fortress. They requested surrender only once before the siege, and they didn't plan to accept surrender at all afterwards. The reason being that if they did, their food expenditure would increase, since they would need to imprison the soldiers. Diener's plan of attack was plain and simple. Complete starvation. They bought as many goods as they could from the area around Cyrus beforehand, and after surrounding the fortress, they would guard against enemy escape. According to reports from spies, Cyrus lacked provisions. This fortress only just built hadn't been stocked with food. How long they could hold out was up to the commander in charge of defense. Sir Diener, the encirclement is flawless. Not even a rat could get out now. Ahh, everything is going well. Now we just wait for time to pass. Good for us that General LaRouze is a careful man. The most dangerous time to be attacked was while we were weaving our web. LaRouze was a man who fought a prudent and calm battle, but at the same time that was a flaw. 54 Since he was uneasy about his lack of soldiers, he forbade any combat until reinforcements from the royal capital came. During that time, the Liberation Army had completed their encirclement. Had it been the belligerent Barbara, he wouldn't have idly let them scurry around. That didn't mean it was right to launch an attack, but the end result was that the fortress was completely blockaded. The kingdom's army number roughly 7,000, a bit too low to be launching an attack. A cautious person would probably never make a gamble like that. And with this, it seems that Death God is also nearing her end. Indeed. I'll have her taste a hell like hunger. One month by my estimates. I'll enjoy seeing her after that he. The corners of Diener's lips raised, and he smiled. He had heard the Death God had quite an appetite. It was already too late for her to wield her excellence. This encirclement couldn't be broken through. Him taking the starvation plan was all in consideration for her. He thought it an appropriate execution method for death. Will you not be accepting surrender? Of course not. I won't approve of surrender after all we've been through. They'll starve, they'll grieve, and they'll suffer, then they'll die, their hearts full of regret. I'm thinking of all our comrades who've been killed by her. Show no mercy to those who come out of the fortress, no matter who they may be. Shoot them to death. You, understood. Said Vander, feeling horror innerly. Diener's face had shown a hint of madness. War drives men to insanity. Vander had only now experienced that firsthand. 54 Your Excellency. Regarding the food rations, as per orders, directives to conserve have been given. Came reporting a staff officer. LaRouze had ordered given meals to be reduced to two a day, and furthermore, their quantities diminished. Two weeks had passed since Cyrus' fortress was surrounded, and General LaRouze in charge defense had an expression of impatience. This fortress was manned by 5,000 soldiers of the 1st Army and 2,000 of Skira's cavalry. It was only just built and stout, but the take-in of supplies had been completely too late. Supplies hadn't been sent in coincidentally with completion because sending supplies to a place like this would be diverting them from the front lines. But now that Canaan had fallen, that had backfired. It wasn't that LaRouze hadn't considered going out for an attack. He had entertained the thought of doing so to hinder the enemy's maneuvering. But, the enemy's force was a large army of 50,000. Despite Skira's excellence in battle, he couldn't guarantee her safe return. If in the off chance that the death god Skira was killed, morale would probably reach rock bottom. Hence LaRouze had restrained from an attack. He didn't think he had erred. Even now, he believed that firmly devoting themselves to defense was the best course of action. The First Army has probably finished their reorganization. His Excellency Barbara is a short-tempered man. He may already be on the way. Yes, 
if we can hold out until then, it'll be possible to repulse the enemy, I believe. The soldiers are also saying we will manage as long as Colonel Skira is here. MHM. But, that doesn't rule out the possibility of the enemy switching to an assault. Tell the soldiers not to be negligent in their vigilance. Understood. Five Larus gazed outside the castle from his upper story window. The Liberation Army flags stood everywhere, as if engulfing Cyrus. Skira and her cavalry had nothing to do except keep lookout in this siege. Since Larus had ordered them not to pointlessly waste their stamina, they could only continue to stay on alert, endlessly. For Skira, this wasn't a point of concern at all, and her daily routine was endeavoring to take care of the field. Watching her in amazement, was someone who had broken through by force before the siege, Captain Darius Madros. Yo, Colonel Skira. Is fumbling with the field fun. Yeah. It's really fun. They're growing little by little. I can't get enough of watching. Mumbled Skira while uprooting weeds. Katarina was watering. These look like wealth potatoes. You've got some bad tastes. Some say they're disgusting and inedible. Darius said in disdain. He couldn't imagine himself deliberately wanting to eat potatoes native to the hated wealth. He had tried them once, and like he had expected, they were disgusting. The idiots of wealth must have gotten their screwed up personalities after eating these disgusting things, Dallas thought to himself. They aren't. They're grown here, so they're potatoes of Cyrus. Right, I'll call them Cyrus potatoes. That's just splitting hairs. 55, Captain, don't you think you're being a bit too cheeky towards the colonel? Irritated, Katarina wrinkled her brows and advised him to contain himself. Rank was absolute in an army. Even if he was a man from the Madros family for example, his disrespect couldn't be overlooked. I was born with a dirty mouth. Besides, I came here to help uninvited. I ain't scared of anything now. I wonder if you've gone crazy, coming here by yourself to throw your life away. The words Skira muttered with no ill intentions struck a nerve. This woman who didn't appear to be intelligent thought him even more a fool. Call it a sense of duty. I've come to repay the debt from Madros. Also, it's not set in stone that we're going to die. Soldiers from the royal capital are gonna come, and we'll live to fight another day. Perhaps. Skira plucked off a bug clinging to a stalk and threw it away. Her condition had improved, but her meals had diminished to twice a day, and their portions had also decreased. The snacks she kept with her were nearly finished. Katarina's candies were now at a countable number. Skira's mood was getting gloomier, and the cavalrymen too weren't faring well she felt. Oh yeah, hey colonel. I heard this from the cavalry. They say the remaining feed is in pretty bad straits. 55 said Darius as if he just remembered, and Katarina's face stiffened. Is that true, Katarina? Why, yes. We've more or less not enough. Isn't grass, growing inside this fortress? There's nothing but weeds coming up now, said Darius as he pointed out the sparse vegetation. What should we do, I wonder? Skira pondered. There were weeds growing here and there but not enough to support all the horses. Going out was prohibited too. Can you, please leave it to me? I can take the best course of action. What do you plan to do? Please leave everything to me. Vaguely said Katarina, not backing down. It was better if Skira didn't know. Darius lowered his eyes. I got it. I'll entrust everything to you, first lieutenant. Please take care of the horses. Skira smiled, and patted her hands, removing the dirt. Sir, understood. 55 After assuring themselves that Skira was going back to her office, Darius apologized to Katarina. My bad. Seems I've said too much. It's fine. She would have found out sooner or later. So, what do you intend to do? Let them go. Like I'll hand over our war horses to the enemy. There's also no need to risk opening the gates. But there's no feed right? What you gonna do then? It's better if you don't know. Whoa there. Katarina ignored Darius, and headed to the cavalrymen waiting on alert. She had to get their cooperation. What she had to do was simple. They had to call the numbers until they could hold out for two more weeks with the feed that they had. Two weeks had already passed since the start of the siege. Reinforcements should be coming after half a month, Katarina estimated. They should first kill 500 from among the little less than 2,000 war horses they had. If that proved not enough, their numbers would be further thinned out. The resulting meat would be used for food. It would be cruel, but necessary. This was war. Katarina stood still for a moment, and looked up at the sky. 55 She was a fallen heretic who manipulated corpses. 
she didn't care if she was ridiculed after all she had done. But, the only thing she didn't want, was to be hated by Skira. She feared losing Skira's faith. Skira had come to be strangely attached to horses, which is why it hurt her to mention this plan. She didn't want Skira to know. The cavalry treated their horses with much care, because horses were one's own partner obviously. Katarina also loved and had given a name to hers. They would start culling from the already weakened horses. They would go in order of physique, and Katarina's horse wouldn't be excluded. Katarina took off her glasses, wiped the area around her eyes once, and then began walking again. A month passed since the siege started. Reinforcements still hadn't come. 55 The long-awaited reinforcements had arrived, for the Liberation Army force that had refrained from attacking Saya. Large numbers of catapults and siege towers had been completed by the Liberation Army who had been working at top speed with the cooperation of the local cities. The people had also cooperated full force in transport work, and an obviously excessive amount of 1,000 catapults and 100 siege towers were deployed. Commander Biraus had ordered the entire army to start the attack again. Regardless of day or night, arrows and stones incessantly continued to shower the fortress. The stones that would be used for ammunition were soaked in oil and fired after igniting them. The defending side couldn't cope, and they were being exhaustively crushed. After three days and three nights of attacking, the Liberation Army advanced their siege towers up to the fortress walls and began to rain down arrows from above. The kingdom's archers atop the ramparts had nowhere to hide. They desperately continued resisting regardless, but they were falling one by one due to being easy targets. And, the garrison defending the main gate were also in a predicament. Don't let them break through. Defend the gates to the death. Until reinforcements from the royal capital come, we'll endure somehow. Oh you dash. 55 Pour down the oil. Burn them all down. The main gate garrison shoved their bodies against the gates, tenaciously putting up a resistance. They kept on fighting with what little energy they had left. The Liberation Army's battering rams struck the gates, and each time, the force sent the soldiers pushing their bodies against the gates flying. The garrison above the gates poured down large volumes of hot oil and were shooting fire arrows at the approaching Liberation Army. The battering ram burst into vigorous flames, but even so, the offensive continued. More and more enemies were coming. The Liberation Army soldiers climbed over the corpses, and took hold of the battering ram. And then, a fierce blow from the blazing battering ram broke down Saya Fortress's weakest spot. The main gate garrison commander resolved himself, unsheathed his sword, and gave his final orders. Here they come. Everyone draw your swords dash, long live the kingdom's army. Long live his excellency Yalder. Long live the kingdom. Long live Yalder. All hands attack. After me dash. The kingdom's soldiers with their spear line instantly at the ready skewered those of the liberation army first to arrive. 55 They used those bodies as a shield against the Liberation Army forces coming in swarms. The kingdom's soldiers were crushed, trampled, and slaughtered all without a chance to even scream. As if infesting the fortress, the Liberation Army soldiers invaded inside, killing every guard they met. There was no justice nor righteousness, merely swarms of beasts drunk on madness and seething with mindless desire to kill. The guards fought well. They fought very well. But, they were outnumbered. Force of numbers was overwhelming them. The infirmary housing the wounded was sealed off and then set fire to, and everyone inside burned to death. Everyone in the fortress was massacred with no regard to combatant or non-combatant. The Liberation Army soldiers weeded out everyone still breathing, and gleefully gave them the finishing blow. Biraus hadn't given such orders, but all the pent-up dissatisfaction, misery, and hatred were all turned towards the soldiers of the kingdom, and the commanders couldn't stop it. If they tried to clumsily stop it, they were likely to be killed in retaliation. They couldn't intervene. Secluded in Saya's highest tower, Yalder took off his helmet and quietly steadied his breathing. His face had a great number of wounds, and his armor was also partially destroyed. Pain coursed through him when he moved his body. One of his bones may be broken. His hair was disheveled, and his facial hair had grown as it pleased. The edge of his trusty sword was chipped and had become useless. 55, so in the end, reinforcements didn't come. What a shame. Barbara probably has his own circumstances. I would have liked to have a nice, slow chat with him once. It seems I won't have that opportunity. Yalder gave a bitter smile in resignation. He could hear the sounds of intense fighting from outside. The guards were probably buying the final bits of time. He felt admiration from the bottom of his heart towards their loyalty. Behind Yalder flew the flags of Kingdom, the Third Army, 
and the 4th Army. Battle played out under those flags, welcoming the soldiers' final moments. He gazed at them, deeply emotional. This is my guess, but Sir Prime Minister may have colluded with the enemy. Thinking of it that way, it follows that reinforcements would not have come. Sir Barbara was probably imprisoned, or killed. Muttered Sidemo while adjusting his uniform disarranged through work. Even he, a staff officer, had exhausted his energy in desperation, fighting up to their final moments. And now, he had was beginning their final preparations. So even the Prime Minister, the highest civil official, has forsaken the kingdom? There's probably nothing more we can do then. Hey Sidemo. It's not too late. You have something you must do right? You don't have to keep me company. Disguise yourself again and escape. Yalder didn't know how many times he had tried persuading Sidemo. Sidemo dearly wished to restore the fallen house of Arte. Knowing that, Yalder had been telling him to hurry and escape. Sidemo had stayed with him up until now, he had done enough. Fifty-five so you say, but your excellency cannot start up those alone. They require magical power. You can use magic. Yalder asked with an expression that said he was hearing this for the first time. I only have it, but I cannot use it. Though something like activating those won't pose a problem. He had capacity for sorcery, but he wasn't blessed with talent as a sorcerer. Hence, Saitamo had arduously exerted himself and acquired his rank of staff officer with his knowledge. This is your last chance. Run away Saitamo. Live, and carry out your long-cherished desire. I must refuse. I too have some backbone. I cannot shamelessly live on while letting my leader die in battle. Discussing this anymore is wasting both our times. Damn you're a stubborn man, well, that's quite like you I guess. Fine then, do as you please. Sir. I intended to anyway. The corners of Sidemo's lips raised ever so slightly. Yalder smiled. I regret that I couldn't keep my promise with Colonel Skira. What a shame, yeah, truly a shame. Sir, Skira too certainly thinks it a shame. Five humph, I'll have to apologize one day. I hope she forgives me. If you bring some good food, she won't have a problem. Skira is that kind of person. I guess so. When that time comes, I must keep my promise dash from outside the high tower resonated cheers. It appeared that all the guards had been annihilated. The door to the tower was broken down, and they rushed inside. It would probably only be a matter of time until they closed in on their room. Yalder nodded, and Saitamo hid himself. He prepared those next to him. He would activate them at Yalder's signal. The sounds of countless military boots surged towards them, and the double doors were mightily kicked open. Found you, General of the Kingdom, Yalder. Your head is mine. The Liberation Army soldiers surrounded Yalder, the points of their weapons pointed towards him, and they began ridiculing him. Your kingdom is done for. Now accept your just deserts. What a pathetic man. For this prestigious general to be killed by simple soldiers. Silence. I may be washed up, but I, Yalder, will never hand over my head to the likes of you Dash. Glaring at the sneering soldiers of the Liberation Army, Yalder unsheathed his chipped sword. Momentarily lost for words at Yalder's spirit, the soldiers' faces turned red in rage. You've quite the mouth for a beaten dog. We'll kill you. Fifty-six a general's head. As much reward as we want. Hee hee Dash, it's mine. The Liberation Army soldiers rushed at Yalder with their spears forward. Slashing down several small fry, Yalder's abdomen was pierced by many spears. Pulling out the spear tips, he stumbled backwards. The enemy soldiers stepped over the corpses and closed the distance. After smashing the head of the lead man, Yalder finally made his decision. While coughing up blood, Yalder roared with all the air in his lungs. He would not hand over his head to these soldiers. Long live, the Yuz Kingdom Dash. Yalder cut his own throat with his sword. Losing strength, he collapsed to his knees. He's saved us the trouble. Shithead. I'll chop him up. Catching his corpse, the soldiers bared their teeth in ridicule. They all rushed at Yalder's corpse. After witnessing his friend's final moments, Saitamo chanted the ignition spell for the sorcery mines taken from the Liberation Army. Those that had misfired at the previous battle were recovered from the ox carts and brought to Saya. 56 they were placed in the four corners of the castle room. The excited Liberation Army soldiers hadn't noticed, but large quantities of gunpowder and oil were scattered around. When Saitamo reached the final line of the incantation, the figures of his deceased older brother and foolish older sister floated in the back of his mind. And for some reason, Skira's detestable face came to mind too. 
to think of death of all things in his final moments, Saitamo couldn't hold back a wry smile. But, he didn't hate her way of living. Free and unrestrained, her appearance as she lived willfully, perhaps he was envious. He wasn't really sure. Thankfully, I still have some time. Let's follow death's example and think more selfishly. Older brother, I'll be leaving this world. Farewell, older sister. The instant Saitamo finished chanting the spell, blinding light surged from the sorcery mines. The expanding blast burned everyone in the area to nothing, wiping them out without a trace. The flames set the oil on fire, and the gunpowder exacerbated the force, and the entire tower was caught up in the explosion. The sorcery mines that had started Yalder's days of agony, now brought about their end. And so Saya fell, and the surviving soldiers of the kingdom's third and fourth armies were utterly wiped out. Yalder, Saitamo, and the garrison of all ten thousand soldiers under them died in battle. All that was left were the resounding cheers and cries of the victorious Liberation Army. However, the face of Biraus who had achieved victory was grim. 56, isn't this, nothing more than using the people's wrath for our own devices? There's no guarantee, that the blade of their anger won't be pointed towards us one day. Biraus closed his eyes and brushed away his thoughts. They were in the right. It was true that the kingdom had ruled over the people in tyranny. Justice was on their side to free the people. Indeed, that was why they were in the right. They just had to not repeat the same mistakes. Humans learn from history. They would walk the honest path. Along with the staff officers celebrating their victory, Biraus entered inside the fortress. Corpses of the kingdom's soldiers, corpses burned to death, corpses crushed to death, corpses dismembered, everywhere. The old general Biraus, continued to walk onwards, in this world of hell built under the name of justice. When dark smoke rose from Saya Fortress, the Liberation Army soldiers surrounding Cyrus Fortress thundered in cheers. At the same time it was to show delight, it was also to make those inside the fortress taste despair. You are next, it signified. A month had already passed since the siege started. It wouldn't be strange if the fortress had already exhausted their provisions. Diener studied the kingdom's soldiers standing on the ramparts with a spyglass. Their cheeks were sunken, and their complexions were severely poor. Their bodies staggered, and they could barely stand. But, they were still living. It was still too early to attack. Even if they attacked with force and felled the fortress, that would be too lenient. 56 The Death God had to taste even more unbearable hunger. Once she went mad from hunger, he would kill her. Lowering the spyglass, Diener ordered Vander standing next to him. Kill them. I told you I won't accept surrender. Are you sure? They're holding a white flag. I don't care. Tell the soldiers it's likely a fake surrender. Death had eaten at the Imperial Army and destroyed them with that tactic. We will not make the same mistake as them. Understood. Messenger convey the orders to shoot down the enemy soldiers. Sir Dash. The messenger on his horse left headquarters. Several minutes later, the soldiers of the kingdom holding a white flag were doused with arrows, and they died. He wouldn't let anyone escape from Cyrus' fortress. With a thin smile on his face, Diener went back to his pavilion. Cyrus' fortress. Confirming the black smoke and knowing Saya had fallen, Larus decided it was time to surrender. He couldn't make the soldiers go along with his selfishness. But, the envoys were shot down before they managed to reach the enemy camp. It seems the enemy intended on killing everyone in this fortress. Emaciated himself, Larus worked over a plan for hereafter. Reinforcements hadn't come yet. They probably wouldn't come no matter how long they held out, he feared. If Barbara was still in command, they should have arrived a long time ago. That they hadn't meant that something had happened in the royal capital. There was a high chance that Barbara was dismissed. 56 He didn't know what the Prime Minister was thinking, but what LaRue's understood now was only that the Prime Minister would let this fortress fall. In that case, there was no meaning in confining themselves like this. They were just wasting their stamina. However, it was too late to launch an attack. The enemy's preparations were perfect. There was only death if they opened the gates and made a determined assault. Two choices remained for LaRue's. There was no choice for surrender. Would they stick it out inside the castle until the very end and die from hunger, or would they raid the enemy's formation and proudly die in battle? Larus slapped his desk. There were many things he could have done if he knew that they were going to be abandoned from the onset. Guerrilla warfare with concealed soldiers and using Cyrus Fortress as a decoy. Mobile raids, taking advantage of the mobility of Skira's unit. They could have slowed the Liberation Army's advance by interfering with their supply line. Yet, 
he had chosen to enter their deathbeds, where they had to spend every day in worry of remaining provisions. Larousse lamented his own caution and passivity. He needed a little more time, until he could make his final decision. In her hazy consciousness, Skira sat in front of the fields with several of her cavalry. A cavalryman was propping up Skira from behind, for those occasions when she would sometimes lose consciousness. If humans subsisted only on water, it would take generally two or three months to die of starvation. Of course, every person was different. With her healthy appetite, the extent of Skira's debility was more severe than the other soldiers, and one could tell she was in trouble from a glance. Her cheeks were caved in, and it had become difficult to satisfactorily move. But, she could still fight. Skira grasped the scythe next to her tightly. 56 Now that a month had passed since the start of the siege, meals were reduced to once a day, and those meals were also in a miserable state. Next to Skira was a plate. A scrap of bread about the size of a pebble quietly sat on it. A large amount of liquid was poured into a bowl. An ingredient less soup. It wasn't a soup as thin as water, it was water. More accurately, water flavored with a little salt. She thought could hear a chef's cries of anguish. Skira picked up the scrap of bread with trembling hands. She gently carried it into her mouth, and slowly chewed, taking her time. Once it couldn't be tasted, and once it couldn't be chewed anymore, she swallowed, her throat making a noise. Delicious, Skira's cheeks slightly relaxed. The cavalrymen couldn't watch anymore, and they spoke up. Colonel, please, take ours dash, I don't need it. She strongly refused the extended bread. She detested taking her companion's food. She took a sip of salt water, and spit it out. This wasn't food. It was just water. Skira tiredly leaned on a cavalryman. Colonel, I beg you, please eat. You need the nutrition more than us. Please. No Colonel. 56 I don't want it. I'd rather die. I'll never eat it. Skira unyieldingly refused her subordinate's proposal. She would only eat the portion allotted to her. As a high-ranking officer, Skira should have been distributed more than the non-commissioned officers, but she only ate an equal amount as her cavalry. She couldn't eat more by herself, much less take away another's tiny portion. Anything but that. Anything but doing the same things as the rebel army. Those guys were vermin who took from them while saying they were fighting for the people. I hope they, quickly grow, and become edible. The crops in front of her hadn't borne fruit yet. She wondered when they would. While propped against one of her cavalry, Skira longingly stared at them. Katerina made up her mind, seeing this scene. That night. Katerina waited for the soldiers keeping watch to fall asleep, and she decided to go outside the fortress. She would use magic to leap down from the ramparts and slip into the enemy camp using what little she knew about concealment. Her targets were the supply convoys. Skira should accept eating food stolen from the rebel army. At this rate, Skira would die of malnourishment. Even if they started killing all their war horses and using their meat for food, Katarina too probably wouldn't eat them. 56 What a joke it would be if death died from starvation. Katarina hadn't stayed beside Skira to witness her die like that. She would never accept such a death. Katarina prepared her equipment, and examined the environment surrounding the ramparts, when, yo. Who are you eloping with this late at night? Or are you stargazing? There was a man's throaty voice. Katarina scowled, and the man waved his hand in greeting. It was the stupid man who had come from Madros, Darius Madros. Just a whim of mine. Leave me alone. Wasn't rank absolute in an army. And didn't you yourself ignore that? So I'll be doing the same. I hear ya. Heh, what a strong-willed woman. Darius took out a hip flask and held it to his mouth. Its contents were water of course. Do you need something? Katarina touched her glasses, vigilant. 56 nn, not really. I just thought there was a suspicious human shadow passing by. That's all. I ain't gonna stop whatever you're gonna do. I came here in a similar fashion after all. I see. I'll be going then. For the colonel, I'll definitely plunder some food. That's so? Well, take care. Even if you're unlucky, we'll be able to meet before long. The only difference is sooner or later. I'll explain to the colonel when the time comes, so don't worry. Knowing it was futile to stop her, Darius shrugged his shoulders and was about to leave. Katarina spoke to his back. If, just if, I don't make it back, take care of the colonel. She won't fare well without an adjutant I'm sure. Whoa whoa, gimme a break. I almost got my head chopped off by the colonel. That ain't a joke. A laugh burst out of Katarina, 
seeing Darius putting his hand on his neck. That's fine then. I knew there was no one more fit to the duty than me. Exactly. So yeah, be careful. Also, that pink ribbon doesn't look good on you at all. Muttered Darius, giving Katarina's pink ribbon a glance and leaving. None of your business. Katarina took out her cane and loaded it with magical energy. Five she strengthened her legs for the descent, and she intended on using a rope ladder on the way back. She had to leave a minimum amount of magic power. It would be difficult no matter how she played it out, but she had no choice but to do it. I should have learned more magic besides necromancy for times like this. Too late now though. She took a deep breath, opened her eyes, and sallied forth from Cyrus Fortress. First Lieutenant Katarina Noobs disappeared from that night onward and would never return to Cyrus Fortress alive. 57 Skira received word that Katarina had died in battle. Her ashen face crumbled, and she felt violently nauseous. She kneeled, and her vomit mixed with blood splashed on the floor. It was all stomach acid. Darius, who had reported to her, rubbed her tiny back. H, hey. You okay? Yeah, I just feel a little bad. I'll get better immediately. My bad, I should have stopped her, by force if necessary. It's my fault. You're fine. Katarina had her reasons. That's all. B, but, we can meet again one day. My cavalry, is always together. Brushing away the hand of Darius who tried to catch her, Skira began heading back to her own room. A cavalryman supported her body, and she slowly began walking forward. She could no longer walk by herself, yet even so, her scythe didn't separate from her back. She couldn't fight without it. Having entered her room, Skira leaned against the window, and then slid down to the floor. Then she slowly closed her eyes. She was tired, very tired. She didn't want to move. 57 Her stomach was empty, but she felt no hunger. Paradoxically, she didn't want to eat anything. She felt like even if there was a feast in front of her, her stomach wouldn't take it. I wonder why. I'm reminded of, that old village. I, hate that place. Skira opened her eyes, and the world was blurry. Her dreary office only for a moment flashed with the scene of her burning village. A black shadow clad in tattered robes piercingly overlooked the feeble Skira. It peered at Skira from a distance, waiting for its chance. It wasn't time yet. One week after the fall of Saya. When two months had passed since the start of the siege, defending Commander Larus made the here-trending decision. Notification to all soldiers in Cyrus from Larus. At the same time as dawn breaks, all soldiers will sortie from the fortress, charge into enemy headquarters, and take the head of the rebel army general. However, this is not mandatory. Those who object to the decree are permitted to remain in the fortress. It has been an honor to have been able to fight together up until this day. Gentlemen, I give my heartfelt thanks for your loyalty and bravery. 57 Larus couldn't bear having his soldiers suffer the horror known as starving to death. Then there was no other way. Valiantly, they would break into enemy camp and meet their final moments as warriors. What happened to those who remained in the fortress was up to the commander of the Liberation Army. Larus expected them to all be killed. Had their adversaries any mercy, they would have accepted the earlier surrender. I can't believe that I of all people would have chosen to attack and die an honorable death. This kind of end is more suited towards Barbara, it's beyond me. Skira gathered her cavalry, and they had their last supper together. Other units had similarly decided to take a meal, and there were many who had grieving faces, but Skira's group was different. There was no meaning in meals if they didn't enjoy it. Even if it was tasteless alone, together with friends, it became more delicious than ever. Today's luxurious menu was the following, so delicious it makes one's jaw drop, the famous, the reputed, bread. As it was of such excessive preciousness, only a piece of it could be prepared. And, purified soup of such crystalline clarity that it might even be mistaken for water. It seemed there was a spoonful of salt sprinkled in to bring out its subtle flavors. A masterpiece that reflects the work of a skilled chef, quietly said Skira with a straight face, and the cavalrymen had smiles on their faces. Going along with them, Skira too had a smile. Darius too had a wry smile. Since they had come to Cyrus, it was the most fun, and most delicious dinner she ever had. She would probably never forget it for the rest of her life. Skira somehow felt her body become lighter. She felt great right now. The black, ominous shadow was receding. 57 of the Cyrus garrison, 5,000 volunteered to participate in the attack. Those who chose to remain in the fortress and meet their ends were those who couldn't move, and those who clung to their last ray of hope, surrender. 
Of Skira's 2,000 cavalry, a thousand were mounted, and 900 would follow on foot. The 100 rest asked to stay and defend. They were those who suffered grievous wounds at the previous battle and hadn't recovered yet. They were incapable of participating in the assault. I can't leave you all behind. I'll stay home and fight to the last with you. Said Skira wearing her black armor, propping herself up on a cavalryman's shoulder, and a soldier who aspired to defend in their absence shook his head sideways while smiling. I am grateful for the sentiments, but I must refuse. Staff Officer Sidemo said it best right? Cavalry must die outside. Promises must be kept, right, Colonel? The other soldiers who would also remain opened their mouths to agree. Honestly, they all wanted to die fighting together with Skira. But, they were without their horses, and being unable to move as they wished, they were nothing more than a burden. In that case, they would assume a different duty. What, your worry is unneeded. Colonel Skira's cavalry is invincible. We will watch over you from over here, waiting for the day you come meet us again. Forever. 57 that's right, never will we be defeated. Moreover, we have to take care of the potatoes we grew together. Once they bear fruit, the war will surely have ended. When that time comes, I'll show you my skill, and make a delicious stew. Please look forward to it. I understand. I'll definitely come for you. We'll have a delicious feast then, together. I promise. Skira smiled, and the soldiers enthusiastically nodded. Salute the colonel. May the fortunes of war be with you. You all as well, take care. Let us meet again, for sure. Sir Dash. The 100 staying in the fortress chose not to defend the gates, but to protect their deer field. Nothing would have happened anyway if their small force defended the gates. Hence, they wanted to fight at their treasured place. They had to freedom to choose their deathbeds at least. Not for the kingdom, but for Skira, thought the remaining cavalrymen unanimously. As if encroaching upon the evening darkness, the sky was becoming white. Addressing the soldiers assembled at the main gates, Larus raised his voice, his face grim, as he gave his order. Grim, from the bitterness that he had to order them to die, but he concealed the fact. Fifty-seven gentlemen, I give my deepest thanks for staying with me until today. We'll show the rebel army, the spirit of the Cyrus garrison. We'll make them know, the valor of the kingdom's elite. Without fail, we'll hold up the commander's head dash. Oh you dash. All right, open the gates dash. Death shall be our herald. Escort Colonel Skira into enemy headquarters. Long live the kingdom. Long live the first army. All units begin the assault dash. Forward dash. Forwards dash. You dash. The drawbridge was lowered, and the gates opened. Larus charged as the vanguard, and the soldiers spurred on their horses after him. The strategy was all too simple. Larus and the infantry would break down the surrounding fences, palisades, and trenches, and then stop any reinforcements until they died. Skira's unit would climb over their corpses and drive into enemy headquarters. Without any expectations to return alive. Every man of Skira's cavalry raised their spears, and readied to charge. Skira glanced over each of them, and nodded just once. We'll kill as many of the rebel scum as we can lay hands on. I will fight, until I can fight no longer. So stay with me. Thank you for everything. It has truly been a pleasure eating with you all. I'm eternally grateful. It has been an honor to be with you Colonel. Colonel, thank you very much. 57, long live Sir Skira. Long live Colonel Skira. All right. Let's go. Raise the flags dash. Skira's cavalry will begin the charge. Kill them all dash. Begin the charge. Follow the Colonel. Skira mustered her strength and galloped her horse. Darius shouted, and the cavalry followed, the sounds of their hoofbeats resounding. Black flags passed through the gates, and white baneful crows sailed out into the open field, to bring death to the Liberation Army, to take even one more man down with them. The Cyrus garrison and Skira's cavalry began the assault. Sensing the attack of the kingdom's army, Diener concentrated soldiers in front of headquarters, and ordered them to utilize the built defenses to annihilate them. He planned to kill all of them and not let them break through. He wouldn't let even a single man escape. The enemy is already weakened. Stay calm and snipe them. Shoot them down and kill everyone. Sir Diener, preparations are complete. Good, commence the capture of Cyrus. Take no prisoners, slay them all. Sir Dash. The messenger left. Now that the garrison's main force had sorted, Cyrus' fortress was near empty. It would fall immediately from an onslaught of 30,000. 
57 with this time's starvation tactics, he was able to keep the losses of soldiers to an absolute minimum. The siege turned out perfectly. It would be all too simple to drive away the enemy's thoughtless attack. They had built a firm line of defense. Death's cavalry wouldn't be able to make it. The only thing awaiting them was a wretched death. Well, even if they stayed inside the fortress, they would only be heading towards their deaths from a hellish hunger. In fact, we might be considered messiahs for liberating them from their misery. Kuka, a messiah that saves death, oh how it makes me laugh. With the most heartfelt laughter, Diener took out his spyglass. The deaths of the kingdom's fools, this had the makings of the ultimate comedy. After Skira and the others sorted, like swarming ants over prey, the Liberation Army surged into Cyrus' fortress. Those that decided to meet their ends here desperately guarded the gates, but they were broken through without any difficulty. There was no longer any need for battering rams. The Liberation Army clung to the gates, and forcibly broke it down with iron sledgehammers. The weakened soldiers were overrun by the Liberation Army with plenty of ardor, and they were mercilessly killed. For the attacking soldiers of the Liberation Army, there were few chances left to make a name for themselves. To be recognized for their valor in battle, they had to thoroughly slaughter everyone. This wasn't a battlefield, just a simple hunting ground. There was no accepting surrender. There was no need to listen to game begging for their lives. 57 The soldiers who threw down their swords and surrendered were kicked and impaled with spears. Their heads were stabbed countless times by swords. Same for the wounded. Taking prisoners was unnecessary. In accordance with Diener's instructions, they slayed all, leaving not one remaining. Amidst all that, there was a group of soldiers that resolutely fought to the end. They differed from the soldiers of the kingdom who ran around trying to escape like scattering baby spiders. In the fortress's courtyard, the 100 took a square formation and boldly continued resisting. Before them lay the dead bodies of Liberation Army soldiers, and right now with ferocious smiles on their faces they were pulling out their spears from freshly killed flesh. Ha ha ha. They've no metal. Their numbers are great, but after all they're just gathered trash. Were the colonel here, they'd have died in less than a minute. We alone are enough. We should take as many as we can with us. Let's kill even one man more. They, Skira's cavalry, surrounded the field in a square formation, and in the center of them stood their battle flag. The Liberation Army soldiers around them hesitated in stepping forward. That flag was death's symbol. They would be distinguished if they took it down, but they didn't want to die when they had already won. Those rash for merit that had energetically gone in for the kill had already become pieces of meat. The fortress had largely been suppressed, but only this courtyard continued tenaciously resisting. Even if they suffered wounds, or their numbers dwindled, Skira's cavalry would never let them approach the field. Five death soldiers feared no one. Note, again, death soldiers with the additional connotation as in those resolved to die. Losing his temper, a commander of the Liberation Army appeared, bringing along crossbowmen. Since he didn't think he'd have to use them in a suppression, it had taken time to prepare. It was a disgrace that they hadn't been able to crush them with overwhelming numbers of soldiers. They barely had any strength left in them moreover. You've fought well for soldiers of the kingdom. I'll praise you. But, this is as far as you go. Crossbowmen, formations. For the commander's order, the crossbowmen formed three ranks, and took aim. The cavalrymen prepared their spears, ready for their time. Long live Colonel Skira. Victory for the colonel. The cavalrymen chanted in unison, and the commander swung down his sword. The crossbowmen pulled the trigger, and fired. Then a second volley. And a third volley. The first rank reloaded. Skira's cavalry silently collapsed. Some stabbed their spears in the ground, refusing to topple. These guys will move until the very, very end. Keep on shooting. No need for reserve. The commander who had heard of the cavalry's abominableness from Diener and FYNN made sure to not get close. He kept a distance and kept on shooting. The cavalrymen's bodies were treated like dummies used for shooting practice, and the crossbowmen sneered as they shot their bolts. 58 After several hundred fired bolts, there was no one alive. Their bodies were like comical hedgehogs. The Liberation Army soldiers laughed. These idiots made us waste time. And all for what? muttered the commander, detestably looking at the corpses of the cavalrymen. One soldier read the signboard, and spoke up. Your Excellency. It seems this strange garden is the Death God's. Her signature is on it, and it says not to damage it. Ridiculous. They persevered here just to protect a garden? What the heck were they thinking? The deeds of madmen are difficult to understand. 
The commander spat out in ill humor. All for Colonel Skira? Ain't they gone crazy? These wealth potatoes? They died for potatoes. One soldier uprooted one of the crops buried in the field like he was touching something filthy. Then he crushed it vehemently underfoot. Well whatever. If these re so important, we'll bury them together. They're abominable soldiers of the Death God, we don't want them resurrecting on us. Understood. Hee <laughs> hee, we'll burn em all. Get out of the way. 58 The soldiers of the Liberation Army kicked the corpses of the cavalry as they collected them in one spot. Skira's so carefully raised field of wealth potatoes was tragically devastated. They tore the crops to pieces in jest with their swords, dug up the field entirely with their spears, and trampled on the dirt a countless, unfathomable number of times with their boots. They lathered oil on top the dead bodies, and set fire to them along with the wreckages of the crops. All right, go raise our flag atop this fortress. Let the tactician know of our victory. Understood. Damn, finally onward to the royal capital. It's been a while. The infantry followed the commander and began climbing up a tower. Behind them were a blazing mountain of corpses and the burnt ruins of the field. Liberation Army Headquarters. Diener doubted his eyes at the situation progressing before his eyes. Impede the enemy with a line of defenses and annihilate them with stationed archers. It should have been so simple. But, what was this scene unfolding before him? He couldn't understand it all. W, why? Why can't they be stopped? The kingdom's army were filling up the trenches with corpses, destroying the fences, and getting rid of the polycides, all while withstanding the arrows. 58 All during that, the soldiers were killing in the hundreds. He had received news that the enemy General LaRue's had already died. Wasn't it strange they hadn't lost the will to fight? Sir Diener, the enemy are like cornered rats. With their escape routes completely blocked, they can only fight. Shut up. Send more soldiers to the front. They mustn't be allowed to approach. You, understood. Constructing the blockade, eliminating all routes of escape, that was all Diener. It was also he who had ignored their surrender and decided to crush all of them. The surviving infantry of the enemy crashed into his allies' vanguard. Behind them were cavalry hoisting a black flag and kicking up a cloud of dust. They prioritized not victory, but the death and suffering of their sworn enemy, and the blood of his Liberation Army comrades was pointlessly being spilled. Diener regretted his decision, but it was too late. Death's soldiers plunged forward, aiming for his headquarters, creating more sacrifices all the while. The Liberation Army tried to attack them from all sides, but the enemy cavalry's momentum didn't slow. Shit dash. At this rate dash Sir Diener. The Lion's Cavalry. FYNN's cavalry has come. W, what? Just when Diener started thinking about evacuating from headquarters, cavalry flying the flag of the Lion mowed down Death's soldiers. 58 The infantry of the kingdom's army boring into their formation was halted. The soldiers who kept on determinately advancing, infallible in their impetus, once stopped, were fragile. Sir Diener. I know. Don't miss this chance, link up with FYNN's unit and crush them all at once. Diener suddenly stood up and gave his directive. Heroically swinging his spear, capitalizing on their mobility, and beating down the kingdom's army was FYNN and his lion's cavalry. The enemy's morale was certainly high, but their movements were dull. It seemed they couldn't keep up with cavalry's keen movements. Starvation had doubtlessly sapped away their stamina. FYNN cut off the head of a kingdom's soldier. Colonel. The death god is in front of us dash. Death's cavalry is rushing forward. Yelled Adjutant Mila while swinging her sword. Death's cavalry was dashing in a straight line, following the road the infantry of the kingdom had opened for them. In front was Skira. She was showering in large volumes of blood spray. Her shoulders heaved with her breathing as she spurred on her horse. So death comes last after all. They should have been weakened considerably by starvation. I won't lose this time. Colonel. 58 what, I'm not going alone. This is a fight to the death. Come with me, don't hold back. Sir Dash. Here we go. We'll kill the death god and make a name for ourselves. Let them know the strength of the lion's cavalry. Ordered FYNN, and the cavalry began charging in compliance. FYNN's reputation was already clearly unshakable, but if he killed Skira here, it could be said he'd reach the pinnacle of renown. Dangling before his eyes was fame and glory. He couldn't let this chance escape. 4,000 infantry of the kingdom's army had at last exhausted their stamina it seemed, and their force was weakening. He should isolate all of them and reliably crush them afterwards. 
The enemy was surrounded by a force ten times their number. There was no defeat from the onset. The lion's cavalry collided with death's cavalry. FYNN decided to aim for Skira, and he tightened his grip on his spear. One blow when they passed each other. He intended to end it there. Skira was holding her scythe to the side horizontally with both hands. Its blade was smeared with blood, and it was harvesting the souls of many. Death God Skira. Your head is mine. Suddenly, Skira threw her scythe high up in front of her. The moment he looked up, promptly, two sickles sprouted from both of FYNN's shoulders. Skira had thrown two small sickles from her waist. 58, W, what? I don't have time to play with you. My goal is only the Supreme Commander's head. Without looking towards FYNN who collapsed in intense pain, Skira dashed forward with her 1,000 cavalry. Having fallen from his horse, FYNN was caked with dirty mud kicked up by the horses. He screamed as he writhed, smearing himself with dirt. Until Mila noticed and rushed over to him, he was tormented by endless pain. Catching her thrown scythe, Skira once again grasped the reins. With FYNN's lion's cavalry broken through, Skira advanced towards headquarters, the enemy general's flag fluttering above it, while breaking down the defensive fences. To hold back the enemy hot on her heels, cavalrymen of their own volition decided to stop and turned around. Skira only went forward, forward, and forwards. Those following her were Darius with a little more than 200 riders. The others gave themselves unto death and went to disrupt the enemy's formation. Ha dash, ha dash dot. Almost there colonel. That's shit face Diener's flag. Unfortunate, that it's not Altura. Now's not the time to be greedy. It's a miracle we even made it this far. There's no such thing as miracles. Only hatred and determination. She swung her scythe while gritting her teeth. She wouldn't be able to move soon. There wasn't much time left. Brushing away the downpouring arrows, Skira charged forwards. 58 A sharp, angular-faced young man relatively young entered her line of sight. Different from the other soldiers, he was wearing an unwrinkled uniform. His teeth were clenched so hard that blood flowed from his lips. It seemed he was extremely enraged. She thought to throw a sickle, but she had used the last of them on that lion guy earlier. Whatever. It was probably better to gouge out his head with her scythe. Skira held her scythe aloft. One last blow. She had one last blow in her. Her final prey would be this shit face. She would kill him without fail. Her cavalry behind her dwindled in numbers while she continued on. Just a little more. Just a little more. Just several seconds away from her sworn enemy's head, just one more step away. Cross bowman, fire. At the same time a familiar voice shouted out, several bolts pierced Skira's body. Skira felt like she would fall off her horse from the impact. She gripped the reins and endured. Her world swerved. When she checked the voice's owner, it was the traitor Vander. Skira let out a smile seeing his nostalgic face. Ah, how nostalgic Belta Castle was. Katarina, Sidemo, Yalder. There were so many interesting humans. David, Conrad, Darius. There were so many strange humans. Diener, Vander, Octavio. There were tons of loathsome humans. So many things had happened. In this one year, there had really been so many things. She was tired. Blood violently spilled from her mouth, and Skira lay forward on her horse. Even so, she didn't let go of her scythe. 58 The Death God's been hit. Take its head. Said Vander, and the infantry flooded forward. More bolts were fired for cover. Her cavalry stood in front of her, their arms spread out wide as they died protecting her. Darius took the reins from the collapsed Skira and strongly pulled. Hang in there. Hey Dash. Is this, the end? I wonder. Retard. Not yet Dash. We haven't taken that F asterisker's head yet. But. I'm a bit, tired. Shut up. I don't want to hear death whining. Hey you, take the colonel and escape. Use everything you got and run away somewhere Dash. B, but. A young rider was confused at Darius's order. He was ready to die, why did he have to run away? He couldn't understand. He couldn't abandon his comrades and run away. It'll annoy those guys. If she gets away, that shithead is gonna get pissed. Kman, get a move on. Don't turn back Dash. Un, understood. Picking up Skira's body, the young rider retreated. Several riders followed after to guard him. 58 Darius had a thin smile, and he turned around. He had found a nice place to die. His damn father probably wouldn't complain either if he died protecting a woman. 
This was the best. Head dash, this is the end. Skira, this is for you. Darius and the surviving cavalry squeezed out the last of their strength and charged. They drove onwards into the group of crossbowmen, and they fought hard despite being hailed by arrows. They were almost like evil fiends. They honestly fought hard. To buy time until Skira could escape, they laid waste to Diener's headquarters. One man killed tens. Actually, even more, and every single man fought like the greatest knights from history. In the end, they were pulled down from their horses by a herd of maddened soldiers, their limbs crucified, and all members died while laughing maniacally. Darius too, not as a man of mad rose, but as simply Darius, died fighting. With the enemy annihilated, the Liberation Army headquarters was finally regaining its composure. Freed from the impending fear of death before him, Diener ran his trembling hand through his hair. What, is this? Diener looked over his half-destroyed camp. In front of him were the corpses of Liberation Army soldiers that their dead faces were of grief. When he looked at the dead bodies of Death's riders, they all died with ridiculing smiles, feeling satisfied. Their faces were like scoffing at Diener's clumsiness. Five Vander approached and spoke up. Sir Diener. Are you injured? What just happened? Was I done in by the Death God again? Please calm down. Death was repelled. It is your victory. Does this look like victory to you? I intended to exhaust them by starvation and curb pointless sacrifices, but what is this sorry state? I, I. Why, why didn't I prepare a route of escape? Why did I turn all of the enemy into death's soldiers? Have I become conceited unawares? 7,000 of Cyrus's garrison was surrounded by 50,000 and starved. But due to the enemy's assault this time, likely over 7,000 had become casualties. Due to Diener's blunder and judgment, needless sacrifices were paid. He had pointlessly driven the enemy into a corner, and they had all changed into death's soldiers. It was an ironclad rule that one way of escape must be provided to the enemy in a siege. Hence he had arranged for an escape route at Belta. Leave a mere sliver of hope for the living, to guard against the enemy from hardening their resolve and fighting to the death. He should have known this. He couldn't be any more regretful. He had toyed with life, and this was the compensation for his derision. What if he had accepted surrender at that time? Diener collapsed forward. Nowhere did he look like a victor. 59 had it been his former self, he wouldn't have made this kind of decision. For the Liberation Army's victory, he should have erased all of his enmity. The Liberation Army was his everything. When had he changed? When had his hatred for death surpassed the lives of his comrades? Diener agonized at his transformation. But, even so, his hatred for death wasn't disappearing. Sir Diener. Skira still hasn't died. Your permission to pursue. I will kill her and pay tribute to our comrades. Death was still living. That piercing killing intent from earlier flitted across the back of his mind. His back broke out in goosebumps from his fear towards death. Kill her. No matter the costs. Vander, you must kill her. That thing, cannot be left living. You have to kill her. Cried Diener with hollow eyes. His constant calm and collectedness, his composed demeanor, was completely gone. Leave it to me. Vander took his troops and began pursuit. They raced in the direction Skira had escaped. A small forest region west of Cyrus. Skira and the young rider had escaped there. There were no signs of the other riders. All members had lured the enemy, acting as a diversion, and died in battle. 59 The young soldier propped Skira against a large tree and commenced treatment of her injuries. Her horse had ceased functioning a while ago, as it had been pushed past its limits and was overused. From here on, they had to escape on foot. He carefully pulled out the bolts sticking out of her, took off her armor, and stopped the bleeding one hole at a time. When her barren skin entered his vision, the rider averted his eyes. You've done enough. The bolts were, dipped in poison it seems. Here is, far enough. Skira murmured in a feeble voice. The crossbow bolts had been coated in a deadly poison. It was a fatal weapon the men had prepared against death. The poison rapidly ate into Skira's body. Her little remaining stamina would soon be exhausted, like a candle about to be extinguished. I cannot do that. This is an order. Rank in an army is absolute. You've done enough, leave. I'm, fine here. She tried to grip her scythe, but no strength entered her hands. She couldn't move anymore. The young rider had a resigned expression on his face after some trepidation, and then he lightly smiled. If you die, you won't become hungry anymore, Colonel. The dead don't feel hunger after all. 59 mischievously muttered the young soldier, 
and Skira curiously gazed at him. Those words, when and where had she heard them before? Somewhere, some time ago. You're. I promised to treat you to bread and cheese, remember? There's no cheese, but I do have bread. Here. The young rider pushed a tiny, a truly tiny, crumb of bread into Skira's mouth, and he stood up. The bread was damp with blood, but Skira thought it delicious. The surroundings became noisy. It seemed their broken horse was discovered. The enemy would come here soon. The young rider unsheathed his sword and stood in front of Skira. A commander of the Liberation Army appeared, pushing through the thickets. In his hand was gripped a naked blade glittering with a dangerous light. I've finally found you. Hey you, I'll let you go if you escape now. Out of the way. I refuse. I will fight until my end. There's no defeat for Skira's cavalry. I see. Then I won't say anything futile. Die. The Liberation Army commander and the young rider clashed. Sards crossed, and a battle to the death unfolded. The young rider had the advantage in enthusiasm, but he was overwhelmingly outclassed in technique, talent, and experience. After exchanging ten some blows, the young rider was cut down. Fifty-nine he reached out his hand in Skira's direction as he died. The youth who was saved by death, died protecting death. The Liberation Army commander clenched his sword dripping with fresh blood, and he approached Skira. The man's name was Vander. The human formerly Skira's adjutant. It's been a while, Major. Or rather, you're a colonel now right? Second Lieutenant Vander. Nope, I've also been promoted. I'm now a Major. I've finally caught up to you from back then. Vander sheathed his sword and looked down at Skira. Her breathing was as faint as an insect's. Even if he didn't do anything, she would probably die. The poison bolts had unfailingly gotten through to death. I harbored fear towards you at that time, and I threw myself into the Liberation Army. However, everywhere I went was the same in the end. There's no such thing as a clean army. To understand that only at this age, I guess I'm also a hopeless human being. Vander told in self-mockery. Having belonged to both armies, he had seen more than enough filth. Diener was the human who bore all of that filth, and Vander under his direct supervision had now also been dirted. 59 The reason why you became the Death God, I finally know now, why you hold such animosity towards the Liberation Army, the ones who destroyed your birthplace, were us, the Liberation Army. I was told by Diener. This world is honestly disgusting. There's no justice anywhere. I see, so it was Diener. Murmured Skira, as if engraving it onto herself. She would never forget. Kill, she would absolutely kill him. Yeah. One dirted, ten sacrificed, and a thousand saved. This is an inevitability. Someone has to do it. If no one acts, tens of thousands of humans will die at the hands of idiotic politicians. I've made the decision to dirty myself. So Dash Vander picked up Skira's large scythe next to her. Contrary to its appearance, it was light. It strangely fit in his hands, like he had always been using it. I will kill you. Death's existence isn't needed in the new world. You've killed too many, done too much. Vander placed the scythe's blade against Skira's neck. Skira didn't resist. In Skira's blurry world, Vander appeared distorted. Something which she had a memory of, from somewhere, from some time, possessed Vander, a black shadow. Skira turned her eyes towards his neck, and his tender-looking throat. Skira's appetite began welling up from somewhere. A little bit of strength returned to her. Her eyes began glinting with a dark light. I'll at least make it painless, and give you an easy death. Colonel Skira, this is farewell. 59 The instant Vander held the scythe over his head, Skira sprung up from the ground. Vander was stunned at a person on the verge of death suddenly moving. The scythe fell from his hands. Skira's soft, thin arms lovingly wrapped around Vander's neck. Skira whispered only one word, her warm breath coincidentally caressing his ear. Delicious. 59 Report to Altura The Liberation Army Force sent to Cyrus has successfully captured the fortress. The enemy General Larus and Death God Skira were killed. Also, during the confusion, Major Vander has gone missing. End of transmission. In the Chronicles of the Liberation War, Skira was said to have died in this battle. She abandoned her subordinates and devised to escape alone, whereupon she was surrounded by militiamen, and in the end, was torn limb from limb. It was said that Altura mourned Skira's blood-stained life, and she erected a tombstone in Cyrus. That the tombstone was nameless was proof of the weight of Skira's sins. Until the fear of death would vanish from the people's memories, there would be no forgiveness for her and with this sentence, the story can come to a close.
the Liberation Army that had captured Cyrus and Saya marched towards their ultimate goal, Royal Capital Blanca, with Altura in tow. With complete control over the court, Farzam had in essence staged a coup d'etat and confined King Christoph. The Royal Capital Blanca surrendered without resistance. On which occasion, Barbara committed suicide. He was appalled that he couldn't keep his promise with Yalder, and he ended his life. Barbara, who had pursued promotions and had his ambitions granted exactly as he desired, in his final moments, was deprived of his power and died without anyone to care for him. 59 The Liberation Army was welcomed amidst wholehearted cheers from the capital's citizens. There was no one who called them the rebel army. Everyone ushered them in, brimming with the feeling of liberation. The kingdom was forsaken by the citizens at their very own doorstep. The streets teemed with cheers welcoming heroes. We have been waiting for you, Princess Altura. We vassals all present swear our allegiance. Bringing along his personal retainers, Farzam greeted Altura's company. Diener coldly stared at him, and ordered for the man in front of him to be restrained. Arrest the wicked retainer Farzam and his gang. He's the culprit behind the misgovernment. There's no need to listen to his excuses. W, this is different from what we agreed on. Diener. Did you think only you would be forgiven after all you've done? Your sins deserve a thousand deaths. D, don't screw around. Do you know what'll happen if you kill me Dash? Princess. Do you mean to drag this country into another war? Deciding that speaking with Diener was useless, Farzam looked to Altura, his expression desperate. Altura glared at Farzam, and said, General Bourbon and General Octavio weren't like you, we have exchanged messages that say they would work with us. Same with the dignitaries of the royal capital. Thanks to your unsightly desire for self-protection, we were able to avoid shedding unnecessary blood. For that, I thank you. 59, you, you planned on using me from the start. It's the deceived fault for being deceived. Wasn't that the very ideal which you acted upon? General Octavio, please restrain this fool at once. Apathetically threw out Diener, and Octavio put his hand on his sword. Leave it to me. Prime Minister Farzam, you've prepared yourself. Oh, Octavio, you bastard, have you forgotten who helped you? I'm not sure what you mean. I've only sworn loyalty to Princess Altura, the rightful successor to the throne. What reason could I have to be scorned by a rebel who wielded tyranny? None. Octavio snickered. While Farzam had been buying time, Diener iconically had been advancing his schemes in the kingdom's army. Farzam was nothing more than clown manipulated by one man. This man who had crawled up by using other people collapsed. Armed Liberation Army soldiers crowded around him. Your crimes for driving several tens of thousands of civilians to their deaths will never be forgiven. Prime Minister Farzam. Until Judgment Day, repent your own doings. T. This won't be forgiven. Octavio. Diener. One day, you will become just like me. Remember this Dash. And you Altura, don't think you can live in your pretty fantasies forever Dash. What are you talking about? Altura had a dubious expression on her face, and Farzam slandered more, losing his temper. You probably don't know all the things your soldiers have done under the name of Justice Dash. You foolish little girl, guards. Take this man away Dash. Don't let him tell any more lies. Diener ordered the guards, butting in, and Farzam was dragged away. Sir Dash. Come along Dash. S.H., shit Dash. I'm the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister I'll have you know. Not a single man stood up for Farzam, and only death awaited this man who was abandoned even by his own direct followers. Before carrying out his execution, Diener next to his ear revealed everything about his identity to the bawling, struggling Farzam. Who he was, why he deceived him, and why he had to die. Farzam's eyes opened wide in shock, and he looked hard at the man who had once been his subordinate and had now taken the name of Diener. In his days, Farzam was put to the guillotine, and executed. For the man who had risen up to Prime Minister from a simple page, it was too quick an end considering his selfish use of authority. As for King Kristoff, he stayed silent, saying nothing, and he awaited his judgment day without any resistance. Despite being in a position that ought to have governed the country, he hadn't concerned himself with politics, oppressed the people, and was convicted as a criminal who killed several tens of thousands of people. It was impossible for his verdict to be anything other than death. Sixty-two weeks after the royal capital's liberation, Christoph was publicly put to the guillotine, and he passed away together with his infamy. It was also the moment Diener's revenge was complete. Having treated him, a man who worked his body to the bone as part of their spy network, 
as a disposable piece and throwing him away, were Farzam and Kristoff. In the name of justice, Diener had admirably slain these two evil sinners. After the king's execution, the royal capital broke out into a large-scale celebratory festival. It was the advent of a new age, a future overflowing with hope. Everyone's eyes were glittering, and they all had grand smiles. It proclaimed the end of their days of suffering, and that the war was over. All that was left was to rebuild. The first imperial prince Alexander Keeland who had become hostage was released. Afterwards, due to the efforts of Alan, a peace treaty was signed. The kingdom would change. Under their beautiful hope, Altura, the kingdom would be newly reborn. It was the birth of Queen Altura and the New Year's Kingdom. The whole kingdom was greatly excited, and they celebrated the birth of the new kingdom and their new queen. 60 Diamond Suit Diamond Suit Diamond Suit New Year's Kingdom, History Compilation Room. By Diener's order, this established department was given the duty of accurately conveying the new kingdom's rise for future generations. Aiming for a kingdom which would last even a thousand years, Diener had to properly leave a record of the Liberation War. He gave instructions for all the events from their uprising to the royal capital's liberation to be put together as the Chronicles of the Liberation War. In the compilation room, the chief secretary was hollering at an aged, obstinate man. He wanted his own personal opinion put in, so he was making the man do some retouching. How many times are you going to make me say it? I told you not to write down your own opinions. Correct every passage that I've marked. Chief Secretary. I have been writing down the correct history. There are no errors. Whether or not it's correct is up to me to decide. All you have to do is write down the truth. Then there is no need for amendment. I have not written any fabrications. For the death god, everything besides that she was a female officer should be left unclear. Unnecessary matters like she was a girl born in a farming village doesn't need to be written. But that is fact. I have found that in documents and have also conducted interviews. You fool. All the leaders of the kingdom fought only in their self-interests. We don't have to leave a record of anything else. You should describe in detail how marvelous the leaders of the Liberation Army fought instead. That would be too one-sided. I don't approve of the necessity of these amendments. There's no point in records if they aren't compiled from a neutral standpoint. 60 The Chief Secretary brought up another passage he demanded be revised, the Liberation Army aimed for the opening created by the skirmish between the Kingdom and the Empire and made an armed uprising in Salvador Fortress. This is false. The Liberation Army was desperately begged by the people, and revolted reluctantly. They didn't exercise armed might for personal desires. Don't be mistaken. The truth is the truth. Furthermore, about the Tenang Rebellion, the actual event is still unclear. We have to investigate the details more. Stated the old secretary, and the chief let out that it wasn't required. The actual happenings are clear. It's evident that the thieving commander of Belta at that time, David, gave the instructions for it. There are plenty of witnesses too there is no precise evidence that David gave the instructions for it. What's for sure is that there were victims and that the soldiers of the kingdom committed the massacre. There's all your objective evidence. In the first place, the beginnings are obscure. Why would the feudal lord of Tenang attack the peasants? The marching peasants were large in number, and he should have known what would happen if he used violence on them. Furthermore, there should have been a temporary levy going on, but there exists no records of that. Just where did all the stolen goods go? There are too many points of uncertainty. Humph, <laughs> not a problem. The feudal lord probably used it all to enrich his own lifestyle. That man only thought about himself. The secretary didn't agree, and he threw down the documents, unable to keep up with the chief secretary's farce. 60 The biggest point of doubt is why the peasants raised the flag of the Liberation Army in Tenang after the uprising. Who had possession of a battle flag? The events went too favorable. It's almost like the Liberation Army went into Belta knowing that Desh the chief violently slapped the desk, cutting off the secretary's words. Shut up. Listen, I don't care if you're here or not, I have plenty of replacements for you. If you won't agree, then leave this job right now. I need don't people like you who still have attachments to the former kingdom. How stupid. I'd prefer that a hundred times over writing a fabricated history. I'll be excusing myself. Good for you that you can write your fabled history then. Aim for a country that stands a thousand years. It'll be lucky to even survive a hundred. You bastard, you know what's going to happen to you right dash. Please feel free. At this age, I don't have any attachments to this world. Your threats don't scare me. Tearing and throwing away the compiled documents, 
the old secretary departed from the room. After violently closing the door, he sighed with a somber expression on his face. History is written by the winners, and so nothing will change. It's important to study from and reflect on history, and not repeat the same mistakes. Why can't that be understood? The expressions of passing officers were all cheerful. All was good and fine now, but one day, they would probably repeat the same mistakes once more. That was why an accurate history had to be written, to also leave a warning. Why didn't they understand that? They didn't try to understand. 60. Perhaps it's not that they won't change, it's that they can't change. And so they foolishly repeat their mistakes. How absolutely futile. A portrait of Altura decorated the royal palace's hall. Would nothing really change in the end? While praying that his own fears would end his needless anxiety, he gazed at the painting of their symbol of hope. During the celebratory festival, Diener had conducted a meeting with the influentials of royal capital Blanca. He was returning back to the royal palace, and nearby he had brought along his armed agents. There was a reason why it was so risky that he even had to attach guards to himself. The other day, the hideous corpse of the turncoat General Octavio was discovered. In addition, in the barracks teeming with soldiers, he was found in his office which was under strict guard. It seemed Octavio had suffered agonizing torture, and he had died a horrifying death beyond description. Diener imposed a strict gag order and searched for the criminal. But, the investigation wasn't going well. There was no human in the New Kingdom who would seem to benefit from killing Octavio now that he had lost his political power. Was it a murderer killing indiscriminately under the grips of madness? Or was there some kind of grudge? Either way, this was a worrying matter. Consequently, the guards attached to key figures of the New Kingdom were further reinforced as a precautionary measure. I don't know where that lunatic came from, but that way of killing is unlike the work of a human's. Was it the devil or sixty death? Whispered Diener, and sudden chills ran down his spine. This was the main street of the royal capital. The figures of people that had been here earlier were no longer. Late at night though it may be, it was unnatural. The taverns were still open, and there should be customers. There had even been a depressing amount of inviting prostitutes. The current situation was one that would never happen in the pleasure quarters late at night. So why? The fog deepened. Before he knew it, a heavy fog that couldn't be thought natural had sprung forth all around him. The disguised diener was wearing light clothes a merchant would wear. For weapons, he only had a dagger concealed between under his clothes. Sensing himself in peril, diener snapped his fingers, giving the signal to the agents hidden nearby. He looked around, and gave the signal once more. Someone. Respond. He tried calling out directly in a loud voice. No response. Was there no one here? Diener heightened his vigilance. In the fog in front of him, a black silhouette began to appear. It's useless. I've killed everyone. You're the only one left. A high-pitched voice like a female's addressed him. 60W, who's there? Agents, kill this person. Someone. Can't you hear me? Diener panicked and called out to the bodyguards around him. There was no response from anyone. I've killed that trash Octavio, so I thought I'd get my revenge on you afterwards. I've come all the way here, just for you. A short human silhouette appeared in the fog, and one more shadow, an inhuman monster, clad in black, tattered robes and carrying a large scythe. The girl and death's two shadows approached Diener. DD Death God, Skirazade. Why, you're still living Dash. I got something to eat again and got better. Ah, so delicious. A taste I'd never tire of no matter how many times I've had it. Come now, shall we start? Vander's gone and waiting ahead for you. V.A., Vander? Why you, don't tell me, you ate Vander? You madwoman dash. Screamed Diener in question, and Skira smiled in rejection. What I ate was a more different thing. Also, I don't eat humans. Doesn't that just sound all kinds of disgusting? Didon't he fuck with me. Return to hell, you cheater of death dash. Diener drew his dagger and pointed it at death. He couldn't die here. 60 this was the beginning. He would aid Altura, carry out a righteous regime, and make the new kingdom flourish. He didn't want to die. He was scared of dying. Wasn't this the start of where he would seize prosperity? It was for that sake he had worked and wagered his everything. He had smeared himself in filth and stuck it out to the end. Until he built the foundation, the foothold for his thousand-year kingdom, he couldn't die. There was no way he could die. Fufu Dash, your face says you really don't want to die. But, it'll be alright. I'll help you want to die. 
The thrusted, naked blade was easily intercepted by death. Diener put more strength in, desperately trying to make something happen. He clenched his teeth. I can't die yet. I will live until I build the foundation for the new kingdom. So I will dash no no. I had decided that I would to kill you. Don't think you'll die comfortably. I'll take my time, and slow wly finish you off. Cry as much as you want. You don't need to hold back K. Don't you get it? If you kill me, all the paid sacrifices up until now will be rendered worthless. If it's me, I can save several thousands, no, several tens of thousands dash silence. As if to say he was hurting her ears, she grabbed Diener's dagger, and took it away. Death dripped red blood. She stroked her prey's face with wet hands. She stabbed a knife into his shoulder. Diener screamed in pain. Gwaiaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
Influential lords also joined in their groups, and armed uprisings finally became a full-on revolution. This was the end of the temporary peace. Diamond suit diamond suit diamond suit Cyrus Castle, with black smoke rising from it. In front of a nameless tombstone covered in moss, was a lone female officer. She wasn't there to pray. She merely observed it, staring unwaveringly, and seemingly very intrigued. 61 A sorcerer wrapped in pink robes approached the female officer. Her robe had the emblem of the Star Church emblazoned on it. As her face was concealed by the hood, it was hard to tell, but her sickly pale neck peeked through. Your Excellency. You might you be looking at it. Just looking at this. I heard there was something interesting here so I've been looking for it. It seems to be my grave, this thing. The female officer took out a book and threw it to the sorcerer. Chronicles of the Liberation War was written on it. After having a look at its contents, the sorcerer hoofed in displeasure. Flames welled up from her hands and incinerated the book in a second. This kind of worthless book shouldn't exist in this world. It's a vulgar book with liberal fabrications. Please be at ease, I will put together your excellency's history one day. It would be something magnificent, glorious, and mind-boggling, she thought, but she didn't vocalize it. If she accidentally let it out, before it became famous, it would all be over before it even began. Despite being dead, you're quite hot-blooded. Is that just how it is, I wonder? Sir. That is how it is. After I've gotten this body, my brutal side has more or less increased. 61 I see, whispered the female officer, and she stood up, swung her scythe, and pulverized the gravestone. She didn't need such sham made by trash. There was something more appropriate for them after all. Your face looks quite refreshed. And with your complexion so bad too. If your excellency weren't here, I would have done it. Under her hood, she pushed up her glasses. Her lips were sharply bent. If I left it to you, even the fortress would have been blown away, so I did it. This is my treasured home after all. She brushed back her brownish hair that was longer than before and stretched. The wind was refreshing, and the sunlight warm. Good produce would surely grow. Even if they were to wither, even if they were burned to the ground, they could just plant more. You'll stay here, after the battle's end. MHM. I have to keep my promise with them. I'll make a field of potatoes that'll cover the fortress. The harvested potatoes will be enjoyed by me and my comrades. Since you're dead, I wonder if you won't partake. She made an impish smile, and the sorcerer looked sour. I am your excellency's adjutant. Of course I would love to partake. I would follow you to the ends of the earth. 61 But, the dead don't feel hungry right? I heard that long ago. No, they do. I get even more hungry because I'm dead. I know because I've died. Is that so? That's a new discovery. Then I'll give you these. She took out two walnuts from a cloth bag and handed them to the sorcerer a sorcerer of the dead. T, thank you very much. The sickly looking woman happily began rolling them in her hand with a smile on her face. If I'm not careful, you'll be rolling something else immediately. I thought I told you to stop, it's a bad habit. P please excuse me. How many times do I have to say it I wonder. A messenger clothed in black priest's robes came along to these two who were having a light-hearted conversation. Your Excellency. Preparations to sortie are in order. Got it. Tell Veloce we'll be there shortly. Sir Dash. 61 Veloce Gale lead black heavy infantry and was a female officer who had inherited her grandfather's rough disposition. She would probably have a large influence in this battle too, as the successor of the indomitable Yalder. Seeing the messenger run off, the necromancer spoke up. And so it ends, maybe. No, it only begins. The massacre of those guys of the rebel army. We'll be busy. Please leave it to me. I'll make it up to you for that time. I'm expectant. If you want, you should take command with Veloce. I'm not suited towards such things. I will decline. I feel like I excused myself before too though. Really? Can't be helped then. Her mantle fluttering, death shouldered her scythe and began calmly walking. After her followed the necromancer reverentially. And behind them, their bodies covered in black armor, marched ranks of her martyrs. Death casually looked at the sky, and a white crow was circling the top tower. A black battle flag with a white crow coat of arms triumphantly waved atop it. It seems like, there won't be a third time. Death smiled in sheer happiness. 61 The New Year's Kingdom wasn't as strong as their days in the Liberation War, and the families of the chief generals and the royal family were all killed. The bloodline of the Yuz kingdom had completely come to an end. The families of heroes too, 
chiefly Biraus and Fynn, were practically wiped out. The grandchildren of the heroes who fought for the people, were ironically killed by those very people. The armed uprising of adherents of the Star Church spread to the Empire and the Union too, and the Mundo Novo continent fell into a state much like a cauldron of hell. Conflict over hegemony broke out under the banner of the Star Church, and it became an era where rival warlords sought to expand their territory. It seemed there was still some way to go before the advent of a peaceful era. Also, in a group of the Star Believers Revolution, there was someone said to have looked like the Death God, but details are entirely unclear. It was only written down in Star Church documents that a young female general wilding a scythe in her black cavalry had made accomplishments none other could match. After obtaining control over the royal capital, it was only recorded that she and her troops disappeared somewhere. The name of the female general was not left behind. Though, a strange anecdote remained that the night before all news of them was cut off, there was a bustling celebration held in the ruins of a certain estate. 61 Death, Keeps Her Promises 61 Six Months After the Fall of the Newborn Kingdom Veloce Gale, who was ordered by the Star Church to rule the neighborhood of the city Murad, calling it a patrol, was visiting the Cyrus Fort. While being a woman, Veloce was tall and she possessed a strength which even men could not draw. Her specialty was swinging her halberd without suffering at all under the weight. With red short hair, she could not be distinguished from a woman just by one glance. In trying to show off herself, she wore long red wings at the top of the helmet. Wearing heavy silver armor on her body, her stately and dignified appearance was reminiscent of a mighty warrior from historic battles. She was 24 years old and it was reputed that she had made numerous victories in battle in the previous stellar revolution. Inheriting the valor of her grandfather and a ferocious disposition, the morale of the soldiers she led was also refined. Not knowing the person themselves, they gave her the odd name, Red Bull. Currently, she was working on reconstruction work of the deserted surrounding area, and was so busy that sleep was cut short. Where is the Honorable Skira? Her honor is likely undertaking routine farm work. She is probably in the courtyard. All right, thanks. Expressing thanks to the saluting guard, Veloce headed towards the potato field in the courtyard of Fort Cyrus. Staff Officer Dima and a group of escorting soldiers went after her. 61 The battle has ended with the new kingdom, so the state of alertness in the fortress was not the best. Your Honor Skira seems to be working hard on your potato cultivation. The staff officer Dima muttered, lifting his glasses. His tone was emotionless, making it exceptionally difficult to understand what he was thinking. There was a strong-slash-close relationship, and a common understanding between Veros and Skira. It was somehow interesting. Ah, I was told before that potatoes are grown here, and you can eat a delicious stew. I must absolutely try it. Skira's authority was just within the fortress, but this area had become a potato field as far as one could see. Insects and disease-resistant, nutritional, and fast-growing whales potatoes, as said by Skira. It seemed that the first harvest had ended and the potatoes were lined up on the dinner tables of the neighborhood's inhabitants. The taste was different, but the potatoes were what caused a large decrease in those suffering from hunger. Now what Skira was implementing was a breeding improvement for the Cyrus potatoes. For this, Skira and her aide, Katarina, worked on dubious experiments night and day, in order to improve the poor reputation of the taste, and furthermore, raise the productivity. This is brilliant. It is far more productive than pouring energy into desperate power struggles. A little more, a little more ambition, and you will be able to sing yourself as champion of the continent. Surely that is not the opinion of your honor. Or, are you trying to convince her honor Veloce? Viros is a stubborn one. Stop asking questions to which you know the answer. I'm very sorry. Six with a face of not thinking it was bad at all, Dima apologized. Scowling, Veloce continued walking. She did not think that she had the characteristic of a hero at all. But, Skira was a female officer respected by Veloce. At that point, she shook her head. It could be easily guessed what was not said. Her goals were twofold. Destruction of the newborn kingdom, as well as eating delicious food. Now, those being fulfilled, they did not bother with making a bit in a power struggle. Diamond suit diamond suit diamond suit in the fields where the muddy Skira, Katarina, and the soldiers are farming while wearing smiles. As Veloce et al. drew nearer, they seemed to notice without stopping their work. It has been a long time, Honorable Skira. When Veloce straightened her back, giving respect, Skira wore a dubious expression. I suspect that I heard those words last week. Even the week before last. And even before that. Is it only me that does not feel it has been a long time? 
Ah, even with only one, one week passing, I think that one week is completely within the classification of being a long time. Veloce explained, though mumbling, and falteringly. When observed by Skira directly from the front, she diverted her line of sight downward. Veloce. You are the true owner governing the Murad neighborhood, right? Surely, being an owner, you do not have that much free time. I am really jealous. It is not FRE free time. The busy time has passed, I am patrolling the area like this. So, it's okay if you don't come. Because Katarina and I are strengthening the defenses. Please continue your duties without worries. 62 interrupting in the middle, Skira waved her hands. Not because she was acting out of coldness, it was her commanding those that were busy to dedicate themselves to their work. Bullet and dash, but. You are busy, right? I am busy, too. The potato breeding experiments will soon succeed. They will have a sweet taste. There will be massive productivity and we will provide them to whales and medoros. You will get something in return for it. Right, you must be looking forward to it. Without needing to say, Medoros and Wales had just passed through a dogged relationship, one which was stained with blood. Recently, nothing had changed and there was pure hatred. However, through the leader Skira, who had an odd network of connections, a strange triangulated trade was established between Medoros, Cyrus, and Wales. Even though Wales and Medoros were adjacent, their relationship meant that they had a meaninglessly detoured trade, but with everyone enjoying the benefits, the volume, and flow of trade steadily expanded. When one thought of how it began with seaweed, boiled fish, and a bag of beans, there has been significant progress since then. T.H.A. that's right. Yes. That's okay. So, with that, it's all good. Ah, T.H.A. I that. That. Skira smiled, brushing it away. It was an innocent smile which one could not suspect any malice. Veloce was at a loss for words. Looking at the situation, Dima tried not to laugh and lent a helping hand. Your Honor, please don't bother yourself with Veloce. Veloce should also be honest. D. Dima. 62 Dima continued, regardless of Veloce, who had wide eyes. He straightened his star church robes and lifted his glasses. To speak frankly, Her Honor Veloce wants to look after Skira. Look after, as Skira titled her head, Dima nodded deeply. Yes. Because recently, she doesn't seem to be talking much. Her heart is not there, even if she's in Murad. I'm sorry to trouble you, but even a little. And with this being said, Veloce grasped Dima's front. Her face was bright red with blood from shame and anger. Petit Dima was stupefied from being raised into the air. He was a young 18-year-old, but was struggling helplessly. Because he was a complete civilian type, it was impossible to break out of the restraint. Oh, oh, you are. Do you understand what you are saying? It's terrible, please, wait, I'll die. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Just die. Goo, ge dash, veloce, how about you let him down? Bullet in butt. If that continues, he will die soon. Although Skira was watching, seemingly amused, she seemed to be interested in stopping it after watching Dima's face go from red to blue. Veloce hesitated, but finally 62 let go of Dima. The miserable scapegoat running away from the devil's hands, let out a great gasp while on his knees. I am sorry to show you this abominable state. To today will be one day of rest, it is okay. We have finished work for today, let us eat. When one eats something together, it is more delicious. Bulletin, but are you sure? Try some delicious Cyrus potatoes. It will be good for you stay the night here. Please do as you like. Veloce, whose eyes were watery with the words of Skira, had a shimmering face. With all smiles, she answered with delight. There was no feared warrior called the Red Bull there. Yeah yes. As you insist, I'll stay tonight. Please let me tell you various stories. I understand, don't pull. I'll get dirty. I don't mind at all. Diamond suit diamond suit diamond suit fundamentally, Veloce was similar to her grandfather. She had a simple personality and was quick to recover from anything. Because she was the type to accidentally catch on fire, an excellent steward or chief of staff was essential. Skira and Katarina thoroughly thrust her into warfare techniques so her natural abilities in that respect had a high level of refinement. In one lecture, Katarina desperately trained, but it did not bear fruit unfortunately. After her grandfather died in battle, Veloce received a life in this world. Her father tried to reaccumulate the remnants and rebuild the kingdom, but the plan failed. He was restricted and his whereabouts were unknown. 
He was probably now no longer alive. 62 Her mother died of overwork. Veloce was young and all alone in the world. After a while, Veloce was protected by Kelly Medoros, who had a close relationship with her grandfather. She left her hometown and was hidden in the distant area of Medoros. Veloce, who was awarded money from the spoils of war from the newborn kingdom, was completely confined, not interacting with the outside world at all. It was an open secret that Kelly was hiding the daughter of the House of Gale, yet the newborn kingdom did not act. Even when Medoros was away, they did not even want to look. It was limited to sending out a messenger. It was there that Katarina and Skira, who had put themselves in the Star Church appeared. While looking at Veloce and Skira running quickly to the cafeteria, Katarina murmured while being amazed. Her complexion was bad, but the pink robe was dazzling. The walnuts grasped in her right hand made a dry sound when crushed. Veloce, ah oh no, your honor Veloce was as usual. I think she does not mind the abandonment of the titles. Surely, that is not the case. The titles are a must. Is that so? If so then, please do as you like. Dima asserted. He might be viewed as callous, but he was someone who could only talk like this. Katarina was thinking of the nostalgic chief of staff. That place, you look like your father, don't you? His head was a hard one, but excellent. 62. I have not met him before so having said that, I am troubled on how to react. Your honor may be troubled, but I am not troubled at all. So, there isn't a problem. Is that so? When Dima adjusted his glasses sullenly, Katarina also proudly raised her glasses. The name of the youth was Dima Art, the nephew of the staff officer, Shidamo, who died in battle. He was Shidamo's older sister's, Madari Art, second son. Katarina thought he seemed appropriate as Veloce's staff officer and so pulled him out of the church headquarters. As expected, he was totally appropriate. The unevenness in personalities actually matched completely. The match was such that it was not a master-slave relationship. However, she concluded that she and Skira were best and resumed talking. Recently things seem weird with Veloce, so I was worried. Can we have a moment, were the titles not absolute? Dima took a jab at Katarina, who had suddenly dropped the courtesies. The person in question is not here so is it necessary to worry? Is that so? It is so. They both raised their glasses. One could not see their expressions. Veloce is concerned about that incident. 62. What incident? There were a number of evils at work she did not know, Katarina was racking her brain over what it could possibly be. In the battle to capture Cyrus, taking credit for Skira's warfare. The battle where the combined army of Wales and Medoros, led by Skira, had attacked Cyrus' fortress. The Empire, at the request of the Star Church, decided to dispatch the soldiers of the Wales area. Skira led the private army of the church. Furthermore, she had been successful in appeasing Kelly, and incorporating Medoro's military force, which was the planned attack site. Veloce had brought warriorhood and leadership and was appointed as the leader of the capture strategy. The fortress was called Shishimasaru. Its general was the son of the Liberation Wars hero, Finn. The hero, Finn Katfu, who was approaching age 60, had retired from the front lines, and his fortress was handed down to his son. Though, it was not case that he was completely retired. He was doing some defense of the fortress together with this son. Myra, who was his wife and aide-de-camp, had left this world without seeing the battle of the newborn kingdom. The granddaughter of Jelda of the Lost Nation and the son of Finn, the hero of the Liberation War. Both of them were to face each other unexpectedly, but their positions were inversely reversed. The Star Church's Union Army numbered 50,000. The garrison of the newborn kingdom was only 5,000. The newborn kingdom's troops had already been defeated in various places already, and they were trying to gather troops for battle in one last stand at the kingdom of Blanca. The Cyrus fortress was like the sacrificial stone in the game of Go, it needed to hold on for as long as possible. 62 In understanding this, Finn and his son volunteered for the defense of the fortress. If you hold on and lengthen the fight, there was a possibility that something would happen. Although they had assembled at the command of the Star Church's Pope, there were many nakedly ambitious princes. In the battle for the initiative, he did not know whether they would just kill each other. That was a slight hope of an old hero like Finn. A.H.H., are you still worried about it? That bullhead. Katarina closed one eye and was recalling whether it was that time. Surely, it was an incident which Skira was not worried about. But also, surely, Veloce would not be worried about it at all. I can recover fast, but this is still affecting me unexpectedly. Sometimes, 
I remember it and let out a deep sigh. Katarina sighed deeply, wondering why she had worried about such a thing. Character Introduction Veloce Gale 24-year-old female officer. Red short hair, tall person, the person who swings the halberd. Type to accidentally catch on fire. Favorite person is Skira. Jalda's granddaughter. The Red Bull Dima Art 18-year-old chief of staff. Black hair and petite. Entered the organization from childhood and undertook training. Pulled out by Katarina to consult for Veloce. The type who has a clean sword, is unathletic, intellectual type. Nephew of Shidamo 62 by Veloce's command, the curtain was lifted to begin the campaign against Cyrus Fortress. In the past Liberation War, it was the small fortress that had fallen in a barbarian attack. However, Veloce knew that the history recorded in the New Kingdom was terribly distorted. It was Skira who had raised her, forged her, and, until now, led her. Though she had heard the details that would not be told, Veloce knew that she was a death god. She would joke that she was, Skira's art too, but there wasn't any mistake. From the time she met her, there had been no change. In fact, it was like time had stopped. She was the female officer, who led the soldiers of the Black Flag's White Crow, swinging a large scythe with a petite body. Since day one, she had watched every battle convinced that, this person is that of the death god, Skira's art. And then, she wondered. Why is it that the people around her were never troubled by the fact that she did not age? Perhaps it was scary. That is, the heresy in the people's star church not aging is. There was also a chance that she was a real death god. Perhaps if one pointed it out directly, they would perhaps have their soul taken. 62 Although the Pope was a ceremonial position, it was still someone who had been awarded the position of the Star General. Also, she had a career history in the Inquisition panel. It would not be expected that such an excellent model person would be a heretic. So, the people that were thinking that there might be something about this that was suspicious would silence themselves. This had become something of an indulgence for Skira and no one had impeached her. Veloce did not care about the possibility that Skira was a death god, because it was she who had raised her from a state of confinement. She had made it possible to take revenge on the new kingdom, which had deprived her of family and of her own place. Also, Skira had treated her to delicious food. Death god or not, it did not matter. Skira was her savior, her leader, the master, and the companion. And, no one else was as clear as she in being family. Skira may deny this, but Veloce thought this. If it were just a thought then Skira would not care. So, in order to overcome the grudges she held, Veloce stood over at the head of the unit and issued the commands. Destroy the wall with rocks. Strike the castle soldiers down with arrows. Attack, attack, attack. Fight like the fury of a flame and do not leave them anywhere to rest. Veloce, a little before and we will keep the arrows flowing. Don't you think that if they land behind the soldiers, the soldiers will just come to you? She roared at the stationary soldiers and swung her halberd around, dispelling the incoming arrows. Staff Officer Dima held a massive shield from the side. The moat was deep and the drawbridge had been raised. On the castle walls, archers were lining up and standing. The response to the arrows was returned before they began groaning rock attacks on the fortress. Six it was not intended that they be overly forceful. The purpose was to continue a heavy attack and lower the morale and energy of the defenders. Switch to a full attack at the moment the enemy's energy is drained, and then make the fortress fall in one stroke. It was the chief of staff Dima's opinion that their military power was more than sufficient and that regular tactics were to be used, Veloce also had no objection to this. On the other side, the newborn kingdom officer, Mizaru Katfu, who was caught in Cyrus' fortress saw that the offensive was without coalition forces and realized that his fate was sealed. The enemy was still and only its leader was attacking. In any case, the defending soldiers had their own battle. After a few days, the main army would arrive and there would most likely be another attack. This is repeating history, but this is so early on. This is not up to name and the way of the lion. As Mizaru smiled ironically, he pulled out the map, destroyed it immediately, and threw it away. It was meaningless to look back or turn the battle. This battle was a defeat. The circumstances of the new kingdom could only be said to be miserable. Under the direction of the Star Church, the churches arose together. Riding this wave, the major powers, who were dissatisfied by the new kingdom, rallied and participated in the war. It went without saying that their real hearts leaned more towards ambition than real faith. In particular, the Star Church's Imperial Army from the West and the Star Church Union Army from the South invaded. The reason the various countries dispatched troops was that, 
other than incurring the wrath of the Star Church, they would be unable to bear the fire at their feet. The empires would have fear in their hearts. As a result of the continued puppetization of the New Kingdom, the sleeping monsters had opened their eyes. They were unaware that by being imprisoned by their fears and lending power to the astrologists, they were shortening their own lives. 63 After the collapse of the New Kingdom, it was expected that, under the management of the Star Church, divisional governance between the princes would occur. It was an era of competition and arrogance over hegemony. This only went to propagate empires and commonwealths. Because the members participating in this battle could unfortunately remember the taste of victory. Troubled times would return again. Mizaru was sure of this. Mizaru. We are not defeated. The castle soldiers are still in high spirits and we will boldly take a stand. We shall not give up. While looking at the responsible staff officers, Mizaru spoke, deriding himself. It is true. You also understand, right? It is now impossible to recover. There wouldn't be any difficulty if you could win a battle with only enthusiasm and spirit. Of course, the gates of the fortress had not been toppled just yet. But this was only a matter of time. There would be not reinforcements here, only enemies. It was a joke that they had not already been defeated and yet not one to laugh about. Pride did not even allow talking of defeat. His heroic father would not allow this. But in the first place, it was unknown whether Mizaru would be allowed to surrender. The former liberation war was the completely opposite of this. Just how will this be painted in the histories? If I can help it, I will not allow myself to be mentioned as a coward. The victors write the histories. The victors are always right. All of the blemishes are taken on by those who were defeated. This time, it would they, themselves, who would taste this. Sweet liqueur for the victors, and sour acid for the losers. It may be fortunate that his father could taste this once in a lifetime, in some sense. 63 To think about it, the 28 years of Mizaru's life was as his father said it would be. Because he thought it is natural. The words of a hero were the truth. His foolish self should have acted accordingly. Thinking of death, Mizaru wanted to try to out himself. He thought that it would be better to do as he wished at the very end. He was not scared of death, but it was somehow unacceptable to be crushed meaninglessly. According to the information of the scouts Veloce Gale led the attacking side. The bloodline of the general Yarida who had taken the name Indomitable in the past kingdom. As an opponent, there was nothing lacking. Staff officer. Take this scroll to the enemy for me. A.H.H., father's endorsement is not necessary now. After the quick writing by the general Yarida, he handed the scroll to the staff officer. However, if his honor Finn does not agree with this. The commander of this fortress is me. The commander of the lion's cavalry is myself. I am not my father's puppet. Surely, there is no care about letting me through at the very end. A first and last request. Affirmative. I will deliver this right away. Bowing his head reverently, the staff officer took leave. In the room, only Mizaru remained. As expected, he was realizing that there was nothing he could do. As expected, the contents of the scroll was confirmed. It did not matter either way how he would fall. There was no chance of it being handed over to his father. All right, I would be happy to ride, but, either way, is this the end? 63 Mizaru leaned deeply into the chair and looked at the ceiling, and as if to expel his burdens, he sighed heavily. At the Star Church Union Army headquarters, Dima, who received the messenger's report, was visiting. His expression was unusually severe. It was because the person in front of him had made a less than optimum choice. He wanted to scrunch up the report, but that would be an unauthorized conduct. It was not a good thing for a staff officer to do. After a little while, he began to speak with Veloce, who was watching at the front face of the fortress with a stern gaze. Veloce. What is it, Dima? A scroll has arrived from the commander of Cyrus Fortress, General Mizaru. Would you like to examine it? An offer of surrender? If it is unconditional then, I do not mind, we can accept. If it is anything other than that then, rebuff it. Ah, it is not that, it is a request for a duel with your honor Veloce. Veloce took the scroll away from Dima and ran her eyes up and down over the contents to confirm it. As if to show excitement, her face gradually began to redden. The letter was as followed. The General Mizaru of the New Kingdom, in charge of the defense of the Cyrus Fortress, had challenged Lord Veloce Jera to a duel. A fair and square, one-on-one -on -one battle was requested. Betting on the honor of the family name and swearing not to use any sneaky tricks or traps. 63 In the event of Veloce's victory, 
the fortress would be surrendered, but also that, for a moment, all of the soldiers other than himself would be allowed to leave the fortress. In the event of Veloce being defeated, it was promised that the gates of the fortress would be opened immediately and the soldiers would surrender and disarm. He was aware that there really was no benefit for the dominant party in this, but he expected a positive reply from the perspective of a soldier. It was actually a completely unreasonable proposal. So much so that Dima was thinking about destroying it the minute he read it. The idea knew no higher level of stupidity, that is, with two large armies facing on against each other, the two leaders settle the fight by doing battle with one another. Furthermore, there were the dominant party, and in circumstances they were expected to have a victory anyway, it was not necessary to entertain this invitation. That is, from the perspective of an average person's thoughts. They are had known each other for ten years. It was easy to predict what this woman would say next. I want to accept these terms. I could not hear you properly. Excuse me, can you please repeat that one more time? I said I want to accept the challenge to a duel. Whether I win or lose, the fortress will fall. There is no problem. There's no need to spill any further blood needlessly. Dimmer rubbed his eyes without thinking and looked up at the sky. He had been thinking this was stupid, but this was just crazy. There was not any guarantee that the opponent would stick to the promises made. 63 In the case of Veloce being vanquished, the morale of the enemy would be increased. In the event that the promises were not kept then, there would be added labor and time toppling the fortress. On the other hand, even if Misera were to be vanquished, it would be of no significance if the enemy simply closed the gates to the fortress. Because the hero, Finn from the Liberation War, was in the fortress. That he would simply surrender was unthinkable. Please explain to me. There appears to be no guarantee that the enemy shall keep to the expectations. We must ignore this and continue the assault. We have ten times the strength of their troops. And, at any moment, we will be able to attack. Therefore, I must accept this. In order to avoid dishonoring the name of, the Indomitable, we can only do battle now. While he was self-confident and assertive, Dima was not able to understand it all. He knew that Veloce held her family names Honor. But that was different from this. If he stated his opinion as the staff officer, it would only be foolish and foolhardy. But he could understand that if he was an officer, he would possibly feel the same. In any case, it would be impossible to change her mind. There was no stopping this woman, when she said something once she would do it. Like a bull which has just seen something red, she would charge through no matter where it was. It was her charm but also her biggest weakness. Because of this, Dima served Veloce. Is there any room for you to reconsider this? None. Specify the date and time here. At noon on the following day, take this to the front of the fortress and convey the message. What is the reply, Dima? 63 Affirmative. Leave everything to me. With the sound of her armor rubbing against itself, Veloce left. She was likely going to go prepare for the soon-to-be-held duel. In the event that the best-case proposal was rejected, the staff officer need to implement the next best course of action. Dima shook his head, and with heavy footsteps, he headed for the magician with the bad complexion. If it was for Veloce, he would use anything. That was Dima's fundamental policy. The next day, Katarina, who had received Dima's report, appeared before Veloce. When the hood-wearing pink magician shuffled in, she slapped Veloce across the face with a flash of light. A dry sound reverberated and, for a moment, the usually straight-standing Veloce's knees quivered. She had lost consciousness a bit with the strike. Why what the hell? That is for taking a unilateral decision. A whip would be more effective for a bull than words would be, right? If it is useless to use words then from the beginning it would be better to make you understand by the body. Ka Sergeant Katarina. Do not treat a human as a beast. She powerfully grabbed Veloce's chin and drew her face nearer. One would expect that Veloce would surpass her in strength, but she could not move. It was like a frog being caught by a snake, she could not move her limbs. The blue face was issued a command from Katarina's strangely glossy lips. 63 Hey, bullhead. It can't be helped it if it's like this. If you break the promises, this will reverberate back to the morale of our army. You must win. Even if you die, you must win. You do not need to worry about being vanquished. We will raise your body for eternity until it decays. Okay. You must not dirty Skira's name. Katarina was murmuring terrible things with her tongue lashing out like a snake. This woman was really capable of doing anything. Since childhood during the training, she had been killed. Skira did not care, but she was fundamentally gentle. 
Even if one failed at something, she would forgive you. But this girl was different. She was really a demon. Veloce was recollecting the trauma, but was just holding on. For she was now the commander. She was not allowed to be afraid. Of of course. EY I will win. Bullheads have a difficult time understanding difficult things so just do one thing. Whatever happens concentrate on the fight. Do not take your eyes off the enemy. Right so, do you understand? Yes. Your voice is too low. Say it from the bottom of your gut loudly. Affirmative. I will not take my eyes off the enemy. Okay good. And do your best. Skira also said this. Yes. I will give it all my might. Veloce breathed out of both cheeks and tried to set her mood back to normal. Seeing this, Katarina wrung her neck and left through the awning. The actual duel would take place at the halfway mark. 63 but, there was the possibility of a spear entering from the side. From the fortress, they would be easy targets for a well-aimed bow. Fortunately, there was a mountain of fresh bodies within the fortress. Katarina, with a casual gesture, plucked out some cane from the grasses, when she cast the eyes spell, the bodies just buried in the fortress reacted. Although they were a far distance away, it was easy to operate it even with 100 proxies. As the necromancer distorted her mouth, in slow motion, they began to walk. It was three hours until the battle. Front of the Cyrus Fortress gates. Both armies were watching as Veloce of the Star Church and Miseru of the New Kingdom faced off. Riding a horse and closing the distance between them, Miseru began speaking. My sincere gratitude for accepting my selfish offer. I have given the order that in the event of myself falling, the soldiers will lay down their weapons and surrender. This promise will without fail be executed. And if you win, is it okay? We give no guarantee that we will unfold asterisk the siege. Wanting that much is greedy. I am already satisfied with having had enjoyed such a sunny stage for this battle. With all of the public watching on, I can fight as a warrior. For a warrior, there is surely no greater stage. Certainly, that must be so, shall we begin? As Veloce spoke, Miseru nodded. 63 I am Miseru Katfu. I have received the lion's power from my father, I am about to show this to you. He raised a spear high to make the fortress behind him tremble with pride and screamed his name. The defending soldiers of the new kingdom were screaming out. Veloce responded to this, continuing. I am Veloce Gale. I am Veloce of the Red Bull. Let us begin. With the horse kicking, Veloce rushed towards Miseru, clutching her weapon. The red feathers of the helmet she wore were streaming in the wind. Miseru, who was meeting her, rotated his spear and raised his anticipation. The momentum-driven spear and the halberd crossed paths and there was a dull noise that reverberated. The fierce abilities of both sides had begun their battle. The defense was back and forth. The horse was driven, counting dozens. The place where this would be one could not be seen. When a spear was thrust forward, it was meet with a forceful throw-off. The halberd was thrust up and driven down in a groaning attack. Miseru dodged with the spear missing by a paper-thin distance, and the fierce battle began again. The fight of all fights between two great military names unfolded with the two armies looking on. Ten soldiers watched their battle coldly from the castle walls. It was not Miseru, it were the soldiers who reported directly to Finn. They were selected as the guards specifically because of their excellence in archery. Their loyalty was unshakable and they were excellent soldiers who would execute whatever the command of Finn fully. Six they had one order from Finn. Close the gap, and shoot the enemy general. They were told that even if Miseru was involved, he did not care. Finn had decided that Miseru's proposal to do battle was foolish and, in the end, opposed. But when Miseru went forward with it, he coldly told him to do whatever he wanted and directed the soldiers to take up defensive positions. At the same time, Although Finn had decided to forsake his own legitimate child, Miseru had not noticed. The only one that Finn loved was his wife, Myra. After she had left this world, Miseru was less like a son and more like an underling, he consciously put space between them. They had not talked of family matters in many years. It was impossible to admit that Miseru, who was inferior to himself in every respect, was his heir. This was because of a strong sense of confidence that the Lion General's glory was something which had been built up by himself. Take care. Fire at the time of the signal. The most well-trained sniper in the team took command. In order to execute the command of Finn, he aimed for both of the pair doing battle to the death. Because the pair were changing position so much, it was difficult to aim. However, closing one eye and sharpening the nerve, the skilled archers slowly took the iron arrows. 
There was a great deal of wind resistance, but the arrows had a weight about them that would carry. If an arrow painted with poison was hit directly, it would be a gem that would surely take her life. He powerfully drew the strongly tightened string back and trained his sight. With a great breath, when his tightly held right arm was released, his eyes widened for a moment. 64 Just as one thought that the corpses behind the archers came, a white light exploded. The screeching violent noise was tremendous and whether one was inside or outside the fortress, everyone was paying attention. Was just instinctive. That is, except for one person. Not taking the short moment that had been set upon everyone else, Veloce's spear had made contact deep in Misera's flank. The blade had destroyed the armor, ripped through the hardened flesh and made it to the internal organs. While letting out a cry of agony, Misera fell from the horse bleeding. Deception. EY dash, I am, aft after all. Mother. Veloce adjusted her breathing and wiped the blood away from her weapon. Dismounting, she drew nearer to the suffering Miseru. Do you have any last words? Ho oh, how, a soldier's dusty dash, the promise will be kept without fail. Skira would definitely keep the promise. So Veloce would as well. Miseru squeaked some words of gratitude and closed his eyes. After assisting his suicide, Veloce bowed. After this, she raised her spear, winning a great victory. General Miseru has been defeated by Veloce. We have won. 64 There was a cry all around from the soldiers of the unified army. Veloce had prevailed over a strong opponent, like a fairy tale battle. Everyone felt that a new hero had been given birth to. The soldiers in the Cyrus fortress had done as Miseru had said, they disarmed, and one could not even see any semblance of resistance to this. With the great event of the slaughtering of the Lion General, the war weariness set in and the battle was completely lost. Veloce did as she had promised and spared the lives of the castle soldiers. Katarina wanted to gouge their eyes out but held back. She and Veloce had to keep the promise. Because that was Skira's creed. The figure of the aged Finkatfa was soon dazzling itself away from Cyrus' fortress. In castles and fortresses, there existed things called, secret passages. They were made for special circumstances so that the nobility and high-ranking officers would be able to escape. The lower-ranking officers and soldiers did not know the existence of these, and even then, they were cleverly disguised. The passageways were narrow so only a few could move at best. However, in the historical records, the actual usage of these being recorded were few in number. But it was unknown whether they had an honorable death or whether they knew about the passageways. The General Finn was running the whole way through the narrow and dankly lit passageway. 64 He left behind his favorite horse of many years. There were more than 30 accompanying soldiers and seniors. Finn had not perished yet. He was sure that he still had a chance. For he was the hero of the Great Liberation War. He was one of the specialist soldiers who had achieved the liberation of the capital. Even if the new kingdom were to fall apart, he would grace those troubled times. As long as he was living, there was a possibility to come back again. Covered in sludge, Finn wiped away his sweat and continued to run into the darkness. While drawing near to the end of a passage which one would think went for eternity, twilight was leaking from a massive door that had absolutely no evidence of use for many years. Finn applied force and busted open the rusted door. With both hands in the lead, he sprung out. Finn appeared out of the door first. The armor on his body was miserably drenched in sweat. The surroundings were headed by the red feathered helmet wearing leader of the cavalry. One hundred black cavalry soldiers and one thousand troops were surrounding them. The banners of the three-starred star church flag and the black flag with the white crow were proudly standing alongside. The red feathered general advanced and began speaking to Finn. I had a hunch. That is, with you throwing your own son and the lower ranking soldiers down, where could the lion have gone? 64 to try to extend the conversation and find some kind of breakthrough plan. Why, do you know this road? There are only a few people who know this road. Because I was at this fortress 30 years ago. But no one used it. Everyone died. There was not one man that ran as everyone died at that place. It was still daytime but the visibility was becoming bad. Foggy cloud-like things were gathering. The soldiers of the church were in awe, but the black cavalry did not startle that easily. I will not engage. You have not seen such age. From where did you hear that story? I saw it. The burned debris of the wasted, liberation army. The ashes of my subordinates were scattered like mere potato ash. And when I remember it, it makes me angry. So, I will not allow you all to get away. The female officer violently smiled, exposing a great viciousness. 
It was almost like she was going to sink her fangs in the victim. W.A. Wait. Damn you. As his last words, Finn learned about the deceased. They tried to remind him of something engraved. The old wounds on his back burned with pain. You all are, more rotten than I ever could be. You are the one that took away my last meal. I will not ever, I will not ever allow this. Finn stared at the female officer in front of him with an expression of shock. She looked at this with a ferocious grin. 64 that stature and that weapon, with a face unchanged from that time. This was no mistake, this was that girl. De death god Skira? This is stupid. Did you finally remember? De death god, but you are surely dead. But you were torn apart. How can you be here now then? Without answering Finn's question, the death god pleasantly declared. Surely at that time you were too busy to care. Now, let us continue it here. Do not worry, it will be okay. I give my opponents the chance to fight on foot. To not do so would be unfair. The dismounted death god waved the sickle overhead, and with a murderous intention, she directed the sharp point towards Finn. By all means great as a death god. What you did to me was the last of the last choices that you will mistakenly make. Finn gazed the surroundings while grasping a spear. As far as he could gaze were the opposing soldiers. To retire would be hell, and to return would be hell. No, perhaps soon he would be dying. This could be a hallucination. Perhaps he could have achieved an honorable death within the fortress. The death god, imprisoned by hate, appeared to be dragging herself. 64 What had happened to his son Mizaru? He abandoned the thought, he only cared about the stupidity of right now. If Myra saw this, what would she say? After making a dry laugh, Finn prepared himself for the inevitable, and his spear faced the death god. It okay, I am a pathetic ghost encased in hate. This Finn will give me guidance. While great things are said, your arms and legs are trembling. Shoo shut up. I will stab just you with this spear. Finn started to shake the spear with the power of his whole body. You would think the handling of the spear was as sharp as his heyday, and it was intense. But he did not hit the death god. The death god stopped all of the spear attacks, repelled and shook them off. Gradually, Finn began to tire. His breathing became heavy and the rhythm of his attacks became erratic. As his legs became sluggish, there was a blow to the abdomen with the sickle of the death god. The core of his body sustained heavy and intense damage from the top of the armor. Finn's movement stopped. It seemed like he was standing up only by leaning on the spear. Ah, ah, shit. Why don't you come and attack? As time passed there would be an attack. He knew clearly that it would come. Finn could not stand this. I thought I would kill when lion's fangs were shattered. Until then, you can scratch all you like. Because I will receive it all. But, I will definitely be killing you. 64 The death god distorted her mouth and Finn's heart was broken. This was just the case of a meat-eating beasts watching themselves devour their prey. As he spat out congealed blood, Finn threw away his spear. Finn's subordinates were covering their mouths, trying to hold back their impending screams. This was high tide. He did not want to even think about how he would be received in the coming ages in the written histories. Kill me. But, remember death god. Someday, it will come when you receive your reward. This is certain. This was the same for us, and it will be the same for you. I know enough about such that I disagree. That is why I am doing this. Wah wah. All right, goodbye. As the girl smiled, two death gods appeared from behind. Their skull faces distorted and they cackled. On the sight of this, Finn doubted his own eyes and even his sanity. He hurriedly closed his eyes, then slowly letting in the light, there was an innocent smile of girl. That was the last thing Finn ever saw. The death god, as though putting on a performance, waved their three sickles and ran them across Finn's body. In one go, blood rose, and the left and right arms, both legs, torso and neck went flying. The upper and lower body were cut apart and the remaining armor and meat mixed into something unrecognizable. In an instant, the split apart Finn's agonizing screams were silenced 64 in the white fog, a crimson fog rose and gathered, as if to aim at the head, the blade of the sickle slashed. As they raised it high, the young girl looked over the black cavalry and called out. General Finn, has been vanquished by the Red Bull Veloce. In the middle of the deep fog, the Death God cavalry raised their voices, in celebration of the victory of their lord. The people watching over Skira's troops recognized that Veloce had vanquished Finn. Throwing away the red feathered helmet, Skira wiped the blood away from her face. A-H-H, I am hungry. Well done, honorable Skira. Thank you very much. 
Skira happily threw a candy into her mouth that Katarina gave to the cavalry. Diamond suit diamond suit diamond suit extra, there is a possibility that the image may be destroyed. It is from that time. That is, that Veloce became known as the the Red Bull. Although she seems to have wanted to be called, the Red Feather. Dima complained to Katarina without thinking. Veloce, who did not wish to be called a wild boar, went to the trouble of wearing a special red feathered helmet. Though she said it felt great with the red feathers, it was regrettable that it became such that she was called the Red Bull. The Red Bull suits you more. With that simple bullhead, Skira's observation is truly remarkable. 64 Veloce, who had vanquished both of the Lion Generals. Initially, both, the Red Feathers and the Red Bull names were used but, after a while, the Red Bull had completely been destroyed. But it was mainly the nature of the person in question that was the cause. When Katarina asked Skira why the name Red Bull, the reason was that beef is delicious was the answer. A convinced Katarina nodded many times saying, her honor Skira as usual. By the way, why did Skira give Veloce that name, at that time? Because of that, Veloce is troubled. No matter how much it is denied, there is a great deal of humility from those around. Ah, I do not know. But, her honor is not troubled at all. What Skira wanted was the Cyrus Fortress. So it was not necessary to have the merits above. Why did she allow Veloce to have the credit? Katarina did not understand. Perhaps it was a repayment to Yuruda? Perhaps it was just on a whim? Whichever it was, Veloce acquired a new name and the Desianur that covered the House of Gale was completely dispelled. Please allow me to ask one more question. Just how old are Her Honor Skira and Katarina? Her Honor is 17. I am 24. Katarina reacted immediately, touching her glasses. The other day the answer was 18 and 25. Why did you reduce an age by one year? Please let me ask. That time was that time. What is important is now. Without looking back on the past. It might be thought that she was saying something good, but actually she was just mingling. 6. Of course Dima was worried about the fact that Skira and Katarina were not aging. Even though it was asked, it was carried away. Anyway, because it could turn out to be troublesome, he wanted to think of an excuse in advance, but the principals could really do nothing. Dima exercised postponement, throwing out troublesome things for the time being. Is that so? If so for now, I am fine. So next, I would like to ask something, Dima. Please ask me. I will not hide anything. Will you tell me when you and Veloce are getting married? Hearing Katarina's sudden words, Dima choked violently. In tune with this, his glasses fell. Katarina was peeking at Dima, who had a miserable smile, from under the pink robes. He had the eyes of the hunted. You are that upset about it. Ka Katarina, what are you saying? Dima refuted it, biting down. The usually pale face was turning crimson. A cold sweat went down his back. The usual calm demeanor was gone and an aged expression peeked out. I know that there is a fool having an inappropriate relationship with a superior. How, is it me? Because what she had actually been stating was the reality, his voice could only raise as he spoke. Dima and Veloce had indeed a deep relationship. 65 it was progressing from the start. Training together. Having the same feeling. Comfort being together. The mistakes of youth. But now however, they were always careful to make sure no one knew about the standing they had with each other. Why had they played with this demon? Using necromancy, I made a rat lurk in Veloce's bedroom. I made it so that I could see anything the rat could see and saw everything from beginning to end. I was so envious. I collected everything I saw and wrote it down in a document to read later and confirm. Ah, ah but dash, there are rumors spreading. Not just in Cyrus, in Murat and beyond. Where is the source of this are you rumor? I will pummel them. The source of the rumor is me. Katarina let out a cackling laugh and Dima was scratching his head. Ah, ah. So, the inappropriate staff officer Dima Art. When will you have the wedding? The honorable Skira will likely be looking forward to it. With an all-you-can-eat buffet. I am already making the invitations with great excitement. As she handed Skira's invitation from her bosom, all before Dima became dark. It was not something that could be done overnight. Yo you are an idiot. By the way, Veloce looks like your mother. The personality and conduct are exactly the same, does Dima have a special fetish? Do you? Katarina added a particularly stopping blow to the now burning white Dima. She was rotating a walnut with a demonic smile. 65 Mama's boy Dima's mother was Madari Art. She was a brave woman, 
who was Katarina's swordsmanship instructor. Mattery and Veloce's figure were not really the same, but they were similar in that they had simple personalities and both did not think before doing anything. After this, the unforgiving torture of the necromancer lasted another hour. Needless to say, Veloce was the next recipient of this treatment. Because this is a gaten the settings are hidden. Dima, Dima, hidden Oedipus complex, closet pervert. Veloce, very big herself so loves small things. Katarina, demon, the red feathers, is the name that Veloce did her best to think of. For that reason, she displayed the beautiful feathers on the helmet. Although she thought that that name was good, instead and after a while people called her the Red Bull. 65 One day five years after the Liberation War, Katarina received a vacation from Skira and visited a village. This village Morito village, was more like a small collection of people in a settlement to the east of Tenen city. It was the starting place of the so-called, slaughter of Tenen, and, because all of the residents had died, it was becoming ruins while not experiencing any kind of reconstruction. It had become a den of thieves, when one approached they would be afflicted by disease, where the decaying dead were making strides around, these were the rumors that were floating around and so there were absolutely no people that would approach Morito. Around the time when day turned to night, Katarina arrived at her intended destination. Tying the horse properly to a tree, she took out her cane and held a strong stance of alertedness. In front of the entrance to the village, there was a woman probably in her forties, sitting in a small chair. Furthermore, keeping an eye out and looking around, she was holding a spear like something kind of armed guard. In the middle of the dim light, there was the sound of the armor reverberating. That armor was not altogether and some parts of it were damaged. It could be thought that she was the commander, but she was out of her depth. With a momentary sigh, Katarina faced the entrance of the village. Welcome. This is Morito village. There is not much here, but please take your time. 65 The woman who seemed like a good person spoke with a smile, which was the way in which Katarina responded. Good evening. I am Katarina from the Star Church and a hearing officer under authority of the Inquisition Bureau. I would like to meet the person in charge of this village, if possible. The woman did not answer the request and simply continued to carry the smile on her face. More than ten seconds passed before, the woman repeated the words once more. Welcome. This is Morito Village. There is not much here, but please take your time. Katarina pulled down her hood and the woman looked over her with a cold gaze. She extended her hand towards the woman, but there was not really any response. When she touched the cheeks of the woman, it was horribly cold and she could not feel her body temperature. Welcome. This is Morito Village. There is not much here, but please take your time. Katarina left the place behind and continued into the middle of the village. Behind her, the greeting person continued to extend her welcome, and the woman's crazy voice could be heard. In the middle of the village, there was a strange sight that was spreading. The children were playing and the farmers were cultivating small fields, the old women were drawing water out of the well with a blossoming conversation about the world going on. With one glance, it was a sight like something out of a beautifully painted picture of peace, but all of the homes around were completely routed out. The farmers' huts were all covered in burned ash. The fields were desolate and the farmers dug one part of the field with a hoe. In the middle, only the children were aware of Katarina's presence and in a ruffled manner they ran into the middle of the buildings. 65 This was a place where long ago people had devoted their faith to the star gods. Now, the star cross was expelled and instead some bizarre three emblems were engraved. One was a skull. One was a humanoid figure. One more, was a headless humanoid figure. Katarina did not understand what significance these symbols bore. As Katarina opened the door, she could see the scene of the children guessing. A little earlier, the wives were different and one could sense the humanity. One could say a kind of sign of the living. A-H-H, excuse me you all, when Katarina raised her voice, they turned and ran as fast as they could. Somehow, it seemed like they have been frightened. Without any help, she opened the half-destroyed door and entered the church. The middle was exceptionally dim in terms of the light and just a single candle was burning. It was not the same sense as the other desolate houses. It had a kind of relative beauty to it. It was such that a person would be able to live in this place. Probably the children that she had seen before sometimes slept in this church. It was not a rare thing for orphans to make their home in ruins. When Katarina continued further into the middle of the church, a single woman was sitting in front of a statue of the god. In this place, the light of candles did not continue. So, Katarina was not aware of the existence of the woman. In the face of the statue the woman was gazing over, there was a rusty blade sticking outwards. Welcome. 
This is Morudo village. Go dash, go dash, you know this place well. Remarkable, Katarina. 65. My self-righteous mother, who had a bad personality, taught me. She said that a woman who had a different soul would do abnormal things in a wasted village. Ah, excuse me. This place is not a wasted village. This is a paradise that I built with my heart and soul. I will continue to build it up. The women continued to smile. This person was the reason for the visit to this place. Her name was Necromancer Edelweiss. Long ago, in Katarina's hometown, she was the hero that rescued Art Village and pulled the strings of 1,000 dead bodies. That there was a honest person who had called Katarina back to this world. In order to ask of your perpetuity, you have come to this remote place, haven't you? But, first, thanks should be given for assisting at Cyrus. Katarina extended her courtesies. In the battle for the defense of the Cyrus Fortress, it was Adele who had rescued her at the dead ground. The reason she was able to meet Skira again was that, even though they had not asked for it, they had been helped. It is fine. I need no reason to help my sister-in-law. Is that not correct? Adele spoke with kindness. Katarina did not respond to this. Favor, hatred, appreciation, and murderous intent. In regards to this woman, she held a complex mixture of emotions and feelings. So, my beloved Katarina, you have come here to pay some respects to me. If so, I am very pleased. The woman flicked her finger and an elderly butler-esque type of person brought along drinks for two. It was not alcohol, it seemed like tea. I am fine thanks I don't need it. You are not allowed to refuse. These are tea leaves the children have picked for us. It is very delicious. Please drink this for me without fail. The elderly senior with empty eyes forcefully pushed Katarina to drink the cup. The more she resisted the further she pushed. 65 without anything she could do, she accepted it and drank it in one go. The astringent taste and sweet flavor harmonized with each other, which made it delicious. Delicious isn't it? Yes it is. Katarina drank up in one go and resolved to raise the matter at hand. She did not want to linger in this insane place. This village was stingy. She was not able to understand living with dead people. Even her who was aware of her own craziness could not comprehend it. She did not want to be in a place she did not understand. Necromancer Adele. Heresy Investigator Katarina commands you. Hand over all of the magic scrolls that Heretic Rasunubsu left here. She held the cane towards the Adele but the blood-haired witch did not flinch and maintained a smile. Those clothes were not the pink color that she loved but were black cloth. A-H-H, brilliant. Katarina has become one of the heresy investigators. Becoming this important, your father would be proud if he could see this, surely. Because fortunes are good, hand over Rasu's diary and all of the magic scrolls now. Just because I am asking, you should do it. You know what you are holding here. A-H-H. Yes that is so. I do have them, don't I? Even though I was informed, you fell on a foreign road and it fell into the contradicted hands of the necromancer. Really, like father like daughter. This is surely not the place to speak meekly of people. That is so, isn't it? But why that thing only now? A-H-H, yes. I wonder maybe you have felt the limits of self-study. From the standpoint of, the study and execution of necromancy standing out. You want to be more useful for your darling Skira. So with 65 that, you would like to request the research achievements of your subordinate and great father. I get it now, very cute. Adele laughed at the thought of Rasu hearing this and shading tears laughing. Katarina, having been made fun of and angry with the fact that Skira's name had been brought into this, had a face growing red. If you do not want to be struck out to the church as a heretic, be quick, and dash, I don't care. Get it over with now. I will even give you something else. I no longer need it anyway. What? I decide my own way of living myself. So, please do as you wish. Ah. When the surprised Katarina turned around, a person with masked robe was standing directly behind her. There was not just one person. There were perhaps about ten people. All were wearing a white mask and were standing without any movement. It is okay to be bloodthirsty, but I am cautious around necromancers. Although you are apprentice, just before being an actual necromancer. You until now have died a 100 times. As your sister-in-law I am sad, so please devote yourself more. Whatever happens, you do not have the intention to go and help. Shut up. As the annoyed Katarina dispelled the people behind her without any power, and they collapsed. In tune with this the mask was removed. The face that appeared was one familiar to Katarina. 
It was the person who had her mother's name, the hero art. A woman with a failed personality. Do not do anything violent. If you break something I can make is better but it will surely take time and effort. 65 T- dash, This. Recently, just like your father, been keen on making dolls. With a hidden soul it is just like the real person. Of course, because humans are different, they cannot really move that easily. I have to develop it more. The group with the robes pulled off their masks. Adele herself and close friends appeared. In the middle, was a version of Katarina when she was a child, and the figure of her now without father. With the clam expressions that were present at a time when he had not fallen off the beaten track. This is crazy. Not just dead people being alive but, dolls. Katarina's trembling hands touched her glasses. It was not just fear. Before her own eyes the childhood version of herself. The childhood Katarina. It was that elaborately detailed that one would not be able to tell the difference with the real thing. Thank you for your care. However, my mental state is good. It is not the case that I particularly enjoy living with dead people. It is only me that can defend this place. I cannot always be keeping an eye out. So, I just use the dead people. I even spread strange rumors. In order to make people not come close. With this atmosphere, all of the outlaws could be well managed. So, what is with the departed dolls? It is simply an act of compensation. This is peculiar to the necromancers. Even you understand this surely. Or, maybe you are pretending to not know. Surely, you do not use pretty and convenient words like, I want to see them return to living, dot. Adele had lonely laughed. Just what Katarina had been thinking, she turned away unconsciously. When necromancers use extraneous means, a certain desires arise. If there is a person close to them, this will become even more. There is a power in me that can perform this. AHH, the winning percentage is low but, if I guess it is around 20%. Because that kid is cheerful. So, yeah. I made the decision to retire quietly in that village. 6 Yes yes, the children outside are actual humans. They are just war orphans. There is no need to perform magic on this. When they become adults they can go and live as they please. Me also, will go on living as I please. This village is the one place where humans, dolls, and dead people can all together exist. My teacher, Russo's techniques will forever continue to live here. And, no one at all will ever be able to disturb it. Adele continued to talk about ideals indiscriminately. The New Kingdom, the Star Church, robbers, this woman maybe holds some special feelings toward Rissa. At this point it was not known. Nor, did she even want to know. At the village targeted, so you become a god. Does that person know? It was possible that they did know. Decide your own way of living by yourself. It was that woman's habit. While I am not angry, get out of here. When I look at you, I almost vomit. You are a good kid so, if the matter is done, get out of here. Adele held her face with one hand. The particular desires of the necromancer were beginning to come out. Katarina decided to leave obediently. All right then, I am going. Mrs. Adele, take care. A-H-H Katarina, if it is okay, no I thought and it is okay. After ten years, I would be happy if you came here to check what has become of this village. What has become of my dream and so on. If no one comes to see I will be a little bit sad. Adele clutched her breast and coughed violently. She could not see well in the dark but her complexion was horribly bad. Katarina had tried to approach, but the dolls surrounded her and blocked it. Farewell, my cute, sister. The childhood Katarina took Katarina by the hand and pulled very violently, and brought her towards the exit. The entrance to the village and the star church. From 66 the world of dreams, Katarina was thrust out. The young Katarina, the guide for the way out, waved a little and returned again back to the church. Welcome. This is Moruto village. There is no much here, but please take your time at the entrance without any care the woman was greeting the visitors of the village. After three years, in order to overcome the desires of the necromancer, and so it can be used very long, she trust her blade deep into her chest. Diamond suit diamond suit diamond suit one day at the Cyrus fortress. Shara, who had finished the daily field work was looking forward to a meal in the soldier's eatery. There was still some time to the next potato harvest and the improvement of the variety and the taste was still about halfway there. So today, what was lined up was not something that was harvested in Cyrus. They were huge melons sent from Kerry of Medorosa. The shapes were distorted but, the outstanding favor was what they had been sold on. 
It seemed that Kerry had ordered them from the Commonwealth in the South but was selling them as if they were melons of Medoroso. Without keeping up, Shara would eat all of these in one go. What was being eaten now was a dish where half of the melon was tapped, while the middle was packed with various things. The contents were put with some boiled fish. It was an outstanding match with bread. In the eating hall were the soldiers affiliated the Cyrus Fortress. And for some reason, next to Shara was Veloce. There was a decidedly odd bad atmosphere. While the lords did not have that much free time, it seemed that all of the work was done by the staff officer Dima. Lord Shara, these melons seem delicious. Yes. They are delicious. I want to try to grow some quickly. I wonder how they are grown. I will investigate later. 66, take care, Veloce, yes. She pushed Veloce while she bowed in respect standing. This was because such a thing was not necessary while eating. One must enjoy and eat. This was the rule of Cyrus. The necromancer with a terrible complexation, Katarina, jumped into the relaxing dining hall. She knocked at the door briskly with a hushed and bashful sigh. Shut up, I am eating. Lord Ash, Lord Shara. There is no need to yell so loudly, I can already hear you Katarina. You are being loud. I am sorry. But, I have something to report. I have run all the way here. Katarina placed on here glasses carefully. She was embracing a massive volume of papers. Shara had a bad feeling about this. What kind of report could this be? Yes, the other day, I was putting together the legends of Shara and have finally completed it so I am reporting this. The legends of Shara. What is that? Veloce stopped herself from speaking. Katarina glared at Jalori. She looked down and spoke with a glorious voice. With a faithful first volume of the Half-Life of the Great and Honorable Shara, it is me Katarina Nebisu who has prepared with Supreme Book. Soon, I will distribute it to all of the troops. And yes to you Katarina was intercepted while she attempted to pass a copy to Veloce, by Shara who flipped through it. Are there any pictures in this fable? 66 yes. Because the there are few words that can express the glory of Shara so, I have used some images to convey this. I have continued to rework them. Ah uh, that is right, she was very good at drawing. There was a beautiful picture of the someone. Their hair was long and height was high. This is who? Of course, Honorable Shara. It is something I saw with my own eyes, so it would have various differences. In your eyes, there are strange stars shining. Human eyes do not shine this way. Does the work of the head become dull when one dies? Shara was seriously concerned about Shara's head. While the images were fantastic, the actual script was terrible. It was written that she had slaughtered 100,00 rebels and killed 1 million troops, in one go. While they had driven them back, how did the new kingdom get defeated in the battle? One could not write this. And, the death of the princess Aratsuura by illness, it was written that it was apparently the work of Shara. It was half truth and half lies. Shara closed the book. There was a problem. Ah no, it was nothing. Yeah, thank you very much. 66 Katarina arrived at the seat and straight away started preparing foods. I am giving this to you. It is an interesting story. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Shara took the book from Veloce and returned to the food. This stupid book, no one would believe in it much less even care about it probably. No one cared. So, Shara decided to not care about it. With glistening eyes, Veloce began reading the book. What bad behavior while eating food, thought Shara. But, as this was really delicious, she decided not to care about it. The End